A little bit engaged. One Night to Forever, Book 3. Written by Melissa McClone. Text copyright 2019 by Melissa McClone. Production copyright 2023 by Melissa McClone. In memory of my nephew S.H. Who wasn't with us long but lives on in our hearts. And Peggy Bird, a dear friend who I miss so much. Thank you to Dell, Heather, Marilyn, and Peggy for your friendship and support, both during our weekly write-ins and away while I wrote the first version of this book. I also can't forget Amy who played sounding board and helped me figure out this story one morning at Panera. Chapter 1 A loud noise woke Kara O'Neill. Bolting upright in bed, she blinked. Once, twice. The time on the digital clock glowed a faint green. 11.28 p.m. Clutching the comforter, she half expected a tremor to roll through the condo, a disturbing thought given San Francisco's marina district was built on a landfill. A buzz shattered the silence. It was her building's security system. Not an earthquake. Nothing to worry about. She flexed her fingers, allowing her racing pulse to slow to a more normal rate. The building's front door was kept locked. An intercom system allowed visitors to buzz a residence unit, and then they had to wait to be let inside. Except. No one she knew would drop by this late on a Monday night. Maybe Jeff, her friend from Unit 301, had gone for a run and left his keys at home. That had happened before, but never past bedtime. Reaching toward the nightstand, she turned on the lamp. Loki, the long-haired black cat she'd adopted years ago from a rescue group in Southern California, meowed from the pillow next to hers. He flicked his tail once before giving her the evil eye. Not his my bowl is only half full I am starving look, but his you woke me up now rub me back to sleep or die green-eyed glare. Sorry to disturb his royal highness, but I can't leave someone outside at this hour. At least the weather in early March had been warmer than usual. Yawning, she crawled out of bed, padded across the floor, and then pressed the intercom button. Hello? It's Brody. Let me in before someone recognizes me. Brody Simmons. Her breath caught in her throat, her muscles tensing. What is he doing here? She pressed the button to unlock the front entrance. Growing up, Brody had been her closest friend. She'd had a crush on him from high school through college. Okay, maybe a little longer than that. But no one knew, thank goodness. That would have been awkward when Brody and Caitlin, her twin sister, started dating. Three years, one month, and four days ago. Not that Kara was counting. But his late-night visit with no warning concerned her. Running her thumbs across her fingertips, she thought about calling Caitlin. Maybe her sister would know what was going on. Except Caitlin hadn't returned any calls or texts for over two weeks. Brody wasn't much better. He rarely called, but he would occasionally text or video chat. Kara hadn't seen him in person since he'd taken her to the Academy Awards ceremony last year when Caitlin had been too sick to attend. Kara had loved the once-in-a-lifetime experience. Since then, Brody had been filming one movie after another. A week ago, she'd glimpsed him and her sister at the Oscars. They appeared fine, but something must have happened to bring him to San Francisco. A fight with Caitlin? A problem on his latest movie set? A need to escape the rabid fans chasing after one of Hollywood's sexiest leading men? Loki rubbed against her leg. Brody will be here in two or three minutes, she said to the furry love of her life. She didn't consider changing out of her tiger-striped footy pajamas. Sexy lingerie and sophisticated styles weren't in Kara's dresser or closet. She preferred footy, flannel, and fleece jammies. Not only did they keep her warm at night, but they were also comfy, cute, and fun. After brushing her fingers through hair that was tangled and wavy from the braid she'd worn earlier, she gave up with a sigh. Brody wouldn't care if she answered the door naked. The only woman he noticed, the only one he wanted, was Caitlin. Their love emanates beyond the screen. Kara winced. Three years later, the movie critic's observation still stung. She'd never stood a chance with Brody except in her dreams, but Kara had almost convinced herself that he and Caitlin had simply nailed the roles of star-crossed lovers because of their acting abilities. 
until the two kissed at the movie's premiere. No one could fake that kind of passion, that kind of, love. True love. Forever love. What Kara had wanted with Brody. But the fantasies had blown up in her face. Right there on the red carpet. Her dreams hadn't come true. They'd been crushed and pummeled into grains of sand. Unlike her sister, Kara wasn't a good actress, but hiding her crush had been easy enough. Keeping her broken heart a secret from the two people who knew her best, however, had proven impossible when they acted so lovey-dovey around her. Not their fault, but she couldn't handle being the third wheel and witnessing their constant PDA. To distance herself, she'd moved from Los Angeles after she found a better librarian job in San Francisco. Caitlin purchased this condo for Kara to rent after she'd mentioned her trouble finding an affordable place that allowed pets, and she appreciated her sister's generosity. Caitlin's crazy schedule kept the two from talking much these days, and Kara missed their phone calls. Even though Caitlin defined diva, they were still twins who shared a bond few understood. Time had flown by since Kara moved nearly three years ago. Too bad she didn't still have the job that had brought her to San Francisco. Ten months ago, she'd been laid off. Three long knocks sounded, followed by two short ones. It was the secret code they'd used at the treehouse behind Brody's childhood home where his parents still lived. Kara. He sounded impatient. Inhaling deeply, she opened the door. Sunglasses covered Brody's killer baby blues, but they did nothing to mask his classically handsome features. A multicolored, striped beanie hid his thick brown hair. An oversized navy hoodie disguised his to-die for body. With his six-foot-plus height and athletic build, he could easily be mistaken for a professional athlete. Definitely swoon-worthy. She clutched the door handle. It was a good thing she'd developed immunity to his attractiveness and charm. No more weak knees. Forget the drawn-out size. She'd left those behind with her crush. For her sake and her sister's. Hey. Brody stepped inside, closed the door behind him, dropped his backpack onto the floor, and enveloped her in a bear hug. His trademark since he was 14 and no longer embarrassed to touch girls. Although, she wasn't sure if he viewed her as a female or ever had. She'd been parked in the friend zone for so long her windshield was plastered with tickets. Yet, that hadn't stopped her from trying to get him to notice her in high school. She'd been so hopeful then. Now she could enjoy taking a glimpse or two, but that was as far as it would go. His scent, a mix of his shampoo and him, surrounded Kara. She wanted to inhale deeply to soak up the smell, but she didn't. It's good to see you. Brody let go of her. Off came his sunglasses, hat, and sweatshirt. He placed them on top of the small wooden bookcase where she kept her purse and keys. Sorry I didn't call first. Nice PJS. Kara struck a silly tiger pose. A birthday present to myself. Not a book. I gave myself one of those, too. Brody laughed. Were you asleep? Yes, and Loki's not pleased. He doesn't like to be disturbed. Sorry, dude, Brody said to the cat. Turning, Loki presented a perfect view of his backside. Typical cat. I thought you were filming. Finished. Glancing around, Brody shifted his weight from foot to foot. You alone? Kara wanted to groan. Of course she was alone. She wanted nothing more than to fall in love, to open her heart and her life to someone special. So far, no luck. Only Loki and me. You mentioned something about a date the last time we talked. He'd wanted to know how she was doing after being unemployed and then finding a job to tide her over until she found a new position in her field. Yes. Turns out, he's allergic to cats. Sneezing, eyes watering, and hives broke out when he entered the condo. Shortest first date ever. That sucks. Try, try again. She motioned Brody into the living room. So? He plopped onto her couch, a slip-covered love seat she'd assembled herself. How do you like being a book concierge? That was her title at Cassandra's Attic, an independent bookstore here in San Francisco, where she worked part-time. I enjoy it. 
Cassie's a great boss, her husband, Troy, has wonderful ideas for improving the store, and my coworkers are nice, but… You miss working in a library. Yes, and no, but the bottom line came down to the one thing her parents wouldn't allow her to forget. It's what my degree is in. How's the job search going? Heat rushed up her neck. So many libraries had turned her down that Kara felt as if she were a new college graduate with zero work experience, but she wasn't giving up. The perfect job was out there somewhere. She would find it. I have a second interview on Friday for a position I'd love. She crossed her fingers. I've also been volunteering at a public library when I can. I may have found a new calling. What's that? A ball of warmth formed in her chest. Working in the children's section. His mouth quirked. I thought rare books were your thing. They are, but I'd forgotten how much I enjoy story time. Another employee handles it at the bookstore, but I'm having fun at the library. Picturing the children from Friday's session filled her with joy. Seeing young faces light up as I read, their eyes full of excitement and anticipation, is incredible. It makes me remember why I fell in love with books when I was younger. Doing this really makes you happy. So happy. I feel like I'm making a difference with these kids. She shimmied her shoulders. I'm going to ask if the library will let me start themed book clubs for various ages, and then I want to propose a theater and dance reading group for kids who learn better kinesthetically. Wow. Fantastic ideas. His face brightened. You sound excited. Much better than I thought you'd be doing. She shrugged. I have an occasional off moment, but I won't let losing my job bring me down. The university was stupid to let you go. I didn't have enough seniority. Nothing anyone could do. If she'd stayed in Los Angeles, she would still be employed. But moving had been the right decision. Her new job had been a dream while it lasted, and the distance had allowed her to get over her crush. Brody was nothing more than a friend now. Although, she created yet another problem by leaving Southern California. She now felt like an outsider in her family. What's going on with you, she asked. You didn't come here to talk about my employment situation. Humor flashed in his eyes, followed by a sheepish grin. One he'd used for as long as she could remember. Knowing she could still read him filled her with a sense of relief. You've always been the smart one. The three of them used to joke about how Caitlin got the beauty and Kara the brains. Being smart was great, but more than once, she'd wish they'd been identical twins instead of fraternal ones. Looking like her sexy, gorgeous actress sister wouldn't suck. What brings you to San Francisco? Kara asked. Caitlin. Kara wasn't surprised. Her sister was a magnet for trouble, always had been. Kara and Brody had grown up trying to get Caitlin out of one jam after another. They'd offered support when anxiety issues made her want to hurt herself, a terrifying time no one wanted repeated, but therapy and medication kept that under control these days. Still, Caitlin had found herself in trouble a few times. Fortunately, whenever things got out of hand for her, Brody had a knack for minimizing any damage. A good thing since Kara wasn't there to help, but she did what she could from afar. Spill, she said. Loki jumped onto the couch, and the cat bumped his head against Brody's hand. He rubbed Loki's neck. I hope you've been taking care of Kara. She wouldn't let Brody distract her by talking to her cat. I'm waiting. I, Loki climbed onto Brody's lap. This is more difficult than I thought it would be. I tried to talk Caitlin into coming, but she bailed. Caitlin avoided conflict by being indirect when she wanted something. Kara hoped Brody hadn't been talked into doing her sister's dirty work. He was too busy for that. Unless Caitlin wanted Kara to do something for her. She scooted closer. Hey. You can tell me anything. He nodded, but his gaze bounced from one thing to another, focusing on every object in the room except her. Something was up. Something big. She knew his every expression, all his secrets. At least she used to. That was Caitlin's job now. But time and distance hadn't changed Kara's ability to sense what was going on in his head. 
Growing up, she believed nothing could come between them. Maybe things hadn't changed as much as she thought. Brody. This isn't easy to say. Kara's stomach clenched. Maybe he wasn't there with a simple request from her sister. You're scaring me. Sorry. It's just, he stared at Loki. The cat was stretched out, purring. Caitlin and I need your help. You know I'd do anything for you guys. Kara would, too. Caitlin and Brody might occupy a different universe from Kara's, but the two, along with Loki and her parents, meant everything to her. Just tell me what you need. Brody pulled something from his pocket, a black velvet ring box. An engagement ring. He was going to ask her sister to marry him. Mr. and Mrs. Brody Simmons. The phrase spiraled inside Kara's brain like a cyclone. Her stomach dropped. Her throat tightened. Tears stung her eyes. She dreamed of living happily ever after, but she'd never come close to grabbing the golden ring. Caitlin, however, would have hers. A mix of emotions swirled through Kara. Happiness for her sister. A knife to the heart for herself. An awful and pathetic response, but a true one, nonetheless. Caitlin marrying Brody wasn't the problem. Her sister led a charmed life. Sure, she'd spent difficult years working both as a cocktail waitress and a cosmetic counter sales clerk while trying to break into show business, but then her dreams came true as if a fairy godmother had waved her magic wand and cast a whatever your heart desires spell. Hit movie franchise, adoring fans, a loving boyfriend who would soon be her fiancé. Once, just once, Kara wanted to be the princess. To wear the figurative tiara and hold the sparkling scepter like Caitlyn. Was that too much to ask? Probably. A laugh bubbled inside Kara, but she couldn't let it escape. Now her sister would be adding a veil, a wedding ring, and Prince Charming as her husband. Her life would be even more perfect, a real life happily ever after. Kara wanted that, too. Someday. At least an impending engagement explained why Brody was here. No trouble. This was a happy visit. Shoring up the proper enthusiasm, she smiled. My parents will be so excited. I am. Despite the burst of jealousy, she was happy. Her sister marrying the perfect guy was a good thing. Brody protected Caitlin, put her first, and made her laugh. Kara would love to have someone like him in her life. He opened the ring box's lid. A diamond solitaire gleamed. She inhaled sharply. The vintage engagement ring was exactly what she would have picked out for herself, though the style seemed a tad old-fashioned for her sister's modern tastes. Still, Caitlin would love whatever Brody bought her. Wow. Kara's fingers itched to move closer, but she forced herself not to touch her sister's gorgeous ring. Caitlin's going to love this. It's not for her. Kara's gaze jerked up to meet Brody's. What? As he swallowed, his Adam's apple seemed twice as big as normal. He appeared almost nervous. It's for you. Her heart slammed against her rib cage. Air rushed from her lungs. Questions exploded in her brain. She opened her mouth, but she couldn't speak. Her gaze went from the ring to Brody. You asked what Caitlin and I need. His gaze implored Kara. We, I, I need you to marry me. Chapter 2 Kara's open mouth, your certifiably insane expression hit Brody like a microphone boom to the head. He scooted away from her until his thigh bumped into the armrest of the love seat. Stupid. He needed to slow down, to explain. That didn't come out right. Which part? Her pretty features hardened on her heart-shaped face, a stark contrast from her usual cheery disposition. Brown hair, full and wavy, fell past her shoulders. Strands stuck out, reminding him of a lion's mane. Forget her adorable tiger pajamas. Her green eyes blazed, wild and angry, as if she might attack. This was so not the Kara he knew. The diamond ring or the proposal, she asked. Both. He took a deep breath and then another. His rapid pulse didn't slow. His chest squeezed tighter. 
Kara. Are you drunk? She pinned him with a sharp gaze. More jade than the emerald of Caitlin's. Because otherwise. I'm sober. A conscious decision he'd made on the flight to San Francisco. Although I wouldn't say no to a beer if you're offering. Annoyed didn't begin to describe her expression. Not good. He couldn't remember the last time Kara had gotten this upset with him. Her mouth slanted. This isn't funny. If Caitlin knew. She knows. The words tumbled out. So much for slowing down. She's why I'm here. Kara's eyebrows pulled together in a sympathetic gesture, but annoyance returned in a flash. Her mouth pinched as if she'd eaten something sour. Not even my sister could get herself into this much trouble. Moore wanted to fly out of his mouth, but he kept his lips pressed together. Kara was the only woman who made him feel unsure of himself, like he was in sixth grade again. He hadn't always felt this way around her. Not when they lived next door to each other. Not when they sat next to each other on the school bus. Not when they called each other best friends through high school and when she was in college. But after she'd graduated, something changed. Maybe because she seemed smarter than she had been when she was in school. Or maybe because she'd gone from the cliched ugly duckling, too thin and tall with features that didn't quite fit her face, to a beautiful swan. Caitlin still joked about giving her twin sister a gift certificate to a plastic surgeon when they turned 30 in two years, even though Kara didn't need it. Caitlin did get herself into trouble, he finally said. Not on purpose, but she needs our help. You mean she's dragging us into one of her problems again? As he nodded, Kara stared down her nose. The gesture reminded him of her twin, a rare similarity between two vastly different women. Next to his mother and late grandmother, Caitlin and Kara were the most important females in his life. She crossed her arms over her chest. What did my sister do this time? Screwed up big time on camera. That's why you showed up with a ring and proposed. Disbelief filled Kara's voice. He didn't blame her. This wasn't my idea, but Caitlin didn't leave me much choice. Kara's lips narrowed into a thin line. The one person who'd always taken his side didn't believe him. The realization slashed through him like a blade. She gave a slight shake of her head. There's always a choice. Maybe in Kara's world. Not so much in his. Since his acting career took off, he'd felt like a trained dog performing tricks on command for Caitlin and his management team. He hated it. Tonight, however, was different. Brody would do whatever he could to keep Caitlin's reputation from being ruined. No way could she keep her anxiety under control if the truth got out and her carefully crafted facade was exposed. The consequence might be too much for her to bear. He pulled his phone from his pocket. I should have had you watch this video before I said anything. You can see for yourself what's going on. Kara's lips pursed. Her doubt was as clear as her makeup-free face. Brody hit play. He'd seen this clip so many times he'd memorized what had been said, but it hadn't made the situation any better. He felt worse. Awful about what Caitlin had done. Regret for having to drag sweet Kara into her sister's PR mess. An image of beautiful, sexy, pain-in-the-butt Kate Neal, she dropped the Lynn and the O oh, for her stage name, appeared on the screen with her flawless makeup and flowing blonde hair. I hardly recognize her with lighter hair, Kara said. But no matter what color or style, Caitlin always looks amazing. Looking amazing was a Kate Neal trademark, no matter if she was grabbing a cappuccino from a corner coffee shop or being interviewed on the red carpet. Brody could get away with wearing board shorts and a ratty t-shirt. When Caitlin dressed casually in shorts and a tank top, she put the same thought into her clothing choice as if she were attending a formal event. This morning for the interview shoot, her well-paid stylist had mixed designer label clothing with off-the-rack finds to create an outfit that would generate oohs and ahs from fans and fashionistas. Kara angled the screen toward her face. The video quality's not the best. 
Caitlin's assistant filmed this on the sly. Evidence in case Auntie Shark got creative with the editing. Shouldn't that nickname and the need for evidence have been red flags the interview wasn't a good idea? Kara asked. Caitlin's publicist set it up. The Auntie Shark nickname was well earned. The woman came across like a doting relative until the opportunity arose to chomp off an appendage with a biting comment or innuendo. The buzz on Caitlin's new film is bad. It's a romantic comedy, but focus audiences didn't laugh during the screenings. She wanted the same blockbuster box office results on her first movie without him as he'd had with his first film without her. Your sister needs as much press as possible to fill theaters this weekend. Don't you mean positive press? That was the plan. Emphasis on was. Sweat dampened the back of his neck. On the screen, Caitlin sat on her living room couch next to a 40-something female news show host who acted more like a gossip columnist than a highly regarded journalist. So what's going on with you and Brody Simmons? Auntie Shark's voice sounded nonchalant. Everything's great between us. Caitlin didn't miss a beat replying. Practice made the answer automatic. We've been together for over three years. That's a long time in the movie business. The way Auntie Shark emphasized the last word made Brody cringe. In hindsight, the speech pattern had been a warning of incoming fire. Is that why you were at a bridal salon looking at wedding dresses? I, I, Caitlin's stuttering matched her deer in the headlights expression. Brody's heart ached for her. Years of dealing with the media and knowing what to say with a camera rolling had disappeared in a nanosecond. If only he'd been there, but Caitlin said she had everything under control and not to change his plans. He'd let her down. And for what? To shoot hoops with a few guys from the gym. Why was Caitlin at a bridal salon? Kara asked in that logical tone of hers. Brody motioned to the screen. Just watch. Tell us the truth, Kate. Auntie Shark sounded mean, almost hateful. Have you and Brody been lying to your fans? Are you secretly planning a wedding? Kara leaned closer to the screen, blocking his view. Caitlin's face is so pale. I haven't seen her this stressed since high school. She looks like she might pass out. Fainting would have been good. Saying we were getting married would have been the best solution. Friends, fans, and foes would have understood them not wanting to make a spectacle out of a wedding. A lie, maybe, but what was one more? Pause the video, Kara said. Brody did. I don't get it. Lines creased Kara's forehead, matching the confusion in her gaze. Brody knew she hated not understanding something. If you're marrying Caitlin, why are you here with an engagement ring asking me to marry you? Watch. He hit play. Three, two, one. Tears shot from Caitlin's eyes like water exploding from a broken fire hydrant. Brody felt a pang. He should have been there. We're not getting married, Caitlin hiccuped between sobs. Streams of mascara stained tears flowed down her cheeks. Brody and I. We aren't engaged. We broke up. Kara's lips parted, her eyes widened, and then she blinked several times. Her face tightened into a pained expression that made him feel like a jerk. Why did you break up? Is Caitlin okay? Did you hurt her? Keep watching. Auntie Shark patted Caitlin's arm. I'm so sorry. Caitlin swiped her hand across her face. The move made a bigger mess of her makeup. She appeared oh so human, not the perfectly put together actress that girls and teens idolized. Auntie Shark extended a tissue. Take your time, dear. Thank you. Caitlin dabbed her face slowly as if trying to think of what to say next. If only she hadn't rushed. I didn't want our fans to find out this way, but I suppose there isn't a good time to tell them. Tell them what? Auntie Shark sounded giddy. Caitlin stared straight at the camera. Her vulnerability clawed at him. About Brody. What about him? He's. 
He's getting married. Huh? Kara muttered. What? Auntie Shark's mouth gaped. Who is he marrying? Caitlin's slight pause told Brody she was making this up as she went. My twin sister. No. Auntie Shark and Kara shouted at the same time. The horror in that one word twisted his heart. He'd experienced the same shock, disbelief, and hurt. He knew the question, why, Caitlin, was echoing in Kara's head the way it had resounded in his. He patted her hand. Not much support, but this was all he could give her. They were in this together, or they would be if she agreed to be his temporary fiancé. You can't be serious. Auntie Shark appeared shocked. I'm afraid so. Caitlin sniffled. They've been secretly dating. I don't know how long this has been going on, but they attended the Academy Awards together last year when I was sick. Maybe it started then. I'm trying to be happy for them. I was at the bridal salon to try on bridesmaid dresses, but it's hard. The two people I love most in this world betrayed me in the worst possible way. She wiped her eyes with a tissue before she straightened. And you know, it's so bizarre how life is imitating art. What do you mean? Auntie Shark's tone was sympathetic, but her eyes gleamed with dollar signs. No doubt this exclusive, juicy morsel had thrilled her. My new film Trouble in Tool is about a jilted bride whose groom runs off with her best friend. Everyone should see the movie when it opens this weekend. Caitlin perked up for a moment, but then, as if on cue, more tears flooded her cheeks. My sister is, was, my best friend. Oh, no. 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 Kara's voice trembled. Her lower lip quivered. Please tell me this is a sick joke. An early April Fool's prank. Payback for me making fun of your movie franchise. Brody wanted to wipe away her worry. Instead, he shut off the video. I wish I could. Kara stared at his phone. I don't know what to say. I know the feeling. It's like I'm on a roller coaster that won't stop, only, this ride hasn't been any fun. He placed his phone on the old, beat-up trunk that doubled as a coffee table. I just want it to end. Why would Caitlin do this to me? To us. The pain in Kara's voice hurt Brody. I've stayed out of the public eye on purpose. Now she's pushing me into the spotlight. Can you stop this? The hope in Kara's gaze made him want to say yes, but he couldn't tell her another lie. I thought about going to my lawyer, but Caitlin talked me out of it. She said the real-life parallel with the movie is too perfect not to exploit. The show was taped this morning. It's set to air on Thursday. That gives us time. Time for what? The lines on Kara's forehead deepened. My sister has lost it. Caitlin panicked. She needed people to think well of her, and she'd been stressed over her film's release. He wished she hadn't dragged him and Kara into this, but he wouldn't desert Caitlin. Without her, he would have never been cast as her co-star in a role that turned both of them into megastars. He not only owed Caitlin, but he also cared about her. They could have lost her when she was 17 and mentally hit rock bottom. He didn't want that to happen again. She's worried about her reputation. We need to play along. Pretend to be engaged. Other actors have survived bad reviews and box office flops. Why is this any different? The upcoming premiere was only one reason Caitlin had reacted this way. Brody dragged his hand through his hair. And let's not play dumb. Kara squared her shoulders. My sister didn't come up with the life imitating art speech on the fly. This was premeditated. No, it wasn't, he countered. Caitlin was caught off guard. Her anxiety ramped up. She did what she could to salvage the situation. What situation? She threw us under the bus. No, in front of a runaway semi. Or train. Caitlin's built her career on being a sweet, honest person. 
a role model for young women. She did what she had to do, and we have to help her. Help, yes, but not enable. Kara rubbed her face. Caitlin must be having a mental breakdown. Or maybe she's taking a new anxiety medication, and this is a side effect. Those are the only reasons for her to have lied so badly. Guilt coated Brody's mouth. He rubbed his sweaty palms over his thighs. The last two and a half years replayed in his mind. Each memory made his throat hurt more, but he had to tell the truth. Not everything Caitlin said was a lie. Kara's lips curved into a condescending smile that hit like a kick from an undefeated MMA fighter. Don't let love blind you. The tightness in his chest quadrupled. Lying to her had been difficult, but he never expected to feel as if his own heart was going to explode. There's stuff you don't know. The color of Kara's eyes deepened to a forest green. What stuff? He wanted to skip this part, make something up the way Caitlin had during her interview, but Kara deserved to hear the truth, even though she wouldn't like what he had to say. Caitlin and I broke up two and a half years ago. Since then, we've been pretending to date. Kara blinked. Pretending? She sounded breathless as if she couldn't believe what he was saying. Brody understood. If he could change the past, he would. He would tell Kara the truth. No, he wouldn't have pretended he and Caitlin were still dating. Yes. Saying that brought no relief. Only regret. But you and Caitlin are in love. I love Caitlin, just not romantically. She feels the same way about me. But there are benefits to us remaining a couple until the final movie in the franchise releases in December, so we lied. The lump in his throat grew to the size of a baseball. He nodded and then swallowed. No one else knew. If that's supposed to make me feel better. It's not. But I didn't want you to think we kept the truth only from you. In January, we were planning to release a statement about breaking up and then go on with our lives and careers separately. But now. Kara's face flushed. I see. She bowed her head causing her hair to fall forward and hide her face, but her voice told him all he needed to know. She was disappointed in him. Brody had hurt her, even though she wouldn't tell him that. He wished she would. He wanted Kara to scream or shout, to do something emotional like her sister would. Instead, she sat calmly, twirling a strand of hair with her index finger. She did that whenever she was thinking about something. But thinking and analyzing, two of Kara's strengths, wouldn't change anything. He felt like the worst friend ever. Her eyebrows drew together. Why didn't Caitlin say you were together and secretly planning a wedding? She could have said a friend or a member of her entourage was getting married. No one would have known the truth. That would have been better. Yes, except, Kara sighed. None of those mirror the plot of Caitlin's movie as well as her lie about us. We're trapped. Only if we agree. He'd agreed to help Caitlin before he caught his flight, but he needed Kara to pull this off. We can't leave Caitlin to handle this mess on her own. I'm not about to watch her spiral until she decides fixing things isn't worth it. Kara's face paled. My sister wouldn't do that again. She promised. I don't want to take that chance, and I know you don't either. Seeing Caitlin hospitalized ten years ago for a psych evaluation had been bad enough. Maybe they'd given in to her demands too much since then. Coddled her. Let her get away with stuff others wouldn't. But the alternative. He blew out a breath. That means we're stuck. For now. A beat passed. And another. I love Caitlin, but this could just be another one of her elaborate schemes. Maybe. But Caitlin's fear had been real. Her anxiety has seemed better. There's no guarantee that will continue. But what she's claiming could hurt you. It could also cause problems with my job search and call into question my character since I volunteer with children. Kara's tone was thoughtful, not upset. Brody understood why she felt that way 
except. True, but Caitlin's always been fragile emotionally. I'm willing to do whatever it takes to help her out of this mess. Are you? Chapter 3 Silence stretched the inches between Brody and Kara into miles. He wanted to bridge the gap, but he didn't know how. She'd once been his best friend, closer to him than Caitlin had ever been, before life and distance separated them. He hadn't seen Kara since last year's Oscars, knew little about what she'd been doing other than searching for a new job the past ten months. When he'd been struggling financially, trying to make it in show business, she'd sent him money to buy food and pay bills. He hadn't been around to support her when she'd been laid off, hadn't given her any money when she probably needed some, yet here he was, asking for a favor. A big one. Loki jumped off his lap and lumbered across the hardwood floor. The heater kicked on, blowing hot air out of a register. A siren sounded outside. Still no answer from Kara. I'm sorry for showing up and dropping this on you. You'll never know how sorry. He owed her more than an apology, but this was a start. Caitlin and I should have told you the truth about us breaking up when it happened. Brody wanted to reach out to Kara, but her erect posture with her hands clasped in her lap told him not to. He didn't want to screw up more, so he dug his fingers into the couch cushion. We were selfish, caught up in something we hadn't thought through. We didn't think we were hurting anyone, just staying private, but now Caitlin needs us. Kara stared at the bay window, though the blinds were closed. Her stillness and tilted head reminded him of when they were younger. He used to find her in the treehouse resting her elbows on the ledge, gazing at the Sacramento foothills in the distance. He wished he could read her mind, but Kara, unlike Caitlin, kept her emotions hidden. Why was my sister at a bridal salon? Kara asked in a matter-of-fact tone. Looking at wedding dresses. She tilted her head. As a publicity stunt? No. Kara blew out a breath. My sister is engaged. It wasn't a question. Then again, she was usually a step ahead of everyone else. Caitlin fell in love with her co-star on a film that's in post-production. She explained about pretending to date me. He said he understood, but that didn't stop him from proposing two weeks ago. Thumbing through magazines wasn't enough for Caitlin. She couldn't contain her excitement and wanted to see dresses in person. That's why she was at the bridal salon. Have they set a wedding date? No. Alex's divorce isn't finalized yet. There's a nasty custody battle going on for his two kids. He wants Caitlin to keep quiet about their relationship until everything is settled. Alec? Kara's jaw tensed. That actor who's married to the supermodel? Brody nodded. That explains why Caitlin's so worried about reputation. Kara shook her head. My sister is not only a liar, but she's also a homewrecker. Brody flinched. He wasn't used to hearing Kara's hard tone, but he understood why she felt that way. Alec told Caitlin he was separated when he asked her out. Was he? I don't know. Concern clouded Kara's gaze. What Caitlin said during the interview was bad enough, but her engagement to Alec worries me, too. It's so unlike her. What do you mean? Alec has kids. Caitlin's never wanted children. She hated babysitting. Ignored our younger cousins when we were in high school. Had Caitlin said that? Brody didn't remember, but then again, marriage seemed so far off he'd never thought about it. Same for having kids. She must have had a change of heart given the length she's going to keep her relationship with Alec a secret. Maybe, but this doesn't seem like anxiety getting the best of Caitlin. We need to find out what's going on before diving into her mess. I told you before. She panicked. Caitlin could cry on demand. Scenes full of angst were her favorite to film. She could be a drama queen to the nth degree in private, but she wasn't a complete narcissist. Your sister shot from the hip, and her aim was off. She did her best to recover. Caitlin hit the target dead on. 
Kara tapped her finger against her chin. She gave an award-winning performance with her tear-stained face and sad, sorrowful eyes during the interview. No matter what we do, we're going to be a diversion to what's going on in her private life. Thanks to our so-called cheating and engagement, she'll be comforted and indulged, all while gaining public support, even with a bad movie about to premiere and a soon-to-be-divorced fiancé with kids. Talk about a win-win. Whether this was off the cuff or premeditated, playing the victim is a brilliant PR strategy to keep her reputation sparkling clean. Kara spoke as if she were giving a talk at one of those rare book symposiums she attended. Though not for us. Well, more so you than me. No one knows who I am. He'd been in damage control mode once he recovered from the shock of what Caitlin had said. He'd never considered she'd been doing anything other than panicking. They'd been lifelong friends, in a relationship for several months, and partners in crime since then. Even though she'd taken advantage of his friendship in the past, he trusted her. Caitlin didn't set us up. I hope not. Caitlin's been through some rough times, but she's always done what's best for herself, Kara said in a pragmatic tone. And you always jumped to her rescue. She knew you would again. His instinct had been to protect Caitlin. Still was. He'd done that for both O'Neill's sisters for as long as he could remember, and he wouldn't stop now. That's what friends do for one another. You're a good friend. He didn't deserve her praise. Not lately with you. It's okay. I understand. You're living the dream. Was he? Brody shouldn't feel so ambivalent, but he was tired, drained from non-stop filming and promoting movie releases. He wasn't enjoying himself the way he thought he would. Maybe if he got Caitlin out of yet another mess, and this was a doozy, he would finally feel free of his obligation to her and could relax. Do what he wanted, and not what everyone else expected him to do. What do you say about being engaged for a little bit, he asked. It's not like we'll have to get married for real. Kara touched his hand. Her fingernails were jagged and unpainted, but her skin was soft and warm. Won't being accused of cheating on Caitlin hurt your career? Kara's concern was sweet but unwarranted. No. He'd never built his reputation on something he wasn't. Before he and Caitlin became a couple, he'd gone out with a lot of women. Dating Caitlin had helped him clean up his act, and he'd lived up to the role of a loving, loyal boyfriend. Once this charade was over, however, he didn't want to go back to playing the field. He wanted to be in a committed relationship. On the flip side, Caitlin's sweet, wholesome reputation, a paragon of virtue and healthy habits, was nothing more than the result of her management team's carefully planned packaging. She'd announced she was a vegan only to eat bacon cheeseburgers and drink milkshakes on the sly. She was more naughty than nice, less sugar than spice. Always had been, even when they were kids. But her killer show business instincts had made them stars. Without Caitlin, he'd still be a bartender with the occasional commercial or guest role. She'd pushed him to audition for a movie being adapted from a best-selling young adult series set in space. They'd been cast as the romantic leads, and that one film became a mega-blockbuster franchise that propelled them into A-list stars. By the time my next movie comes out, this will have blown over, he explained. Another Hollywood scandal will be in the headlines. Mine will be forgotten. Two lines formed over the bridge of Kara's nose. Almost sounds too easy. The public believes what they read or hear. All we need to do is prove what Caitlin said is true. We can plan a wedding and stage a few kisses to make our relationship appear legit. Something flashed on Kara's face. More disappointment. Or was that laughter? Maybe he was reading too much into her reactions. It wouldn't be the first time. Legit, right. She sighed. A real fiancé is the last thing a guy with a pretend girlfriend needs. Before he could reply, his cell phone rang. Caitlin's name illuminated on the screen. It's your sister. He answered the call. Hey. Did Kara agree? Caitlin sounded winded. 
still working on that. She sighed. I should have come. That's what I said. Let me talk to her. The words rushed out. He handed the phone to Kara. Here you go. Resignation crossed her features, and she raised the phone to her ear. Hello. Brody understood. Few people could say no to Caitlin, including him. Yeah, he told me. I heard about you and Alec. But he's married with kids. Oh, I didn't realize he'd been separated for that long. That's still a big change about wanting children. Yes. Let's save discussing your wedding plans for another call. Pretending to be engaged to Brody isn't going to. She rubbed her lips together. Thirty seconds passed. A minute. No, I understand your reputation is at stake, but don't forget about mine and Brody's too, Kara said. Yes, I'm concerned about your mental health. Of course I love you, but I need to know if what happened during the interview was planned or impromptu. Really? So the similarities to your movie just came to you? Wow, you were lucky. Her voice sounded faintly sarcastic. She rubbed her neck and then straightened. Brody wished he could hear Caitlin's side of the conversation. Kara shook her head. I told you years ago I was fine with you and Brody dating. No, I'm not seeing anyone, but stop trying to make yourself feel better. Just because you're getting married doesn't mean Brody needs to pretend to marry your sister. He had to laugh at that. Wait. What did you say? Kara's forehead wrinkled. Well, sure, not paying rent for six months would help me financially. That's a generous offer. But what about mom and dad? If I agree, which I haven't yet, promise you'll tell them the truth about what's going on. Fine, give me tonight to think about it. You'll have an answer tomorrow. Kara hung up. Staring at her cat, she twirled a strand of hair with her finger. His tense muscles relaxed slightly. Whatever Caitlin said to Kara was making her consider helping. She handed back his phone. Caitlin claims not to have planned this, and that everything just happens to tie into the movie. Do you believe her? The question slipped out. You must be rubbing off on me because I want to believe her. Kara's gaze traveled to the engagement ring sitting on the coffee table. But this situation has disaster written all over it. Epic failure. Maybe, but what choice do we have? I get you're willing to go all in. You're a portrait in concern with your tone matching your creased brow. Her mouth slanted. But I'm not as sure of what we need to do as you are. His muscles bunched tighter. What's it going to take to convince you? He regretted asking the question. Yes, he was annoyed and frustrated, but he shouldn't take out his feelings on her. She hadn't asked for any of this. Still, he needed to know her answer. I don't know, she admitted. But I have serious doubts about whether we could even pull off acting engaged. We just have to fake it. He spoke too fast. His filter had completely turned off. That happened when he was losing patience or upset. Tonight, he was both. He would try another tact. It'll only be for two weeks, three max. What's the big deal? You can't seriously mean that. Disbelief dripped from her voice. Everyone who sees that interview will think I'm, not a nice sister. Come on. He tried to laugh off her concern, but he sounded more anxious than amused. You're the best sister and friend. Caitlin and I know that. What others think doesn't matter. This will be a big adventure. Caitlin's the adventurous one. Kara's face puckered as if he'd asked her to swim to Alcatraz. I prefer to escape between the pages of a book. Then it's time to close the cover and live your own story. After he removed the ring from the velvet box, he held the diamond so flashes of color shot around the room. She'd never been into jewelry. The way to her heart was with a first edition book, the older the better, but money had to be tight after being laid off for so long even with her part-time job, which was why Caitlin had offered free rent. 
If he'd given Kara a book to sway her, she would keep it. The engagement ring wouldn't mean anything to her. When this is over and life is back to normal, sell the ring. Use the money however you want. For yourself or the library programs you want to start. As her mouth formed a perfect O, hope filled her eyes. He'd been right. She needed the money. That made him feel guilty for not helping her sooner. Still, Kara didn't shout yes, but he didn't expect her to. She never jumped into the deep end of a pool. Instead, she waded in, using the steps, one at a time. She was the type to hesitate, weigh the pros and cons before making any decision. Loki meowed and rolled over. Her gaze went from the cat to Brody. No one will believe we're engaged. I look nothing like Caitlin or someone you'd fall in love with. You're beautiful, too. Kara was, just not in the same way as Caitlin. Remember how you turned heads at the Academy Awards? That's only because you hired hair and makeup people to make me pretty after a day of being pampered at a spa. Being Caitlin's twin hadn't been easy on Kara. Growing up, she'd never attempted to compete with her sister. While Caitlin starred in one of their garage or backyard productions, Kara was the one who'd made up the stories and directed the plays. She hadn't minded letting Caitlin take the spotlight every single time. Stop selling yourself so short. They'd had this conversation before, though usually Caitlin sided with Kara. All you have to do is look in the mirror, and you'll see I'm right. You're my friend, Kara countered. You have to say that. Letting this discussion drop was the smart thing to do, but he wanted to say one thing first. Someday, you'll see that I'm right. Until then, we'll just have to convince people we're in love. That's no different from what Caitlin and I have been doing. Except you'd been in love before. Love? He wasn't so certain he'd been in love with Caitlin. Oh, he'd cared about her, but something more like mutual survival had brought and kept them together. He and Caitlin had clung to each other during the rocket ride to stardom, a thrilling journey, but one also filled with desperation and uncertainty. Forget about that. Brody tried to sound nonchalant, but wasn't sure he'd succeeded. He needed Kara to agree without him having to beg. But if that ended up being required, he would. You can do this. I haven't agreed, Kara fired back. Caitlin said I didn't have to decide until tomorrow. That meant Kara would take each minute, every second, allotted to her before deciding. Unless he could push her along faster. One night will make that big a difference. Yes. No. Maybe. Kara had a faraway look in her eyes. I need time to think. She could be stubborn. If Kara needed time to decide, she would take it. Which sucked. But what could he do? Fine, but remember, he said. The clock is ticking. Tick tock. Tick tock. The imaginary second hand reverberated through his head. He never imagined Kara not saying yes, but now he wasn't sure she would. It's late. Go to bed. I'll sleep on the couch. Good night, Brody. Sweet dreams. He needed her to wake up willing to wear his engagement ring and be his fake fiancé, his pretend bride. Otherwise, he had no idea what he would do, or tell Caitlin. Chapter 4 The phone was ringing. Eyes closed, Kara groaned. She hadn't slept well, and she didn't want to answer the call. Was it even time to get up? She didn't want to know the answer. Another ring. And another. Wait a minute. Her eyelids opened. That wasn't her ringtone. It only took a second for her to remember. Brody. He was here sleeping on her couch. She hadn't dreamed last night. A weight pressed against her. Muscles tightened into hard balls and knots. The churning in her stomach had nothing to do with needing breakfast. I need you to marry me. She buried her face in the pillow. Why was this happening? 
Kara wasn't any closer to deciding whether to accept the fake marriage proposal than she'd been last night. The reasons were twofold, Caitlin and Brody. Kara didn't want to hurt her sister, but she couldn't shake her own misgivings. Growing up, Caitlin had been the puppet master with Brody and Kara as her marionettes. That had only worsened as they got older because they both wanted to make sure Caitlin's anxiety didn't send her off the deep end again. Yet something about this particular scenario screamed self-created drama. Kara had played into her twins' hands before, but never in such a public way. And then there was Brody. Once upon a time, Kara had wanted to be with him so badly she would have settled for a make-believe engagement. Anything to give her a taste of what dating him would be like. But she'd put those feelings behind her. Moved on of physically and mentally as best she could. No sense dredging up her crush or the emotions again. What? Brody yelled from the living room, his angry voice echoing through the condo. How did they find me? Uh-oh. The edge in his voice didn't sound good. She jumped off the bed, only to receive an evil eye from Loki, who was awake, but he hadn't raised his head. Go back to sleep, your highness. The cat did. Yawning, she padded along the wood floor. Brody dragged his hand through his sleep-rumpled hair. He was as gorgeous in shorts and a t-shirt as he would be in a designer tuxedo. Standing against the far wall, he peered out the window that faced Beach Street as if trying not to be seen. He muttered under his breath. Tension showed in the lines on his face. No, I understand. Keep me posted. As he lowered the cell phone from his ear, Kara entered the living room. More trouble? Paparazzi. Where? Outside. He peered out the window again. That was my publicist. Someone posted I spent the night with you. You've done that before. Slept on the couch. It's not like we, Kara's voice trailed off. She couldn't say the words. Not when they'd never kissed or done anything except hug and hold hands occasionally. Platonically. No one would ever think she and Brody were anything but friends. But once Caitlin's lies were made public, his being at the apartment would bolster her story. He would be called a cheater. Kara would be known as a betrayer, the other woman, a homewrecker. Forehead throbbing, she rubbed her temples. Who knows you're with me? He sighed. Caitlin. Kara's shoulders sagged. Her suspicions appeared to be true, even if she didn't want to believe it. My sister sold you, us, out. Unless the rental car person at the airport recognized me. Though Brody didn't sound convinced of that. Maybe he was finally questioning Caitlin's behavior. Possibly. Doubtful. But they wouldn't know where you were going. Caitlin's trying to force my hand. She wants me to agree to be your fake fiancé. You can say no. He spoke quickly before the lines on his face deepened. The dark circles under his eyes told her he hadn't slept much. People will believe what they want. Even if they're believing lies? That's show business. She peeked out the window. Men and women stood with cameras and cell phones. Some chatted. Others tapped on screens. Most appeared bored, but that didn't stop them from waiting. For Brody. And Kara. Her heart dropped. No matter what she decided to do about the fake engagement, the evidence pointed to Caitlin's lie. They'll believe her. Brody didn't deny that. Kara hoped he would because she had no idea what would happen next or what this would mean for them. Movie stars often bounced from relationship to relationship in plain view of the public eye, but she was a nobody. Other than attending the Oscars, she'd stayed out of the spotlight. No one cared about her reputation, spotless until now, or her boring, drama-free life with her cat and books. She'd dated, leading to one semi-serious relationship that ended with little fanfare a month after he was transferred to his firm's New York office. As long as she continued to do her job, her boss, if Cassie, who was a free spirit, wouldn't care about gossip. The public library where she volunteered might, especially if the paparazzi invaded during story time. But the prestigious library she had a second interview with on Friday had stressed the importance of its employees being assets to the university. 
negative press might not bode well for her or her chances of being hired. Brody started to speak but stopped himself. What? she asked. A soundbite from Caitlin's interview is being used to promo Anti-Shark's upcoming show on Thursday. If you add that to me staying here last night, it looks bad. The turmoil in his gaze suggested it was very bad. Did your publicist have any suggestions? Kara asked. To pretend to be engaged. She seems to think that would be the best solution. If people think we're engaged instead of just having sex behind your sister's back. Kara's face burned. She stared at the ceiling. Lying never ends well. Three years ago, she'd lied to Caitlin about not having a crush on Brody. Her sister and her best friend started dating after that. Kara still wondered what might have happened if she told her sister the truth about her feelings for Brody. She'd had a chance last night to come clean, even though she was over her crush now, but she couldn't say anything with Brody listening. Maybe she wasn't that different from Caitlin. Closing her eyes, Kara cringed. Is there another option? Other than going public about Caitlin's lies and how she's engaged to a not-yet-divorced man, no. That news would ruin Caitlin's good girl image, add to the bad movie woes, and probably push her over the edge. Ugh. Kara's stomach churned. This was a no-win situation. She should have never been dragged into this. Brody either. Her anger flared. My sister is an adult. Her anxiety issues aren't her fault, but they shouldn't stop her from taking responsibility for her actions. Kara peeked out the window again. More people seem to have gathered. Talk about insanity. Okay, I'll admit not paying rent for six months would be huge for me, but why should we bail out Caitlin one more time? Sacrifice our reputations to save hers? Other than to make sure she doesn't do something stupid and hurt herself? Kara frowned. You know what I mean. I do. And I understand. He plopped onto the couch. I'm tired of feeling like I owe her for my career. Pretending to date her for the past two plus years should wipe out any debt. A hint of a smile appeared on his face. She added interest. That made Kara laugh. If I accept her free rent offer, I'm afraid she'll end up using it against me. She'll keep dragging me into more of her messes. Then use the money from the ring so that doesn't happen, he suggested earnestly. There will be more than enough money for your rent and the library programs. That was good to know, but she didn't want him to be stuck doing whatever Caitlin said. What about you? A beat passed. She went too far this time. Yes. But Kara didn't know what Brody was getting at. But that's Caitlin for you. No more. He spoke firmly. Once this is over, we'll, I'll, draw the line with Caitlin. Tell her we won't fix her problems anymore. What he said shocked Kara, but she had doubts whether he was serious. You've been coming to her rescue for years. Will you be able to tell Caitlin you're done saving her? I, he inhaled and then exhaled slowly. I have to unless I want to spend the rest of my life at Caitlin's beck and call. I don't want that. Kara never expected to hear him say those words. But when she saw the determined set of his jaw, something inside her loosened. It's about time you said that. Past time. He stared at her. So, are we doing this? Her heart slammed against her chest. She couldn't answer. Not yet. I'm no actress. And I look nothing like someone you'd date. Saying the words left a gritty taste in her mouth. She'd appreciated him calling her beautiful, but he was being nice. Kara O'Neill might be cute, but she was nothing like the stunning Kate Neal. The only thing they'd shared physically was their mother's womb. Oh, and some DNA. He grimaced. Kara. I want to go on record saying this is 100% likely to blow up in our faces, but if you're serious about this being the last time, then I'm in. She'd never wanted to be center stage. The only fame she sought was to be an expert in her field, a job that dealt with musty old books. Researching and tracking down first or limited editions. Authenticating and repairing pages, covers, and spines as needed was what she'd trained for and been good at. 
or had until being laid off. But she would do this. For Caitlin, but also for Brody, who needed to stop feeling indebted and cut the puppet strings. Kara extended her left hand. He grabbed the small box off the coffee table, opened it, and removed the ring. As he slid the band onto Kara's finger, his hand brushed hers. At the point of contact, a spark shocked her. Must be static from the rug. Staring at the diamond on her finger, Kara fought her growing unease. She would call the library to let them know she wouldn't be volunteering for a while. So what's next? Do you have to work at the bookstore today? Brody asked. This morning. She forced her attention off her hand before placing her arm behind her as if that could hide what she'd agreed to do. But only until one. Once you're off, we'll get started. Pretending to be engaged? That end, Brody glanced out the window again. Planning our wedding. In the passenger seat of her neighbor Jeff Saudi, Kara buckled the seatbelt. I appreciate you getting me out of the building and driving me to the bookstore. Anytime. Jeff adjusted his glasses. Though. He wore a designer suit, a lightly starched dress shirt, and silk tie, the typical uniform of a guy who worked in the financial district, except she'd never seen him dressed in anything other than work clothes or running apparel. She wasn't sure if he owned a pair of jeans or khakis, but he defined the term gorgeous geek, though she'd felt nothing but friendship for him. What? she asked. Troy McKnight shouldn't have had to call this morning to say you needed my help. You could have done that yourself. Her boss's husband was a friend of Jeff's. It was Jeff's recommendation that had gotten Kara the book concierge job at Cassandra's attic. She owed him big time for that, but calling him, or anyone, about her current situation had never crossed her mind. I know, but… I'm happy to help, so call me next time. I will. Although there wouldn't be a next time. At least not with her sister involved. The garage door opened. As the car backed out, the paparazzi peered inside before glancing away in disappointment. Of course no one gave her a second glance. They were expecting the woman who'd attended the Oscars with Brody, not the mousy bookworm who carried an I'd rather be in Narnia tote bag and had fallen in love with more book boyfriends than real men. Jeff drove toward the bookstore. You okay? I have no idea. Kara realized what she'd said. Time to backtrack. I mean. Troy told me what he'd heard online, Jeff said in a sincere tone. I'll admit I'm surprised you're engaged to Brody Simmons. I had no idea you were dating anyone. It's complicated. She didn't know what else to say. People will be saying a lot of stuff about me. Not so nice things. Lies and gossip. That's Hollywood for you. He didn't miss a beat replying. I'm on your side, Kara. Whatever's going on, I assume you have a good reason. Not trusting her voice, she nodded. Knowing she had someone in her corner sent a rush of relief flowing through her. Kara wanted to tell Jeff the truth, but she couldn't right now. More for Brody's sake than her own. Jeff repositioned his hands on the steering wheel. Promise you'll call if you need anything. I will. And she would. He double parked in front of Cassandra's attic. Let me know if you need a ride home. Thanks, but Brody is picking me up. To plan a wedding that will never happen. Kara shuddered before regaining her composure. She hit the button on the seat belt. Have a great day doing whatever it is you do. Amusement filled his eyes. I make people money. Well, I hope you make a lot of it. Always. His grin lit up his face. Go find the perfect books for your customers. Kara slid from the car. She used her key to open the glass door, stepped into the bookstore, and then locked the door behind her. The store didn't open for another hour, but she used this time to review customer requests. The scents of books downstairs and fresh brewed coffee from the cafe area upstairs lingered in the air. Kara inhaled deeply, filling her lungs with the aroma. Her nerves didn't calm completely, but the smells lessened her on-edge feeling. She was where she needed to be. All she had to do now was keep her mind focused on her job. 
After depositing her coat and purse in her locker in the back room, she went to her desk near the front counter. Seeing book concierge written in a script font filled her with pride. This wasn't the job she ever expected to have, but she enjoyed finding the books customers wanted and searching for others that fit their needs. With her repeat customers, she often suggested books they might enjoy. Some now used her as their personal shopper. She'd wrapped more presents over Christmas than she had in her entire life. Her hours and salary had been increased in November, but she still wasn't earning what she had as a librarian, nor did she have the same benefits. Six months free rent would re-establish her savings account, which she drained after losing her job. She would have to see how much the engagement ring was worth before asking the library for permission to start the new programs. At least something good would come from this engagement charade. As her computer booted up, she checked the customer request forms. The second in the stack brought a much-needed smile to her face. Brett Matthews from Portland, Oregon, who'd done signings at the store for his financial and investing guides, had requested board books and classic children's literature first editions for his daughter, Noelle. Never mind she was only two months old, but the man was wealthy enough to spend his money on whatever he wanted. Books were never a wrong choice and a favorite purchase of his to make. Good morning. Cassie McKnight came down the staircase from the attic portion of the bookstore where customers could enjoy a warm or cold beverage and a pastry while sitting at tables or on comfy chairs. Her blonde ponytail bounced. A bright orange sweater fell past her hips and over the gauzy, floral print skirt swirling around suede black boots. She made a beeline to Kara. Are you okay? I'm glad to be here and not at my apartment. That much was true and wouldn't give away anything. She trusted her boss, but dragging others into the complicated situation wouldn't be smart. Please thank Troy for getting in touch with Jeff this morning. We're concerned about you. Cassie motioned to the engagement ring on Kara's finger. I have no idea what's going on, but please know Troy and I are more than happy to help you. You're a valued employee, but you're also a dear friend to us both. Warmth flowed through Kara. Thank you. Curiosity filled Cassie's expression. I'll admit to being surprised by your engagement. You've never mentioned Brody Simmons. As Kara's face burned, she studied the ring that felt weird on her finger. I, uh... She didn't want to lie, but she had no idea what to say that wouldn't give her away or make her sound like an idiot. It's okay. Cassie touched Kara's shoulders. Every couple has an origin story. Except she and Brody weren't a couple. Despite not being asked out much, Kara remained steadfast that Mr. Wright was out there somewhere. The timing just hadn't been right. Or maybe he didn't live in San Francisco and a new job somewhere else would put her closer to finding him. Not that she'd applied more than 60 miles from where she lived now. Time to expand her job search? Maybe after the engagement ring was off her finger and Brody left town. Which meant Kara should forget about the future for now. She needed to concentrate on the present. On her boss. I thought it was called a meat cute. Tomato, tomato, Cassie joked. Did I ever tell you how Troy and I met? Pausing, Kara thought about it. I don't think so. We met when I asked him if he'd be my fiancé for the night. Kara's mouth dropped open, even though Cassie had spoken so matter-of-factly. Seriously? Cassie nodded. Even though I told my parents I was happy being single, they kept trying to play matchmakers, so I made up a fiancé. That stopped their meddling until they wanted to meet him, so I asked a stranger in a bar to pretend to be engaged to me during a family dinner. One thing led to another. And you ended up marrying Troy. I did. Love shone on her face. That was unbelievable. Especially considering the ruse Kara and Brody were trying to pull off. Do you have any regrets over pretending? Not as many as I should, Cassie admitted, her cheeks tinged a charming pink. I hated lying to my parents and the whole faking we were in love really wore me out, but I wouldn't have Troy in my life if we hadn't told people we were engaged when we weren't. Kara didn't know what to say, but she understood better than Cassie probably imagined. I wish I could tell you. Been there myself. Compassion gleamed in Cassie's blue eyes. 
whatever's going on with you, your sister, and Brody, just know we're here for you. No matter what you need. A grin tugged at Kara's lips. Jeff had said the same thing. She appreciated knowing she wasn't alone, even if she couldn't tell her friends the truth. At least not yet. Thanks. That means a lot. I'll be in the back if you need anything. As Cassie wove her way through the wooden shelves full of books, Kara thought about what her boss had said. Maybe playing the role of Brody's fiancé wouldn't be so bad. Not that she and Brody would have the same outcome to their charade as Cassie and Troy had, but Kara hoped pretending wouldn't blow up in their faces as she feared. That the dread over the impending consequences would be minimal and making a clean break from Caitlin's future demands would happen. Still, Kara had her doubts. A shiver inched down her spine, continuing to the tips of her toes. Shaking those feelings might be as difficult as faking being Brody's fiancé. Chapter 5 Brody sat in the driver's seat of the nondescript, four-door sedan that looked more like a prop from a detective or FBI television show than a rental car. No one passing by glanced his way, but why would they? All strangers could see was a guy wearing sunglasses, a faded baseball cap, and an oversized hoodie. The outfit was typical bro wear, especially with his cargo shorts. What his assistant, Ainsley, called his incognito costume, but the disguise hadn't failed him yet. He hoped today wouldn't be the first time. His phone rang, but Brody ignored it for the hundredth time that day. He had no statement to make. He didn't want to talk to his agent or his publicist again. He just wanted to do what had to be done so he and Kara could move on. The sooner, the better. Once this is over, we'll, I'll, draw the line with Caitlin. Tell her we won't fix her problems anymore. You've been coming to her rescue for years. Will you be able to tell Caitlin you're done saving her? I have to unless I want to spend the rest of my life at Caitlin's beck and call. I don't want that. He didn't. Not for himself or Kara. Which meant he couldn't screw this up, for either of them. Brody had nailed tougher roles than playing Kara's adoring fiancé. How hard could pretending to be engaged to her be when she'd once been his best friend, closer to him than anyone? Except the gnawing in his gut suggested this wouldn't be a slam dunk because he needed her help to pull this off. And though she'd agreed earlier, she'd been hesitant and worried. Typical of Kara. But an anxious bride-to-be wouldn't fly. He wasn't sure how to help her, though. Eyeing the entrance to Cassandra's attic, he tapped his thumb against the steering wheel, but that did nothing to loosen the tension knotting his insides. Pull yourself together, Simmons. Maybe he was the one worrying too much. For all he knew, Kara had calmed down during her morning shift. If she hadn't, she would have even more stress to deal with, especially after she discovered her twin sister drama was not only trending, but also the hottest news of every internet gossip website. Kara would hate that. Unlike Caitlin who'd called him an hour ago. My Insta followers are up 10%. Yours, too. Everyone loves a juicy scandal. With a churning in his gut, Brody squeezed the steering wheel. Caitlin's excitement with her growing popularity due to being a so-called victim rubbed him the wrong way, reaffirming his need to break free. Kara stepped out of the bookstore. As she studied the cars parked along the curb, the expression on her face was the definition of worry. He wanted to lessen the tight lines around her mouth by telling her no one had followed him thanks to Ainsley in LA who posted online that Brody had been spotted at a cafe in North Beach. The location must have been believable because the paparazzi had disappeared faster than mice scurrying toward a cheese board. The moment Kara recognized the car, he'd texted her a picture of it, she hurried over and slid into the passenger seat. The door slammed shut. She winced. Sorry. He was the one who should be apologizing. How was work? Her gaze darted around. Quiet. As Brody pulled away from the curb, he had to ask. Any trouble? A grouchy customer couldn't find the book she wanted, but other than that, no. There weren't any reporters, photographers, or sketchy types out for a story. She faced him. 
How about you? I had a few calls, but nothing that can't wait. So we survived day one. At least the morning. She glanced at the time on the dashboard. That's better than I thought I'd do. He didn't like the way her shoulders drooped. Maybe he could cheer her up. Now the fun part begins. Fun part. She sounded dubious. Not that he blamed her. I made an appointment with the wedding place you mentioned. They're expecting us in fifteen minutes. Kara sucked in a breath. Okay, maybe this didn't qualify as her idea of fun. It'll be fine. She rubbed her forehead. Is planning a fake wedding necessary? My publicist thinks so, if we want to make the engagement appear legit. She rubbed her hands together. Guess more people pretend to be in relationships than I realized. She sounded resigned, not upset. That was progress. At least, he hoped so. We're going to make this work. Brody said the words for both their benefits before raising the volume on the car radio. He hit the scan button until music played. The drive passed in silence other than the top 40 hits playing. The quiet wasn't uncomfortable, but that didn't surprise him. When they were younger, Kara never felt the need to always be talking. He parked in front of a sign that read the Bayview House. It was a picturesque wedding venue in Pacific Heights. Ready? Kara bit her lip before she unbuckled her seatbelt. Let's get this over with. Brody met her on the sidewalk. The blue sky provided a movie-worthy backdrop for the elegant Victorian. You mentioned attending a wedding here. A former co-worker got married in a beautiful garden wedding on a gorgeous day like today. Though that was in the summer, not March. A wistful expression formed on her face but then vanished. She said the Bayview House offers everything a bride and groom need for their special day. Not that we're actually getting married, but it sounds like a one-stop shop that might make things easier. Easy works for me. Same, but, Kara's complexion paled. She wrapped her arms over her stomach. I still can't believe we're here. Pretending is one thing, but planning a wedding that won't ever happen. Wanting to comfort her, he slid his arm around her waist. It will be okay, babe. She stiffened. He didn't let go of her. What? You, her voice cracked. You've never called me that. Brody had to think about what he'd said. Babe? Her forehead creased. It's what you call Caitlin. I never noticed. Interesting that Kara had, but then again, she was observant, hanging back whether in a crowd or with her sister and him. Would you rather I call you something else? I don't know. She gave him the once-over. I guess engaged couples use terms of endearment. I could come up with something different. Baby. Honey. Sweetie. Cupcake. A mix of emotions crossed her face. She started to speak but then stopped herself. Use whatever's easy for you to remember since consistency is probably best, but it won't matter. That resigned tone of hers had returned. Why not? People will see through our charade. She blew out a breath. Let's be honest. Someone like you would never marry, me. Hey. His hand smoothed Kara's hair. He hated when she put herself down. You're an amazing, smart, and pretty woman. Whoever you marry will be the luckiest guy in the world. Something flashed in her eyes. Disappointment. No, that didn't make sense. Thanks, she said finally. A happily ever after would be nice, but I'd settle for a date with a guy who isn't allergic to Loki or one who wouldn't rather go out with you. That surprised him. Slim pickings. She shrugged. I've met more men since working at Cassandra's attic, but I've never been the dance the night away kind of person. Book clubs and lectures are more my style. Which is why I hope Caitlin doesn't ruin my reputation, or things could go from bad to worse. What guy will want to introduce his family to the woman who stole her twin sister's boyfriend? The right one will, 
Brody said without any hesitation. You'll be fine. The press will be looking for a Neil twin. By the time they figure out you're an O'Neill, this will be over. As she held out her left hand and crossed her fingers, her engagement ring sparkled in the sunshine. I'm not backing out, but this ring feels like a beacon of lies for all to see and expose. The way she spoke reminded him of one of Caitlin's monologues from the second film in their franchise. Probably not something he wanted to say to Kara when what she needed was support. It may feel that way to you, but all people will see is the diamond in setting. Not appearing convinced, she lowered her arm. If the Bayview House staff or others find out there isn't going to be a wedding, what do we do then? They won't. If they do. Brody gave her a squeeze, but given her stiff posture, the gesture didn't seem to reassure her. He needed her to relax the way they used to when they were kids on a hot summer day eating ice cream cones and tossing water balloons in their backyards. If only they could be as carefree as they had been then. Maybe when this was over with. We tell the truth. Caitlin won't like that. Too bad. Kara nodded. The lines on her face didn't appear to be as deep. Smiling, he brushed his lips over her hair. The floral fragrance of her shampoo tickled his nose. He didn't recognize the scent but liked it. A lot. Come on. They're expecting us. Brody let go of Kara and then laced his fingers with hers. He headed to the entrance, tugging her along. Chin up and smile. This isn't a death march to a bottomless fiery pit. Her startled gaze met his. How did you know that's what I was thinking? Because I know you. She would likely be comparing this situation to Dante's Inferno or some other classic he wouldn't have read and instead relied on spark notes and the movie version to pass English. Kara laughed, a sweet sound Brody hoped to hear more often today. Once upon a time, you did. That stung, but he deserved it. You haven't changed that much. I haven't, she admitted to his relief. But you have. Regret burned, scorching a path from his brain to his feet. Brody hated that she was correct. Stardom had changed him. Pretending to date Caitlin after they'd broken up. Now doing the same with Kara. That wasn't him. Or rather, it didn't used to be. Not that much. I'm still the same Brody Simmons you grew up with. But those parts had been buried deep inside him. Maybe being with Kara for however long this lasted would bring them out. He missed that guy. As they approached the front door, her steps slowed. We're doing this. Her voice was stronger than he expected. If she was nervous, she was doing a good job hiding it. Definite progress and just in time. We are. With a deep breath, Brody prepared to go public in his new role. He opened the front door. After you, my love. Chapter 6 My love? Stepping inside the Bayview house, Kara grimaced. Babe or even Snookum would be better than that. Except she told Brody to pick what he wanted, so she had only herself to blame for this one. She took a breath. The air smelled like fresh flowers and lemons. The pleasant scents didn't calm Kara's frazzled nerves. So what if she was standing in a room-sized entryway on a gleaming hardwood floor that led to a grand staircase? She felt as if she were teetering on the edge of a sulfur-emitting volcanic crevasse. Her insides trembled worse than the chihuahua that lived on the second floor with Mrs. Smith. Brody leaned over a vase of white roses sitting on a table and sniffed. I see why you like this place. What was up with him? He was acting too calm. Hugging her. Holding her hand. Using endearments without a second thought. Planning a wedding that wouldn't happen. Nothing seemed to faze him, but what he said made her curious. Why is that? The fresh flowers, the natural light, the colors, and the decor remind me of you. His tone was sincere, but that didn't mean Brody wasn't acting himself. Finding out he and Caitlin had pretended to be a couple for longer than they'd been together made Kara question where the actor ended and the real man began. She wasn't sure she could tell anymore. 
The realization hurt her brain and also her heart. Everything she thought she knew about him might be wrong. She dragged her upper teeth over her lower lip. Thanks, she said. Although fresh flowers don't last long in the condo. Loki goes ninja cat on them. You spoil that cat. Of course I do. Worry and impatience made her fidget. Her foot kept wanting to tap, but she feared the sound would echo. Drawing attention to herself was the last thing she wanted. Now or ever. She would happily leave the spotlight to Brody and Caitlin. He's all I've got. Brody made a face. That's not true. You have me and your family. It's not the same when you no longer live close. Kara wiped her sweaty palms on her black maxi skirt. The color seemed appropriate given her twin's lies. The only luck she'd had the last few months was bad. Okay, not 100% true. She enjoyed her job and volunteering at the library. She also loved Loki, the way he rubbed against her and his purring, but feeding him on time didn't give her the same sense of accomplishment as procuring a one-of-a-kind edition for a university's rare book collection. She missed speaking at conferences and seeing her research in print. Her job had given her validation and made her feel important. Kara's life had been near perfect except for a lack of dates, but she'd been working on that. Now. She glanced at the ring. Part of her wished she were engaged, that this ring wouldn't be sold to someone else, and that she'd be saying, I do for real. Uh-oh. That was a dangerous line of thinking. If she let herself get wrapped up in a fantasy, she would never survive this, with her heart intact. No sense in getting attached to the ring or to having Brody here. Neither would be a permanent fixture in her life. But both would help her. Kara always paid her own way, including her college education, and never accepted a handout, other than renting her sister's condo. The job at the bookstore kept her from going into debt. The ring would allow her to replenish her savings while she continued to search for a new job and help the kids at the library. A win-win. So why did she feel so conflicted? Because being here under false pretenses was messing with her head. She'd once been the girl most likely to succeed and valedictorian of her high school class. She was also a Phi Beta Kappa Honor Society member. Pretending to be engaged to anyone, let alone Brody, was not something she should be doing. Her rational, logical brain kept shouting, does not compute. The click, click, click of heels against the hardwood floor filled the air. A pretty woman with dark skin, black hair, and amber eyes approached. She wore an above-the-knee green skirt with a coordinating blouse. Stylish, but not flashy. Exactly what Kara thought someone who put on weddings for a living would wear. Good morning. Welcome to the Bayview House. The woman exuded warmth as if she were greeting old friends. I'm Soraya Foley. May I help you? Kara cleared her throat. I'm Kara O'Neill, and this is my, um, fiancé. Her tongue stumbled on the last word. This was her first time in front of the curtain, so to speak. Her legs shook, matching her insides. Weird given she'd spoken to filled auditoriums at library conferences, but there, she'd known what she was doing. I'm Brody Simmons. I spoke to someone earlier when I made the appointment. After he removed his cap and sunglasses, he extended his arm to shake Soraya's hand. Nice to meet you. Soraya's lips parted slightly but only for a second. If she was charmed, as most women were in his presence, she didn't let on. Knowing the Bayview House's reputation, Kara doubted Brody was their first high-profile groom. The pleasure's mine. Soraya's gaze didn't linger on Brody but traveled to Kara. Congratulations on your engagement. Her cheeks burned. Standing there like a blushing schoolgirl wouldn't do. She needed to be Brody's bride-to-be. Kara opened her mouth. A strangled squeak emerged. Thanks. As Brody pulled her closer, she leaned against him to keep her weak knees from giving out on her. We're very excited. His body heat wrapped around her like an electric blanket set on high. His scent made her light-headed. She needed to breathe before she passed out. I surprised Kara last night with a visit, he continued. 
Soraya's face lit up. How wonderful to have time together. Yes. My schedule keeps us apart too much. His voice flowed easily as if he were filming a scene after several rehearsals. He sounded believable, and Kara's wariness about him and the kind of person he'd become quadrupled. We decided to get married sooner rather than later. In a couple of weeks, if that's possible? Say what? Kara's knees nearly buckled, and she extended her arms to maintain her balance. She thought they would set a wedding date far off in the future. What was Brody thinking? He needed to slow down, not react at the speed of light. She tried to catch Brody's attention, but he was focused on Soraya. Our weekends are booked, Soraya said. But if you wouldn't mind a weekday. We don't mind if you feel you can work within that short time frame. The time frame won't be a problem. Soraya spoke with confidence. Great. Brody's take charge demeanor took some of the edge off. Kara knew he would try to manage the situation because that was what he'd done in the past. But two weeks to plan a wedding, even a make believe one? That didn't make sense. Not that any part of this situation did. We hope you understand the need for discretion with our plans, Brody added. Kara nodded, not trusting her voice. She'd been in L.A. at the beginning of Caitlin and Brody's rise to fame and understood how this worked. Most rumors didn't just happen. Leaks, and there would be some in their case, were planned and executed with precision. Care had to be taken. Brody had the most to lose after Caitlin, but librarian and scandal did not go well together, especially when Kara wanted to be hired by a prestigious university or museum and continue working with children. Of course, we understand. No request is too big for our couples. Soraya's smile didn't waver. Planning weddings must be fun, or lucrative, given how happy she seemed. Why don't we take a tour, and we can talk about what you have in mind for your special day. What? Kara's hands trembled. Things were moving too fast. She and Brody hadn't even joked about planning a wedding, let alone discuss details. He kept his arm around her. Sounds great. Her muscles tightened more. The only thing she could manage was another nod. Maybe she could get through the meeting without saying anything else. Silence would be better than screwing up. Having Brody so close and touching her made thinking straight impossible, but she didn't know why that was happening. Kara was overwhelmed. She'd gone from single and a nobody to engaged and gossip fodder because of her sister's lies in less than 24 hours. That had to be the reason. Soraya led them into an expansive room with elaborate chandeliers hanging from the fresco-covered ceiling. This is our main ballroom. As you can see, the space offers many possibilities. We've done everything from traditional weddings and receptions to themed ones ranging from Gone with the Wind to Doctor Who. Nice. Brody stood in front of a bay window. Kara mentioned a garden wedding. Soraya regarded her with interest. Garden weddings are one of our specialties. We offer indoor and outdoor options for the ceremony, cocktail hour, and the reception. Tight knots formed at the back of Kara's neck as she wiped her palms on her skirt again. She needed to say something. I attended a lovely garden wedding here last summer, but the most important requirement for us is privacy. I. We'd prefer a small gathering. The guest list will be limited. Non-existent. I understand, Soraya said. We have ways to ensure your privacy inside and out. I'll show you our portfolio. This room may feel too spacious, but you'd be amazed what columns or a gazebo can do to make the setting feel more intimate. Kara cleared her dry throat. An indoor gazebo is one way to have a garden wedding without being outside. No worries about weather, Brody said. We have a contingency plan for Mother Nature. Soraya didn't hesitate with her reply. She must hear the same questions from every couple. She can be fickle. The sunlight streaming in the windows cast a glow around Brody's head, making him look as if he were wearing a halo. He was a great guy, but angelic wasn't an adjective Kara would use to describe him. The paparazzi would have a harder time if everything was held inside. Indoors or outside, we'll do everything to ensure this is a private event. 
Soraya sounded competent and knowledgeable. No wedding crashers inside the main gate, high-powered lenses through the hedges, or helicopters overhead allowed. You've been through this before, Brody said. Yes. The fact Soraya didn't offer more information or drop names were good signs she protected her clients' privacy. The Bayview House strives to give each couple a special day to cherish. No two weddings are the same. We endeavor to provide a ceremony and reception that caters to a bride and groom's individual needs and is uniquely theirs. In Brody and Kara's case, the Bayview House's effort would be for nothing. Kara's stomach hurt, an ache that made her feel icky and dirty, even though she'd showered earlier. Brody had better give the Bayview House a massive tip and offer a client testimonial. Let me show you another area. Soraya led the way to a room with white molding near the ceiling that provided additional character to the space. This room is smaller but can accommodate sit-down meals as well as cocktails or a buffet. As Kara spun to take in the entire space, a feeling of anticipation built. Colors flashed in her brain. White. Pink. Not bright. A pale blush. Twinkling lights and tulle hung on the wall. A string quartet played. White linen cloths topped with pink runners covered round tables. Centerpieces overflowed with white and pink roses, and votive candles flickered. As if the pictures in her mind were real, a sweetly floral scent tickled her nose. The sound of a bow against cello strings stirred her heart. The reception played in her mind like a movie. Kara could barely breathe, overwhelmed by the images running through her mind and engaging her five senses. She placed her hand over her heart. The pounding matched her rapid pulse. Her throat squeezed shut. This was the wedding of her dreams, the one of her heart. But she couldn't plan it now. Not like this. Not with. Brody touched her shoulder. She jumped. He gave a reassuring squeeze, but having him closer made this worse. Because another image came to mind of him as her groom. No other man would do. She gulped. Bad. 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 What do you think, he asked. Perfect. But she couldn't say that or tell him to stop touching her so her brain would function again. She wanted to throw one of Caitlin's infamous tantrums, call off the fake wedding, and run far, far away so Kara could find a groom of her own, someone who happened to be a Brody Simmons clone. She couldn't do any of those things because this was his way out hers, too, from being under Caitlin's thumb. Kara wouldn't leave him to deal with this on his own. Not after being friends since they were little kids. Remembering times from their childhood gave her an idea. She surveyed the room once more, trying to force the images and her desire for a Pinterest-worthy reception from her mind. Lovely room, but I think it might be too nice for a picnic. Brody's forehead creased. Picnic? Tell me what you're thinking, Soraya said. Well, Brody and I grew up next door to each other, and we hung out in his treehouse. We would have picnics in the woods behind our houses or at the local park. With a slight smile, he cocked his head to the left. She could tell he was remembering their childhood. Those were the best times. Yes, they were. If only they were kids again with no worries except to be home before the sun went down. I was thinking a picnic-themed wedding would be fun. And playful. Not elegant, special, or the hundreds of other adjectives she'd imagined less than a minute ago. If you don't see any issues with being outside in March. No problem. The temperatures vary, but portable heaters are always an option. We can create a lovely indoor garden setting if it's too cold or rains. Soraya beamed. Sounds like this theme has a special meaning for you. Yes, Kara and Brody said at the same time. They both laughed. His gaze locked on hers. Connected. Energy flowed from his eyes to hers. So strong she wanted to reach out and touch the stream. Friendship. Nothing more. Soraya motioned to doors leading to the backyard. I'll show you the various options for an outdoor wedding and picnic reception. Brody lowered his hand to the small of Kara's back. He leaned close, his warm breath against her neck wreaking havoc with her brain and body. 
You okay? She nodded even though she didn't feel okay. Far from it. Somehow, pretending for only a few hours was opening up the dreams she'd locked away over three years ago when Caitlin started dating Brody. Kara needed to shove them into the deep recesses of her heart where they belonged. She couldn't let herself go back to wanting what she couldn't have. She'd survived and gotten over her crush the first time. She might not be so lucky again. What was wrong with her? All of this was a farce. There wouldn't be a wedding, no ceremony, or a reception, but… The truth slammed into Kara. She wanted that and a happily ever after, more than she'd wanted anything in her life. And a part of her, a big part she'd denied for so long, wanted them, with Brody. No. 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 Kara couldn't allow herself to be swept up into the fantasy, but how could she not? Her imagination was in overdrive and trying to carry her away. She glanced at the engagement ring on her finger. She was over Brody, had been over him for almost three years. Ovar. But her heart was forgetting that point. Brody, wedding. Wedding, Brody. Those were the only two things on her mind. So not good. The diamond on her finger gleamed as if mocking her. Or tempting her. What was happening? And how did she make it stop? Chapter 7 An hour and a half later, Brody sat across from Kara at a round table in a taqueria known for authentic tacos, fresh tortilla chips, and a wide variety of salsas. The lunch rush was over. No other tables were taken, but they sat in a dark corner booth where he faced the wall. He'd removed his sunglasses but wore his baseball cap. He didn't want to risk being recognized and ruin their meal. Eating out was the perfect respite after meeting with the wedding planner. He hadn't minded talking about a marriage ceremony and the reception that would follow, even if a wedding day would never happen. Playing Kara's fiancé was more fun than he thought it would be. He could get into this role. Too bad she hadn't seemed to enjoy the experience as much as he had. She hadn't smiled once since leaving the Bayview house, but at least she didn't seem as tense. He noticed Kara's plate was still full. You haven't eaten much. Using a fork, she picked at the fillings inside her fish taco. I'm not really hungry. That wasn't like her at all. She loved going out to eat. Mexican and Italian were her favorites. At least they had been when she lived in Los Angeles. Three years wouldn't have changed her taste buds. It had to be the wedding talk and planning. Not eating was only one sign. The lines around her mouth had faded, but her complexion was paler than normal and her gaze bounced all over the place. He hated seeing her this way, but there wasn't the luxury of slowing down to let her adjust at a more comfortable pace. I'm sorry for pushing you about the wedding plans, but we're pressed for time. You don't have to apologize. She glanced up from her plate. I agreed to pretend. We're in this together. She had, and they were. Good call with the picnic theme. The corners of her mouth edged up. Not much of a smile, but he'd take it. I was trying to think of something easy that could be planned without too much effort on Soraya's part. Kara set her fork on the plate. Though isn't a couple of weeks too soon for a wedding date? If this were a real wedding, yes. But with the interview airing on Thursday and Caitlin's film opening on Friday, we need everything in place before that so we can leak info as needed. After box office numbers are released, we can decide what to do next. If we cancel the wedding right after the film's premiere, won't people think this is a publicity stunt? He added more hot sauce to his taco. People will think that no matter the timing. We'll come off looking better if they call it a publicity stunt. Kara shredded one edge of her napkin into lopsided fringe. Soraya is nice. She seemed excited about the picnic theme. I hate that we're using her this way. He raised his water glass. Soraya Foley is a professional wedding planner. We won't be the first couple to cancel. She'll understand. They'll get their money and then some. By the time the fake engagement ended, he'd be out a hundred grand, maybe more, 
but the money would be well spent. Friendship didn't come with a price tag, even if the end of this ruse would result in him setting new boundaries with one of those friends. No one is going to suffer a hardship or get hurt, he added. Promise. Something flashed in Kara's eyes but then disappeared. She still didn't appear convinced. Reaching across the table, he covered her hand with his. You're cold. Just tired. Her voice was soft. My nerves are shot. He appreciated her honesty. Caitlin usually said fine, which was a clue something was wrong. He rubbed the top of Kara's hand. Let's swing by the store on the way home. Grab a six-pack of beer and snacks. We can binge watch Netflix or put together one of those impossible jigsaw puzzles you love. We're supposed to look at invitations tonight. Always the good girl. He forced himself not to laugh. Let Loki pick one for us so we can do what we want. She opened her mouth but then closed it. Why not? He has as much invested in this wedding as we do. That was more like it. Brody grinned. Maybe she was getting into the spirit of fake wedding planning. That's my Kara. She pulled her hand from beneath his and ate a tortilla chip. Bummer. He enjoyed holding her hand. Something he rarely did with any woman because of Caitlin. He had to be conscious of his every action because someone was always watching him, and no matter where he was, he had to keep up the pretense of being in love with Caitlin. He'd been counting down the months until they could stop lying. Knowing that would happen sooner than January filled him with relief. Kara wiped her mouth with a napkin. I'm yours only as long as this ring is on my finger. After that, you'll have to find someone else. She definitely wasn't as stressed as she'd been. Knowing that pleased him. There is no one else like you. Kara brightened. I know, but that's something you'll have to live with. I'm sure you'll survive. He laughed, but he was surprised his ring was the one on her finger. She was the kind of woman a man took home to meet his family. His parents loved Caitlin, but Kara was their favorite twin. Always had been. She remembered birthdays and anniversaries. When his mother had gallbladder surgery, Kara had gone to Sacramento and filled his parents' freezer with healthy, homemade meals that just needed to be put in a slow cooker or the oven. That got him thinking. So, other than cat allergies, why aren't you dating anyone? She shrugged. San Francisco hasn't been an easy place for me to meet guys. The majority of my former co-workers were women. Unfortunately, none had eligible bachelors for brothers or friends. Though I went out with someone's cousin. And. Amusement gleamed in her gaze. He was nice. Attractive. But he was still in love with his ex-girlfriend. After an hour of listening to him go on about her, I told him to send her a text about getting together to catch up. He did, and they're married now. I didn't know matchmaking was one of your talents. Transition person might be a more apt description. An hour makes you his transition person. She stared over her glass of lemonade. Well, in that case, I knew the date would go nowhere so I was only trying to find the fastest way to end my misery. You'll need a transition person when our engagement is over. I can handle a breakup after, what did you say, three weeks max. And here I thought you cared about me, he joked. Kara glanced at her taco. Like one woman matters when millions are head over heels in love with you. Not with me. Which was a big problem. They fall for the character they see on the screen. Is there a difference? Her question made him shift positions. Even though they hadn't spent much time together since she'd moved to San Francisco, she knew him better than most. Of course. She raised an arched brow. Really? He couldn't get away with anything around her. Caitlin took whatever he said at face value. Never Kara. Most of the time. You're a great guy. You deserve to find true love. Her sincerity touched his heart. Most people wanted something from him. He wasn't used to someone wanting something good for him. 
That'll be easier to find once people know Caitlin and I aren't together. Finally being truthful is one of the bright sides to all of this. What's the other bright side? There are two. No longer feeling indebted to your sister and spending time with you. Kara's face lit up, filling him with warmth. Being with her was so much easier than being with Caitlin. I like when you smile. Do you like this? Kara stuck out her tongue at him. I liked it better when your tongue was blue after drinking a slushy. She laughed. I haven't had one of those in forever. We'll have to remedy that while I'm here. Okay. She stabbed at her taco before setting the fork on the plate. She twirled a strand of hair between her fingers. He knew what that meant. What's on your mind? Kara's mouth slanted. You really want to know? Of course. She took a breath, exhaled. Being at the Bayview house makes me want to plan a real wedding. The longing in her voice not only surprised him, but it also tugged at his heart. He'd been so focused on Caitlin he hadn't considered Kara's feelings beyond pretending or that she might be ready for the next phase in her life. You're ready to settle down. Two lines formed above the bridge of her nose. Settle down sounds like a person is settling for less. I just. What? I want to find a man who accepts me for who I am and wants to be a part of my life. Her words swirled in his head. Most people wanted that at some point in their lives, but she hadn't dated in high school, too busy with her studying, clubs, and a part-time job, and he knew of only one boyfriend she had in college. What was his name? Quincy or maybe Lance. Something with a C in it. The guy had been okay but too intellectual for Brody's liking. Kara was smart enough on her own. She needed someone to help her loosen up, relax, and have fun. Thankfully, a job transfer had sent them to opposite coasts. Their long-distance relationship had ended after their first month apart. The guy's decision, not Kara's. But what she wanted now sounded more serious than dating or having another boyfriend. Since her breakup, Kara hadn't gone out with that many guys. Brody had asked her, and Caitlin often mentioned her sister's bad dates. He hadn't thought Kara wanted, needed, more. The realization unsettled him. Why? He wasn't sure. Guilt over being selfish? That was as good a guess as any. Brody went to brush his hand through his hair but hit the brim of his cap. He picked up his water instead. Have someone in mind? Another shrug. That meant she wasn't going to tell him if she did. That stung. She used to tell him everything, but they weren't as close as before. Caitlin had gotten in the way. That had been his fault. He didn't have many regrets, but dating Caitlin was one. Continuing to act as if they were a couple after they'd broken up was another. Soon, though, that would be behind him. But he knew one thing he could do to help Kara find what she wanted. That was what friends did. Help each other. I know some great guys. If you want me to introduce you to them, I can. She stiffened. No, thanks. Unexpected relief flowed through him. Not surprising once he thought through what he'd offered. He didn't want the insider scoop on what she did with her boyfriend. Listening to Caitlin tell him every detail about her love life as if he were her ex-boyfriend, BFF, brother, and therapist all rolled into one was bad enough. Ready to go. Kara stood. Thanks for lunch. Thanks for pretending to want to marry me. Few women can say they were engaged to one of the sexiest men in the world, she teased. He lowered his head. I'm never going to live down that magazine profile. Nope. He placed his arm around her as they left the restaurant. As before, being close to her and touching her was easy. No acting skills required. To his left, two men strode toward them. One man nudged the other. The hair on Brody's neck prickled. He'd been playing this game too long not to recognize paparazzi, but Kara had relaxed. He wanted to keep her smiling, so he led her in the opposite direction. 
Let's go this way. The car is to the left. Only the truth would appease her analytical brain. We're being followed. He glanced over his shoulder. One man held up a cell phone as if taking a photo. The other now had a camera bag in front of him. Not good. A small shop was two doors away from the taqueria. It must share the alley behind the buildings. They could slip through the store and out the back door. That sounded better than trying to outrun the photographers. In here. Brody pulled her into the store, hurriedly closing the door behind them. Colorful women's clothing hung on floor racks and hooks attached to a court-covered wall. Hey. A young woman with pink and green hair greeted them. Her clothing appeared more thrift store retro than trendy boutique wear. Her black boots needed polishing. Tattoos covered her arms. I'm Opal. May I help you? He whipped out a $20 bill. Is there a back exit we can use? Yes, but we got a delivery this morning, Opal said. Boxes are blocking the way. He took out two more twenties. Is there a place we could hang out for a few minutes? We're trying to ditch two guys. Kara peered over her shoulder at the door. After glancing at Kara, Opal focused on Brody. You can wait in a dressing room. If someone comes looking for you, I'll say you went out the back. They won't know about the boxes. Flashing his hey beautiful lady smile, he handed Opal the money. Get rid of them, and there's more where that came from. Cool. After folding and tucking the $20 bills into her bra, she led them to a dressing room. Wait in here. And be quiet. She jerked a heavy velvet curtain shut. The room felt tiny, almost claustrophobic. One wall contained a tall, gilded mirror. The other two walls were painted a metallic blue color. Be quiet. Kara whispered. With her wide eyes, she resembled a spooked animal that was being chased by a pack of dogs. Like we're going to throw ourselves a party in here. She means no dressing room sex. Kara drew away. Her eyebrows pinched together at the same time the corners of her mouth curved downward in what he'd come to call her bewildered expression after they'd taken health class together. That's a, um, thing. He tried not to smile. Most definitely a thing. For a 28-year-old intelligent woman, Kara O'Neill seemed as naive as she'd been in high school. It was time to have a little fun. He ran the side of his finger along her jawline. Her skin was soft and smooth. We're engaged and planning a wedding. So if you're game. Shoo, she clamped her hand over his mouth. He could lick her palm so easily, but that would freak her out. She might shriek and give them away. Almost worth it. She lowered her hand. He'd waited too long. Probably for the best. Kara stared at the curtain. Opal is going to sell us out, or you'll owe her a lot more money. She won't sell us out. He'd used his most charming smile on the sales clerk. I always carry cash. It's the easiest way to get out of certain situations. Kara covered her ears. I don't want to know. She really was adorable, a mix of nerves, frustration, and anger. Her lower lip stuck out. No lipstick or hint of gloss, she must have chewed it off at the Bayview house or at lunch, and he wondered what she'd taste like if he kissed her. Sweet. Or spicy. Her swift temper suggested heat simmered beneath the surface. Funny how he'd known her for his whole life but never noticed these things until now. Most likely because she was always in her sister's shadow. Caitlin burned brighter than them both. The bell on the door jingled. Kara's worried gaze met Brody's. She faced him, only inches away, close enough to hear her breath, but not to feel it. His temperature rose. Two bodies in a small space would explain the heat. Physical chemistry would, too. Voices sounded. A woman and a man. Maybe two men. Brody listened, but he couldn't hear what they were saying. He made out one word, police. 
The bell on the door jingled, but Opal didn't open the curtain. The door closed, Kara whispered. Maybe they left. Or someone else came in. He'd been through this too many times to take a peek. Opal said to wait. We'll wait. His cell phone vibrated. He glanced at the screen to see a text from Caitlin. Caitlin, where are you? The photographers need pics of you and Kara. Brody, you know about them. Caitlin, I tipped them off when you told me where you were having lunch. Brody, why? Caitlin, to make this appear legit. Brody, we're planning a wedding. Call off the hounds. Caitlin, fine. Brody, anything else? Caitlin, the interview went live. He wanted to cuss, but Kara had never liked him using certain four-letter words around her. Brody, you said we had until Thursday. Caitlin, out of my control. TTYL. He blew out a frustrated breath. Caitlin had zero control over the interview airing, but later would have worked out better for everyone. He tucked his phone in his pocket. Caitlin being in touch with the photographers, and the others who'd parked themselves outside the condominium building earlier this morning, pissed him off. Brody was concerned about Kara. Her worry nodded his gut. He'd spent the past two and a half years living a lie, so he figured there was karma involved for him. But her. She didn't deserve this. She'd done nothing but support him and Caitlin over the years. Gave them what extra money she had from her part-time job in college. More after she worked full-time before they made it big. Listened to them complain at all hours of the night. Dropped everything whenever they needed her. He hated that her smile had disappeared once again. Time to lighten the mood. Just think how many women would love to be in your place right now. Nothing personal, but I'd change places with one in a heartbeat. Hiding like this, she glanced around the cramped dressing room. It's so not me. Her quiet voice shook. Not quite on the verge of panic but close. She needed a distraction. Turning his cap so the brim faced the back, he asked, would this be more to your liking? Leaning forward, he kissed her on the lips. Just a light touch. She stiffened but soon relaxed. He was only going to make the kiss a peck, but she tasted so sweet. There was something more, too, something unexpected. More than a dash of spice. Brody wrapped his arms around her, pulling her closer. He wasn't ready to stop. Her chest went against his. Softness and warmth, the definition of Kara. When she wiggled, he'd exploded low in his gut. Oh, man. If he'd known his sweet Kara's kisses were so hot, he would have done this years ago. As he pressed harder against her lips, he hoped Opal took her time coming back. Chapter 8 Brody's lips moved over Kara's as if they'd been made to kiss hers. This was better than any daydream. Tingles shot out, sending pleasurable chills across her skin. Nerve endings danced the tango. Or maybe it was the cha-cha. He tasted hot and spicy. No doubt from the salsa. His hands rubbed up and down her back. Kara rose on her toes to get closer to him. His kiss had been a total surprise. She had no idea why he'd chosen this moment, but she didn't care. Her arms wove around his neck. The ends of his hair tickled her skin. She'd dreamed about his kiss for years. If her brain wasn't overwhelmed, she could calculate the exact length of time, but she wanted to enjoy his lips against hers for however long it lasted. A need grew deep inside her. An ache fueled by the rising heat. His kiss was hot enough to turn her insides to. Go! That had never happened to her before, and she liked the feeling. She lowered her hands to hold on to his shoulders. Falling would spoil the moment. The ridges of muscles beneath her palms told of his strength. He wouldn't let her fall. He had her back, and she had his. Always. She wanted more of him and his kiss. She parted her lips. A noise sounded. A moan. From her. The caress of his fingers against her sent her temperature boiling. 
a million times better than any fantasy or dream. Eager to be closer, she arched against him and wound her fingers in his hair. She couldn't get enough of his kiss, enough of him. Another noise sounded. A click. Several clicks. Not her. Brody jerked away. Startled, she glanced up at him. The dressing room lit up. A camera's flash. Every nerve ending and muscle stiffened, frozen in place. She wasn't sure what was happening, but the shock on Brody's face matched how she felt. He shielded her face, hauled her against him, and turned them away from the photographers. Get out. One man snickered, an evil, mocking sound. We got what we came for. The two men disappeared from sight. Less than a minute later, a bell jingled. They must be gone. Thank goodness. She inhaled deeply, but that didn't slow her racing pulse. Brody let go of her. You okay? Her heart pounded. Adrenaline flowed. Her lips tingled from his kisses. Glancing at her reflection in the mirror, she did a double take. Totally unrecognizable. Her face was flushed. Her lips were pink and plump. Her expression was a cross between panicked and turned on. She didn't like the face staring at her or how she felt about Brody. Crushing on him was the last thing she needed. Let's get out of here, he said. In a daze, she followed him to the front of the store. Who are you anyway? Opal asked. Brody removed his sunglasses and cap. The woman gasped. Brody Simmons. No one will believe this. Can I have your autograph? He turned his baseball cap around and put on his sunglasses. No. And you missed out on more cash by not helping as you said you would. As they exited the store, he held Kara's hand. You okay? I'm not sure. She fought the urge to cling to him. Go right. We'll backtrack to the car in case we're being followed. How did they know where we were? She asked. Caitlin. Figures. Kara's gaze went to the right and then the left, but she saw only an older woman carrying a shopping bag coming toward her. The interview was broadcast today. Brody adjusted his sunglasses. Guess she wanted to give fans proof of our being together. She's the one who texted you in the dressing room. Yes. Unbelievable. Kara's frustration spiraled. Opal sold us out, but she's a total stranger so that's not unexpected. Caitlin, however, keeps doing the same thing, and she's family. I don't understand why. Caitlin wants our engagement to appear real to her fans. She needs them to believe her, but I don't appreciate the methods she's using. Me either. But to be honest, this was nothing new for Kara's sister. I hope my face doesn't show up in the photographs. It shouldn't have thanks to my expert. Kissing? Blocking, he said a second later. Thanks for that. She went around the corner. But why did you kiss me? Concern was written on his face, or was it guilt? Caitlin had texted him. That sent up a red flag. Was he in on this with her? Kara hadn't considered Brody might not be an innocent party. His eyebrows drew together. You were stressed, on the verge of panicking. I wanted to distract you. Wanting to distract her wasn't the same as wanting to kiss her. Maybe there was more to this. Or maybe you kissed me so the photographers would catch us. He stopped, his face hardening. His jaw jutted forward. No. I would never do that to you. Kara wanted to believe him, but at the same time, a part of her didn't. Couldn't. Her toes remained curled from his kiss. The tingling of her lips hadn't stopped. A hot kiss meant nothing to him. Brody Simmons kissed beautiful, sexy actresses for a living. He didn't get into those kisses. I wanted to distract you. Apparently, he hadn't gotten into this one. Not the way she had. Knowing that sucked. It worked. She tried to keep disappointment out of her voice. Good, but how come we've never done that before? She wanted to groan, but she didn't. 
You were too busy dating girls from the cheer squad and gymnastic team. A goofy, lopsided grin formed on his face. Those were the days. You broke a lot of hearts. Including hers. Mine got broken, too. True. She couldn't count the times she listened while he poured out his sorrows when that happened. They went around the block. A mother carried a baby in a front pack while holding the hand of a little girl dressed in pink and purple. He glanced behind them. I don't think anyone is following us. Thank goodness. Kara's pulse hadn't settled. This was more excitement than she was used to, kissing a haughty actor and being caught by paparazzi. Doing a jigsaw puzzle sounded nice and boring, exactly how she liked things. Let's skip the store and go to my place, she said. I don't want to take another chance of being spotted. Sounds good. He hit the key fob, and the car doors unlocked. Who knows what the reaction to the interview will be. We should turn off our phones and not worry about it until tomorrow morning. Guess that meant he was planning to stay at her place again. A shiver inched along her spine. Brody was a longtime friend, but being around him disconcerted her. She didn't know if she should treat him like a guest, family, or... Maybe she was overthinking this. Her tingling lips, too. As long as he didn't kiss her again, she should be fine with him around. At least, she hoped so. Eating a home-cooked dinner, sharing a bottle of wine, watching Loki select a wedding invitation, and putting together a puzzle relaxed Brody. The tension seeped from his muscles. The knots all but disappeared. Kicking back with Kara made him forget everything. No stress, only laughter and a good time. He placed another puzzle piece of the windmill on Kara's side of the table and then raised his glass. This is exactly what I needed. More wine, she asked. Time with you. The way her face lit up pleased him. He sipped the Pinot Noir. Beer was his beverage of choice but the red went down smooth. How are you doing with everything that's happened so far? Can't say I'll ever be used to the paparazzi parked outside my building, but I feel safe inside. Good because things will be crazy for a bit. Don't you mean crazier? She swirled what wine remained in her glass. I remember what it was like for you and Caitlin when your movie hit number one. Of course Kara did. They had sought refuge from the insanity at her apartment. So you're doing okay with all this? I wouldn't go that far, but it's not like we can stop it. I'm trying to find what positives I can. Any luck? She refilled her glass. We haven't hung out like this in a while so that's been nice. He couldn't remember the last time. Oscar night had been scheduled with the award show and after parties. It's been too long. My schedule's been insane. Yet, he'd taken a few short breaks. Ones he'd spent in the mountains of Colorado or out of the country on a sunny beach. Not once had he thought to visit Kara in San Francisco. Bad decision. He needed more of this rather than sand or snow. How was the Academy Awards last week? As crazy as the last one, she asked. He'd gone with Caitlin, but he'd had more fun the year before with Kara, who'd been wide-eyed, full of wonder, and wanting to experience everything. Yes, and I missed having you with me. I have a new appreciation of what goes on now, especially during commercial breaks. This year, Loki and I celebrated by throwing our own Academy Awards party. He wore a bow tie. And you? Brody asked. I put on the dress. The dress had made him realize Kara had a similar body type as Caitlin, appealing curves in all the right places, but one's Kara kept hidden. A shame, really. I wish I could take credit, but that was all Ainsley's doing. She used your credit card. Best purchase ever. When Caitlin had gotten sick, Kara had flown to Los Angeles the night before the Academy Awards and stayed in a Beverly Hills hotel. Ainsley, his personal assistant for the past three and a half years, had taken care of Kara, picking her up at the airport, arranging a spa day and hair appointment, and getting her a dress, shoes, and jewelry to wear. 
He hadn't seen Kara until the limo picked him up to go to the theater. He hadn't believed the difference in her. She'd looked more like a starlet than a librarian who spent her free time scouring for books in old shops and dusty basements. We had fun that night, he said. Thinking about all the dancing we did at the after parties makes my feet hurt. Dancing was the second best part. The spa day was your favorite. Nope. She stared over the rim of her wine glass. Seeing you dressed up in a tuxedo and presenting an Oscar was amazing. Remember how you talked about being on stage at the Academy Awards when we were kids? Experiencing that dream come true for you was such a thrill. Brody's chest tightened. His dad was a mechanic and his mom a bank teller. They worked the same jobs they had for 30 years, even though he sent them money, gave them gifts, and offered to support them if they wanted to retire or simply quit. Most people back home had thought he and Caitlin would give up their pursuit of stardom after a year or two in Hollywood and crawl home in defeat. Success hadn't come quickly. More than once, his parents had sent him money, as had Kara, but perseverance paid off. I've been fortunate. And lucky. You're talented. So are many others. Some who'd started out at the same time he had were still working at restaurants or other jobs while waiting for their big break. I'll never forget those who helped me in the beginning. Is that why you're doing the audio narration for that author's new series? He straightened. That wasn't public knowledge yet. Only a handful of people knew. Did Caitlin tell you? Kara nodded. It's a great idea. Only if I can nail the female point of view. Your voice is like melted chocolate. You could read a grocery list and have people listening in rapt adoration. Interesting. He leaned across the table. Do those people include you? Picking up a puzzle piece, she studied each side. If she was playing hard to get, it was working. So. Kara placed the piece in its spot on the puzzle. Yes or no? he asked, impatience getting the best of him. The laughter in her eyes told him she knew it, too. If you use that British accent from your spy movie, then yes, I would be included. You like Maxwell. Loved him. Like every other woman with a pulse. I don't care about other women. How did you feel? Placing her hand over her heart, she tapped it. You know how we used to make esmores in your backyard? and the marshmallows would be all hot and mushy. Yes. That's how I felt when I heard Maxwell's voice. Hot and mushy was awesome. Maxwell Armitage, a working-class James Bond type with a bad boy reputation, was the first role he'd done without Caitlin as a co-star. The film hit number one at the box office for two weekends in a row. He'd done skits as the character for the last year on various talk shows, so slipping into Maxwell's skin wasn't difficult. He tilted his head and gave Kara his most smoldering look, one a cameraman had spent hours working with him to perfect. Have a list handy, love. I'd enjoy getting to you. Kara's lips parted. Oh, no. Don't do that. I may forget who you are, and then we'd really be in trouble. Cocking one brow, he flashed a you-know-you-want-me look. My type of trouble can be fun. Let's have a go. She covered her ears. La, 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 la. I can't hear you. He burst out laughing. Kara used to tune him out like that when they were younger. You would find this funny. She lowered her hands. But seriously, Maxwell is a babe magnet. Or would be if he were real. I'll remember that the next time I'm trying to pick up a woman. As if you'd have any trouble. Brody shrugged, but he was over the dating scene. He preferred having one woman, a special one, in his life. Someone to talk to, spend time with, and make him forget whatever was going on in the world. Like tonight with Kara. But finding that wasn't easy. He never knew if people wanted Brody the man or Brody the movie star. At least he could trust Kara and Caitlin. Well, the latter with a few caveats. 
they'd known each other their entire lives. Nothing would come between them. Including the pretend engagement. Loki meowed. He rubbed against Kara and then jumped on the table. Jigsaw pieces fell to the floor. He's ready for bed. Kara picked up the pieces. So am I. It's almost midnight. Feels earlier. Time flies when you're having fun. This was fun. He hated for the day to end. We could watch a movie. And be a zombie tomorrow. She picked up Loki. I can't function without enough sleep. I have to meet with Hannah Yee at the Bayview house before we decide on a menu. Hannah. The wedding dress designer. Not sure why I need her to make me a gown. Something off the rack would be fine. It's not like I'm going to wear it. Appearances. If Hannah has something for you or ideas about a dress, humor her. Kara shifted the cat to one arm before downing the remaining wine in her glass. Will you be okay sleeping on the couch again? I'd rather be in bed with you. She rolled her eyes. Yeah, right. More comfy, he backtracked, wishing he'd kept his mouth closed. Ever since the kiss, weird thoughts about her had been flashing in his mind. But I'll be fine on the couch. Loki gave Brody a triumphant look. The spoiled cat would watch Kara undress, sleep on the pillow next to hers, and cuddle against her. Well, good night, then, she said. No good night kiss. He used his Maxwell voice. Not tonight. Things are complicated enough without letting tiredness and wine muck things up. I'm good at cleaning up muck. Smiling, she blew him a kiss. See you in the morning. Probably for the best. He'd enjoyed kissing Kara, but she was correct. They didn't need more complications. Best not to cross any lines and touch lips again. Even if he was thinking of her in ways he hadn't before, she was his friend. Always had been, always would be. Kissing more could screw that up. Now that she was back in his life, he wanted to keep her there. Though sleeping on the couch sucked. The minutes turned into an hour. The more restless and uncomfortable he got, the more he thought about Kara. That told him one thing. He'd been working way too much. He needed to go out more. Have some fun. As soon as this fiasco with Caitlin was over, he would figure out a way to do just that. He couldn't wait. Chapter 9 Something jumped onto Brody's chest. Not too heavy. About 10 or 11 pounds, but unexpected and uncomfortable. Like this couch. His lower back ached. Disoriented and sleepy, Brody opened his eyes and blinked. Sunlight filled the living room. Black pupils wide against green irises, Loki stared down at him. Two teeth that resembled tiny vampire fangs stuck out from each side of his mouth. One of the cat's long whiskers was white. The rest were black. Good morning, Loki. The cat bumped his head against Brody's chin, pawing at his chest. Where's Kara? Loki lay down. His gaze locked on Brody's. He didn't hear anyone walking around. The kitchen was empty. Then he heard the shower. Bet you want to go into the bathroom, but she closed the door because I'm here. She'd done the same thing with her bedroom door last night. I'd want in if I were you, too. Who was he kidding? He wouldn't mind a peek. Streams of water would be running off her shoulders, down her smooth skin, and dripping off her. Stop. Now. Thinking about Kara taking a shower was not the image a friend should have on his mind. And that was all he was. Her friend. They were planning a fake wedding. There wouldn't be make-believe foreplay or a pretend honeymoon. He kept telling himself that nothing, including more kisses, could happen between them. She was off-limits, and he knew that. But logic didn't stop his temperature from rising or lessen his desire. Yeah, as soon as this was over, he needed to find a real girlfriend. Someone he could do all the things he was thinking about doing with Kara, 
his friend. A friend who happened to be female, smart, and beautiful. Reminding himself of those things didn't help him cool off. He needed to do something else. Time to move, buddy. Placing Loki on the floor, he went to the kitchen and filled a glass with ice cubes and water. He downed the cold liquid. Loki rubbed against his legs. What? The cat's food bowl was half full, but the water one was empty. Okay, I'll refill it for you, buddy. As soon as he placed the full bowl on the floor, Loki drank as if he'd spent a week in the desert. Brody could relate. He didn't need water, just more kisses. It had been a long, dry spell for him, yesterday aside. Brody powered up his phone. Beeps sounded, and the device vibrated. Missed calls and texts scrolled by. Not a couple. Several. That was weird. Less than ten people had his number. Before he could read any of the messages, his phone rang. Ainsley's name flashed on the screen. He answered. What's up, Ains? Caitlin's lost it. She's gone total banshee, shrieking and calling me non-stop to ask if I've heard from you. I told her you either forgot to charge your phone or turned it off. I didn't want to be bothered. Figured. Ainsley sounded like she was smiling. Congrats on your engagement. I always thought you and Kara made a cute couple. Did you see the photos of you guys kissing? Oh so hot. Not surprising. The kiss had been hot. Probably why he kept thinking of more kisses when he shouldn't. When did the photos come out? About an hour ago. What time is it? 8.30. He'd slept later than he'd thought. Any fallout? Well, between Caitlin's interview yesterday and the pictures this morning, Twitter has been blazing with battles between your fans and Caitlin's. Lots of name-calling. Accusations. Fifteen minutes of fame seekers saying you cheated on Caitlin long before Kara. I expected that. Yes, but. Ainsley's concerned tone made the hair on his arms stand straight. What? Threats are being made against Kara. His muscles nodded. Kara had been dragged into this. She didn't need crazies coming after her on the internet or in real life. If something happened to her. A vice tightened around his heart. He paced across the living room floor. What kind of threats? Physical ones, Ainsley admitted. I don't know how seriously to take them. Maybe it's trolls or, more likely, Caitlin's rabid fangirls are overreacting. They called themselves the Brates and wanted nothing less than an engagement announcement from him and Caitlin. I'm not taking any chances. I'll cancel the appointments we have today. Brody wished people wouldn't take what celebrities did so personally. I'm not risking Kara's safety. Call the security team we used last year with that stalker. They'll know the steps to take. Get them to San Francisco today. I don't care what it costs. I left a message before I called you. I'll try again when we hang up. Give them this number. But. It's the only way I can be reached while I'm here. Only his close friends, family, and management team had this number. No one else. Others called a second phone, one he didn't always carry with him or answer right away. I'm on it, boss. Ainsley sounded like she was juggling her phone and typing on her tablet at the same time. Just so you know, Matthias is perturbed you haven't returned his calls. Matthias was his agent. A high-strung businessman who liked designer suits, fast cars, and busty blondes. He was a killer negotiator and for good reason. The more his clients made, the more he did. I'll call him. Have you and Kara set a date? We're discussing one. Brody didn't want too much news of their wedding released yet, even though he trusted Ainsley. We'll have more time to think about our plans today, but I want you to leak something about a wedding being held in a tropical locale. Will do. I'll contact the PR firm after I call the security team again. Anything else? 
He needed to tell Ainsley the truth about what was going on so she could help plan for the fallout a breakup would bring, but he wasn't ready to do that. He stared at the closed bathroom door where Loki Saturday, Kara and I make a cute couple, don't we? Yeah, but you want to know the best thing about you too. What? She makes you happy. Caitlin is so high maintenance you seem on edge around her. You smile brighter whenever you talk about Kara or are with her. He did. But to be honest, Brody wasn't that surprised. Kara was a special woman who made him want to be a better man. Though I get why there's a ton of media coverage over this. I was just as shocked as everyone else to hear the news, but you and Kara make sense when I think about it, Ainsley continued. Ignore what's being said. You deserve a happy ending. People will come around to you falling in love and getting married soon enough. Except people wouldn't have to come around. In less than three weeks, this engagement would be over. He'd fly home, and Kara would stay here. Thinking of being apart from her was a real bummer. Unless he could convince her to go to Los Angeles with him. She might not be able to work with rare books, but there were other library jobs she could do. Maybe she could find a job in the children's section of a library somewhere. He could fund whatever programs she wanted to develop. Yeah, having her in LA made the most sense. She'd be closer to her sister and parents, too. Sure, she would be his ex fiance by then, but his PR people were the best. They could release a well-crafted statement saying the breakup was mutual, and they were still friends. Kara was and always had been his friend. He'd just forgotten that, but he wouldn't again. Brody enjoyed spending time with her. She did make him happy. He only hoped Kara felt the same way about him. In the bathroom, Kara dried off after her shower. Music played from her cell phone. K-pop. She thought the dance beat would keep her awake. Her eyelids felt heavy and her brain foggy. She'd barely slept last night. One person was to blame, Brody. Thoughts of him kissing her in that dressing room had kept her up, most, if not all, night. Loki had given up getting a restful sleep and deserted the bed around four in the morning. She wanted to think of Brody as her friend. Fake fiancé or former crush would do, too. But she couldn't stop the thoughts of his lips against hers and his arms around her. Warmth grew near her core and flushed outward. Flutters filled her stomach. One butterfly, two butterflies, a hundred. Not good. Yes, he was gorgeous, sexy, and near perfect, but he wasn't and wouldn't be hers. Not ever. She glanced at her reflection in the steamed up mirror. You're not Caitlin. Don't think you can have what she had. Kara slipped on her green polka dotted robe. Terry cloth brushed over her skin the way Brody's hands had. Only the soft fabric didn't give her the same chills. Stop. Getting over him the first time hadn't been easy, and he hadn't kissed her then. Kara needed to keep her emotions in check. She wasn't against lusting after someone, but in this case, it was a bad idea. Letting the line blur between reality and fantasy would only court disaster. Even if her lips and body wanted him to kiss and touch her more. She tied the robe's belt too tight and then loosened it. Squaring her shoulders, she opened the bathroom door. Loki meowed. She kneeled to rub behind his ears. He purred as loud as a jet engine on a wide-body plane taking off from SFO. At the window, Brody peeked out the blinds. Rehearsing for a remake of Rear Window, she asked. He glanced over his shoulder. His messy hair and sleep-rumpled clothes were sexy. Too bad he couldn't look adorable, like a puppy or a miniature horse. Only. His ever-present smile was gone. His eyes resembled the night sky. What's wrong, she asked. We've got a problem. His voice sounded strangled as if someone had taken hold of his throat. I'm so sorry. Kara couldn't imagine things getting worse. Pushing aside the bedding on the couch, she's Saturday, that bad, huh? That depends. He stepped away from the window. 
His height and wide shoulders made her living room feel smaller, but then again, he'd always seemed larger than life to her, even when they were kids. Have you been online? Not yet. My phone's on airplane mode so I could listen to music. I went online to see the response to the interview. Threats have been made. Her mouth gaped. Why would someone threaten you? Not me. He sat next to her. You. Her mouth dropped open even more. Why? I'm nobody. You're not nobody. He held her hand, and she fought the urge to lace her fingers with his. People are upset I'm not marrying Caitlin. If Caitlin had been truthful, none of this would be happening. It's probably a teenage fan who doesn't know how to handle her emotions. That's what Caitlin said when I called her a little while ago. Kara hadn't realized they'd spoken. They call our fans the Brates. They are loyal and rabid. Some are young. But I'm not taking the threats lightly, he added. A security team I used last year is arriving later today. Until then, we're not going anywhere. This was stupid. Kara wrapped her arms around her waist. She wanted only to survive this mess with her reputation in one piece, not shattered like broken glass to be crushed into tinier bits. She chewed on the inside of her cheek. I have two days off from the bookstore, but the Bayview house. Can wait. The threats could be serious. Kara trusted him, knew he'd keep her safe if need be, but she hated being in this position. What else did Caitlin say? Brody hesitated. That wasn't a good sign. Tell me. I asked her to reach out to her fans and tell them to stop threatening her twin, but she thought that would send a mixed message. Even if her remaining silent means I could be hurt? Brody nodded. Thanks, sis. Okay, the threats were most likely from overzealous wannabes who worshipped Caitlyn and were all talk. Nothing would happen beyond the internet. But Caitlin's complete disregard and inaction went beyond her normal self-centeredness. Kara hoped her sister had a good reason for not even attempting to rein in her followers. I guess we'll have more time to finish the puzzle. Raising her hand to his mouth, he brushed his lips across her knuckles. That's the right attitude. Maybe, but the tingles she felt wouldn't do at all. She pulled her hand from his, an act of self-preservation for her sanity and her heart, and stood. I'm going to get dressed and see if any new job listings have been posted online. I didn't have time to do that yesterday, though if my interview goes well on Friday. It will. They'd be crazy not to hire you. Having Brody around screwed with her emotions and senses, but he was good for her confidence. She appreciated the boost. I hope you're right. You'll see. And when you get the job, I'll take you out to celebrate. If we're allowed to leave the condo, she joked. But if not, we can order in. We'll figure something out. By the way, Caitlin told me something else. The feedback about her film after the red carpet premiere was worse than the screening. This had the director's recut ending, so the outlook is grim, but she thought the photos of us kissing looked real. Well, we were really kissing. His grin widened, and Kara imagined his lips against hers again. Heat built inside her. If she leaned forward. That's what I told her. He made her sit. She asked if I liked kissing you. Kara's throat clogged. She swallowed. What did you say? That I did, and you were a great kisser. That was nice of you. It's true. She wiggled her toes. Did Caitlin say anything else? Just that we both did a great job acting, especially you. Acting was easy when Kara hadn't needed to pretend. That's quite a compliment coming from my sister. The photos of us are hot. Hot? Scorching. His gaze met hers. Something passed between them. Something strong. The bond of a lifelong friendship, of a shared past, of deep affection. But something more, too. A glimpse of what could be in the future. That possibility filled her with anticipation. You know how to kiss, he said. It's easy when you're kissing someone as experienced as you. His eyes widened. Is that a compliment or a slam? 
What would you like it to be? Her voice sounded flirty, exactly how she felt. A compliment. His breath fanned her skin. Heat rose up her neck. Then that's what it is. He cupped her face with his hand. What am I going to do with you? Sexy images of what they could do together exploded in her brain, but she couldn't suggest those things. Just kissing him again could end up hurting her, so she shrugged instead. He touched the tip of her nose. His playful gesture took some of the edge off. Go. Do what you need to do. With his words, the tension in the air vanished. I'll make breakfast. He'd always liked to cook for her and Caitlin. When she'd lived in LA, that meant cereal, sandwiches, and pasta. Easy and inexpensive dishes. I'm out of instant oatmeal, Kara teased. Oh, ye of little faith. He shooed her away. Loki and I will figure out what to make. As she headed into her bedroom, she tried to remember the last time a man had cooked for her. Tried and failed. Lance, maybe? So long ago. Pathetic. Gritting her teeth, she saw her life passing by as if being fast-forwarded. No wonder she was crushing on Brody again. He was all she had. There was no other guy in her life. No one on the horizon. No one to think about except him. She glanced back. Brody was picking up her cat. Kara's heart bumped. She had to be careful, or she would find herself falling for him, a guy totally out of reach, all over again. Chapter 10 At 8 o'clock that night, a knock sounded at her door. Weird since she hadn't buzzed anyone into the building. Must be Jeff. He'd texted earlier to ask how she was doing, but he probably wanted to see for himself. Brody rose from the couch. I'll get it. He opened the door and then stepped aside. Four men strode into her apartment as if they owned the place. Her pulse skyrocketed. This is the security team I mentioned. Brody acted nonplussed. She hadn't known what to expect in a bodyguard, but a man in a suit with a dark tie and earpiece seemed about right, not four hot guys who looked like they'd stepped out of an action-adventure movie. Silent, rugged men with inked, muscular arms, watchful gazes, and concealed weapons. She'd felt safe with Brody, but these guys could take on an army of baddies and win. Kara hadn't taken the threats made against her that seriously. Not when she knew her sister's fanbase. But things suddenly seemed different. Goosebumps covered her skin. She crossed her arms over her chest. Introductions were made, but the men's hyper-aware, intense gazes made her forget their names as soon as they were mentioned. Her stomach churned. A lump formed in her throat. Tears stung. All she wanted was her quiet, boring life back. It was far from perfect, but it was hers. As talk about the threats and safety protocols ramped up, Kara couldn't take it. I'm going to bed early. Before anyone said goodnight, she left the living room. Loki followed her. Maybe a solid night of sleep would make things better. She didn't think they could get much worse. The next morning, Lex drove her to the Bayview house in a black SUV with dark tinted windows. He had short, beach blonde hair, glacier blue eyes, and a scar on the right side of his face. He hadn't spoken, but she caught him glancing at her in the rearview mirror. She didn't need a Ph.D. to know what he was thinking, what everyone must be thinking, why was Brody Simmons marrying her when he could be with Kate Neal? Kara had made the mistake of going online to read some social media posts. The memes about her were downright cruel. Calling her dog ugly or a genetic mutant wasn't necessary. The comments that accompanied them were worse. She had a feeling no one really cared about her peresy. She just happened to be the current target of online bullies, who took full advantage of the anonymity on the internet. We're almost there. Rizzo, a handsome man with olive skin, dark chocolate eyes, and jet black hair, sat next to her in the back seat. She had a feeling he'd been assigned to her, given he was the only one who'd spoken directly to her since the team arrived. Last night, he'd complimented her on the condo and asked about Loki. Feel okay, this morning? A little tired. Rizzo's smile showed off a row of straight white teeth. 
That's understandable given the circumstances. No kidding. Whether she was awake or dreaming, Brody was on her mind. She kept telling herself everything they were going through would be worth it once they were finished. Caitlin would have no more control. A nap might help, Rizzo suggested. I love naps. Taking an afternoon nap had been one of her favorite things to do if she worked an early shift at the bookstore or had a day off, but with Brody around, she hadn't bothered, much to Loki's dismay. The other two men on the team, Jackson and Kai, had remained at the condo with Brody. They would meet her at the Bayview house for a food tasting after Kara spoke to Hannah about a wedding gown. Lex took the roundabout way to the Bayview house, adding 20 minutes to the drive. He stopped at the curb, left the engine running, and glanced at Rizzo. You're up. Kara went to open her door, but Rizzo touched her arm. Not yet. I have to make sure everything is secure. She knew they were trying to keep her safe, but not being free to get out of the car on her own was strange. Had Brody gotten used to the lack of freedom? Not that she'd have the chance to do the same. This would be over soon enough. Be right back. Rizzo unbuckled his seatbelt, opened his door, and slid out with the grace of an elite athlete. Once the door closed, Kara thought Lex might talk to her now that they were alone, but nope. He scanned from right to left and then left to right. She pulled out her phone. Both her parents had texted. She hadn't seen them much since moving to San Francisco. Her mom and dad were so busy helping Caitlin, who supported them financially, that they didn't have much free time. Visits to see Kara couldn't compete with traveling to luxurious destinations when vacation time rolled around, so she made trips to Los Angeles to visit them during the holidays and when she had three-day weekends. She'd thought about calling them earlier, but Caitlin had promised she'd explain things, so Kara hadn't been in touch. She clicked on her mom's text first. Mom, how dare you steal Brody away from your sister? He's her one true love. You've always been jealous of Caitlin, but I never thought you were capable of such a betrayal. You need to break things off with Brody right now. Raw grief ripped through Kara. Her teeth chattered, not from cold, but disbelief. Caitlin had agreed to talk to their parents. Kara couldn't call with Lex in the front seat, so she texted her mom. Kara, didn't Caitlin talk to you about what's going on? Her cell phone buzzed two minutes later, notifying her of a reply. Mom, yes, and she was hysterical. What you've done has broken her heart. Mine, too. I didn't want to take sides, but I have no choice. I can't believe you'd hurt your sister like this. Until you make this right, I have nothing else to say to you. Kara wiped her face with trembling hands. This couldn't be happening. Clutching the cell phone so she wouldn't drop it, she reread the text. The letters blurred through the tears she was holding back, so she squinted. That didn't change what her mother had written. Until you make this right, I have nothing else to say to you. Confusion, anger, and betrayal threatened to overwhelm Kara. She didn't want to believe Caitlin had failed to follow through on her promise to tell their parents the truth. Or that mom would take Caitlin's side without talking to Kara. With a heavy heart, she returned to the list of messages. Her father's text appeared next. He wouldn't let himself be ruled by emotions the way mom had. Kara tapped his name. Dad, I thought better of you, Kara. What you've done is unforgivable. Your betrayal has hurt your sister immeasurably. Fix it. For Caitlin and your family's sake. Kara inhaled sharply. She stared at the ring on her finger before slumping in the back seat. Why? Why was this happening? She'd always done what others expected of her, been the daughter who compensated for her twins' dramatics by never throwing a tantrum, acting out, or complaining. So what if that meant being shadowed by her sister all the time? Kara hadn't cared. All she'd wanted to do was make her mom and dad proud by doing the right thing. She'd tried. Hard. In her job. With her sister. For them but none of that mattered to her parents. Only Caitlin did. Anger mixed with disappointment, the combination potent. Her throat burned, and a weight pressed against her chest. It felt as if Loki were sleeping on top of her. 
only ten times heavier. Kara blinked, not wanting to cry. She pressed her lips together, so she wouldn't scream. But oh, how she wanted to do both. Badly. With trembling fingers, she typed a text to her sister. Kara, tell mom and dad the truth now. You promised. She hit send, but that didn't stop her hands from shaking. Balling them did no good. She stared at the floorboard, trying to control herself. It wasn't easy. Caitlin's lie had flipped Kara's world upside down by bringing Brody back into her life, putting her at risk to whatever crackpot was threatening her, and turning their parents against her. Of course mom and dad would take Caitlin's side. Kara should have realized they would, even though her heart hoped they wouldn't. After decades of struggling to live from paycheck to paycheck, they no longer had to worry about money thanks to their rich and famous daughter. Kara was still paying off college loans. She gave birthday and Christmas presents, but that hadn't been enough for her parents. She wasn't enough for them. The truth gutted her. Tears welled. Keep it together. Knowing Lex was in the front seat kept Kara from losing it. Straightening, she rubbed away the moisture. She had to survive the meeting and tasting. When she was at the condo, she could take a shower and cry where no one would hear her. That had been her standard MO growing up. She guessed some things never changed. The car door opened. Her cell phone flew out of her hand. Sorry I startled you. Rizzo picked up the phone. They're ready for you inside. She got out of the car, and he handed the phone to her. Thanks. The message from her dad was illuminated on the screen. Had Rizzo read the text? She hoped not. Nothing in his expression had changed, so he most likely hadn't. Rizzo led her inside to where Soraya was waiting. I'll be here if you need anything. Kara nodded, not trusting her voice. At least someone was on her side. Though he was being paid to be. A part of her thought about calling Jeff and Cassie, but there wasn't time with Kara's appointment. We'll take good care of her. Soraya focused on Kara. Ready to talk wedding gowns? She nodded, even though she would rather be in bed under her comforter curled in the fetal position. But for Brody, she would put on her big girl panties, ignore her aching heart, and do this. At this rate, he and Loki might be the only family she had left when the pretend engagement ended. How are you feeling? Soraya asked. The question was not unexpected. Rizzo had asked her the same thing on the drive over. Kara thought she'd looked all right when she left the condo this morning. Maybe not. She forced a smile. Hanging in there under the circumstances. I hope making wedding plans will help you feel better. I'm sure it will. She tried to sound upbeat but wasn't sure if she succeeded. Letting her bad mood affect others wouldn't be good, but she still found herself fighting tears over her parents' texts. Threats from unknown strangers were nothing compared to what her parents had written. Soraya led her upstairs to an open door. This is our dress salon. Have fun with Hannah. Kara entered, hoping she would. She needed something to take her mind off what was happening. The room was warm and welcoming with a soft, feminine decor, the definition of bridal. A floral scent lingered in the air. Potpourri, perhaps? Sachets could be hidden amongst the silk, satin, and tulle arranged more like decoration than fabric bolts. A beautiful woman with flowing black hair greeted her. The staff was always smiling, and Kara wished their happiness was contagious. Hi. I'm Hannah. Yee! It's a pleasure to meet you. Kara forced her attention off the framed squares of white fabric, appliques, and lace on the wall. Sorry I'm late. No worries. I'm happy you made it. Hannah's brown eyes twinkled with anticipation. We know you have a lot going on right now. Nodding, Kara had no idea how anyone in the limelight put up with the public intrusion or the slams on social media. Brody and Caitlin could take stardom. Kara wanted no part of it. Thanks for understanding. We're here to make your life easier, not add complications. Sounds good to me. It's easy to get worked up for wedding planning, and especially for your big day. 
but here at the Bayview House, we take care of everything so the bride can enjoy herself. That's why my friend loved getting married here. She didn't have to think about anything except saying I do in the garden. Hannah rubbed her hands together. That's what we love to hear from our brides. The dress designer's eagerness made Kara feel not only like a liar, which she was, but also unappreciative. This was the one appointment Kara had wanted to skip. Food from a cancelled wedding could be donated to homeless shelters. Flowers could be delivered to nursing homes and hospitals. Gifts could be returned to stores. What would she do with a wedding dress she would never wear? Kara? Hannah asked. Sorry. Kara glanced at Hannah. Lost in my own thoughts. This is happening so fast. Which is what we want, she added. Your head must be spinning with planning a wedding and having a baby. Kara's breath caught. She clenched her teeth. Baby? Caitlin wouldn't have said there was a baby. She couldn't. Except. Kara swallowed. How did you hear about a, um, baby? Your sister's interview this morning. It's all over the internet. No. Please, no. She struggled to breathe. Do you mind if I see for myself? Go ahead. On her phone, Kara pulled up a well-known gossip website. The headline read, Kate Neal's pregnant twin sister forcing Brody Simmons to marry her. A sick, icky sensation crept through Kara's veins. She needed to call Caitlin, protest what was happening, but all she could do was stare at the screen. The article claimed Caitlin's twin sister had trapped Brody by getting pregnant on purpose because she knew he'd do the right thing and marry her, even if that meant leaving Caitlin, the woman he loved. This wasn't a white lie but personality murder. Reputation manslaughter. The room spun as if Kara had stepped onto a merry-go-round. Her mouth watered. Her stomach revolted. Oh, no. I need a bathroom. The SUV jerked to a stop in front of the Bayview house. Heart pounding in his stomach in knots, Brody jumped out of the car and ran toward the entrance. Only one thought was on his mind, Kara. All he knew was she'd been lightheaded. She hadn't passed out, but she'd thrown up. Morning sickness, he'd been told. He wanted to swear and hit something. The lies and the stress had gotten to her. Of course they had. Jackson, the head of the security team, was at his heels. Ex-military, the guy had worked as a consultant on one of Brody's movies and run a pre-filming boot camp for the actors to get in shape. When a restraining order hadn't stopped a stalker last year, Jackson's team had stepped in to keep Brody safe. Rizzo is with Kara, Jackson said. He's a trained medic. The best. If he thought there was any danger to her or the baby, he would have called an ambulance. The baby. Brody rubbed his aching forehead. Why, Caitlin? His jaw clenched. A pretend engagement was one thing, but a fake pregnancy. No way could he allow this to continue. He entered the Bayview house. Lex was waiting for him. This way. Brody went upstairs and into a room. Soraya was there with another woman he didn't recognize. Kara sat next to Rizzo. She stared at the floor, looking deathly pale, more in shock than sick. On a nearby table sat a box of saltine crackers, napkins, and an open bottle of ginger ale. Rizzo stood. Brody sat on the other side of Kara. Hey! Her vulnerability nearly knocked him over. No one was supposed to get hurt, but Kara was in pain. A knife twisted and cut him to the core. She deserved better. What have you done, Caitlin? She'd put him and Kara in this situation, but he'd been the one to ask her to act as his fiancé. Her my world has collapsed expression was because of him. A weight pressed against his chest. He had to help her. Fix things. Leaning closer, he put his arm around Kara and kissed her cheek. I'll take care of this. Now. Kara shook her head. Later. Later. 
He didn't understand. All he had to do was call Caitlin and tell her to stop. She might not, but he could hold a press conference. Tell the truth. Anything would be better than, this. Kara's eyes gleamed as if she might cry. He cradled her close. I'll wait. She nodded. He hadn't seen Kara like this since their senior year of high school, when she found out she hadn't earned one of the full-ride scholarships to her first-choice college, a private university on the East Coast, and realized she would have to attend a much cheaper state school instead. Take Kara home. We'll reschedule once she's feeling better. Soraya's voice was full of kindness and compassion. Tessa Alberto, our chef, has packed up the food from the tasting so you can have it for lunch. Thank you, Brody said. I'm so sorry. Kara sounded quiet, almost weak. She went to stand, but Rizzo stopped her. Move slowly, he cautioned. If you stand too quickly, you might feel lightheaded again. We wouldn't want you to fall. Brody wouldn't let her fall. He would take care of her and this mess he dragged her into. Kara had always been so much stronger than Caitlin. Unfortunately, the fake pregnancy had taken this to another level. One that had nothing to do with saving her reputation or controlling her anxiety. What Caitlin was doing made stereotypical mean girls seem nice. I've got you. Brody stood and then lifted Kara into his arms. She fit perfectly against him. He would use his Maxwell accent. He would do whatever he could to make her feel better. Door-to-door -door service, milady. He thought he heard a sigh. She rested her head against his chest. As the tension seeped out of her body, his tight muscles relaxed. She stared up at him. You don't have to do this. Yes, I do. He brushed his lips across her forehead. An image of a pregnant Kara, her beautiful face glowing and her belly round with their child growing inside her, appeared. Whoa. Where had that come from? I've got your purse. Rizzo placed the strap over his forearm with a serious expression on his face. Not bad, but I prefer a crossbody style. That brought a soft smile to Kara's pretty face. Relief flowed through Brody. He mouthed thanks to Rizzo for getting their minds off a non-existent baby and back to reality. I hate that everyone is fussing over me, Kara said on the way out the door. Let them fuss. Brody carried her to one of the SUVs. I'll spoil you more when we're home. You can't return to the condo. Jackson tucked away his cell phone. Caitlin used Kara's full name in her interview. The building is surrounded by more paparazzi than we can control. Loki is at the condo alone. Panic filled her voice. That's Kara's cat, Brody added. I remember him. Black cat. Lots of fur and attitude, Jackson said. I'll head over there to pack bags for you and get Loki. His carrier is in the coat closet. Kara sounded more like herself. I'm going to need my laptop and something to wear for my interview tomorrow. Her interview. Brody had forgotten about that. Talk about bad timing. You can make a list of what you need. Jackson glanced around. Right now, it's time to get you into the SUV. Less than two minutes later, they were on their way. Wherever that might be. I need to call my boss at the bookstore, Kara said. I'm supposed to go in after my interview. None of the articles mentioned your place of employment, Jackson said from the passenger seat. Lex was still driving. Rizzo had left in the other car with Kai. Well, that's a relief. Her tone matched her words. I doubt Cassie would want a three-ring media circus camped out at the bookstore. Is there anything I can do? Brody asked. No, but thanks. She handed him her phone. Read this message. He read her mom's text in disbelief, and then Kara brought up another from her dad. Brody swore. No wonder she was so sad at the Bayview house. This has to stop. He couldn't call Caitlin, so he typed a text. Kara covered his hand with hers. 
she tilted her head toward the two men in the front seat. Not now. Brody didn't want to upset her, so he put away his phone. Doing that made him feel useless. He didn't mind taking care of the O'Neill sisters, but this was beyond him now. Caitlin wasn't thinking straight. Each time she spoke to the media, she put him and Kara into a worse position. Not even a security team could protect Kara from her sister's lies. Caitlin's actions made him question her motives. The way Kara had from the beginning. He'd been too stupid to listen, but now. Caitlin was no longer acting like a person racked by anxiety and in a panic. This was a carefully orchestrated PR campaign to destroy her twin sister in order to save her reputation and movie opening. It was wrong on so many levels. Brody had a tough time comprehending what she'd done. But he knew one thing. The person being interviewed and spouting these lies was different from the woman who'd worked to make them stars. She was someone unrecognizable to the Caitlin he'd grown up with and loved. Was this desperation? Love for Alec? A cry for help? Something more had to be going on with Caitlin, but what? And what would it mean for Kara? Chapter 11 With tentative steps, Kara entered the apartment on Knob Hill where she and Brody would stay until the media and fan frenzy was under control. The gas fireplace and designer decor gave the space a welcoming feel, but she wanted to go home. She preferred to read about stuff like this in her books, not live it. But her life seemed complete fiction now with her fake fiancé and a make-believe pregnancy. Of course, Caitlin still hadn't replied to the text. Nor had their parents contacted Kara. Which meant her family situation hadn't changed the way she hoped it would. She would have to be patient, even if doing so was killing her. Rizzo flicked on the lights before opening the blinds. Jackson set the box of food from the Bayview house on the dining room table. You'll be eating well. Good, because I'm hungry, Brody said. Kara had no appetite. Her stomach hurt from the stress of their charade and Loki being alone at the condo. She wanted Caitlin to make good on her promise. Kara also wanted her cat safe and sound with her. I should probably mention that Loki gets car sick. We'll skip Lombard Street then. Rizzo's light-hearted tone and casual pose against the wall didn't hide the way his sharp gaze watched the door. Those curves are killer. She appreciated his sense of humor. After she'd thrown up at the Bayview house, he'd handed her a wet rag and told her getting sick without drinking all night wasn't fair. She'd agreed with him even though more than two drinks put her to sleep. Not that she'd been thinking that then. No, she'd been struggling not to fall to the floor and curl into a ball. But Rizzo, someone she'd only met last night, hadn't let her collapse. He'd held her up and led her back to the dress salon. Jackson handed Kara a spiral notebook. Write down anything you'll need for the next few days. The basic stuff we know to pack. You make a habit of packing for people, she asked. Jackson was handsome with rugged good looks and an athletic physique, but his eyes were dark, serious, and, haunted. We do whatever the job requires. Probably better not to ask. She wrote several items, including Loki's scratching post, to the list. That might save the expensive furniture from his claws. After pulling her keys from her purse, she handed them and the list to Jackson. I think that's everything. He scanned her list. Not a problem. I'll call if we can't find something. All my stuff is on top of my bag in the living room, Brody said. Jackson and Rizzo raised their eyebrows. Uh-oh. She forced a smile. I toss and turn. Can't get comfortable. I am nauseous almost 24 hours a day. Poor Brody can't get any sleep. That's right. She keeps me up all night. Brody picked up right where she left off. We're hoping things improve after the first trimester. Sleeping on the couch and celibacy suck. Rizzo and Jackson laughed. Kara managed to keep smiling and not cringe. Then it's a good thing there are two bedrooms here. This place belongs to a friend, Jackson said. Make yourselves at home. Help yourself to whatever's in the kitchen. Lex and Kai are stationed in the apartment across the hall. 
that got her attention. Apartments next to each other? You can never have too many friends. Smiling, Jackson headed to the front door. Be back shortly. Don't worry about your cat, Rizzo said, as if knowing she was concerned about Loki. He'll be fine. With that, he followed Jackson out of the apartment. The door closed behind them, and the lock clicked into place. Kara rubbed her arms, trying to warm up. She'd been chilled all morning even though it wasn't that cold out. How do you get used to this? We're prisoners. It's for our own safety. He touched her shoulder. The warmth of his hand comforted her. Common sense told her to step away, but she didn't listen. Instead, she leaned closer. And Loki's, once he arrives, Brody continued. Funny, but I love that silly black cat. And I. Her breath caught. Was he going to say he loved her, too? Suddenly, this day didn't seem like her worst ever. He'd said he loved Caitlin on many occasions. But he'd never said that about. I owe you, he finished. Kara's shoulders drooped. Her disappointment wasn't a twinge. It was more like an ache, a pain deep within that squeezed her heart. So not what she wanted to hear, especially when he felt he'd owed Caitlin for his career, but Kara half laughed at herself for thinking he would say anything else, feel more than friendship or camaraderie for her. She knew better. He motioned to the table. You should eat. No, thanks. The thought of food made her stomach gurgle. The stress got to me earlier. My tummy still hasn't settled. I don't know why Caitlin said you were pregnant. I asked my publicist to check the trouble in tool script. No characters are pregnant. I appreciate you looking into it, but Caitlin saying I'm pregnant has nothing to do with her movie. His forehead creased. Then why? Ego. Caitlin wasn't that difficult to figure out when Kara stepped back and studied this analytically. My sister didn't want others to think you dumped her. The pregnancy allows her to save face because I trapped you into doing the right thing by marrying me. You were forced to leave her. So under this new scenario of hers, I not only stole my twin's boyfriend, but I also slept with him and got pregnant on purpose. He dragged a hand through his hair. That's. The world revolves around Caitlin. Everyone else plays a supporting role, including me. I've felt that way around your sister. Her world is Caitlin-centric. But I never thought she'd go this far. I don't believe it. And Kara couldn't. She studied Brody to make sure it was him standing next to her. Confusion clouded his gaze. What? You're not defending Caitlin. You're finally willing to admit she's not perfect. No one is perfect, especially not Caitlin. The position your sister has put you in is horrible. I want to believe she has a logical explanation for her actions, because she's been a friend forever, but no matter how I look at this, I can't see any valid reason for what she's said and done. Caitlin was his Achilles heel and had been for years, so what he said stunned Kara. But it also gave her courage to speak out. I'm relieved she's having you do the honorable thing after cheating, but I'm afraid Caitlin's lies will ruin me. Maybe not forever, but near term. It'll blow over. He sounded so certain when Kara's entire life was being held up by a single rusty, bent nail, one that was fatigued and about to break in two. In Hollywood, unplanned pregnancies are no big deal, but that's not my world. She tried to keep her voice steady. Difficult to do when her emotions were spinning out of control. I'm trying to find a job. What am I supposed to do or say now that people think I'm pregnant? I have an interview tomorrow. Pretending to be getting married is one thing, but if they think I'm pregnant and will need maternity leave, that could be a fatal strike against me. I need to find a full-time job with benefits. I haven't had medical insurance for months. You have the ring, and you have me. He didn't hesitate speaking. I'll help you out until you find the job you want. She shook her head. The ring is enough. I don't want to take more of your money. Consider it a loan. You can pay me when you get a job. If I can find one. The two things I had going for me were my work ethic and reputation. Now. 
If you're this upset, why did you stop me from contacting Caitlin in the car? He pulled out his phone. I'll call her. I texted her earlier, but it's too late to have her backtrack now. The one thing Caitlin hadn't stripped away from Kara was her logical thought process. Everyone at the Bayview house assumed I suffered a bout of morning sickness. If I'm suddenly not pregnant, people will ask questions. Ones that might be difficult to answer and lead to more lies. But you're not pregnant. And we're not engaged. Her tone was harsher than she intended. The less we say until this is over, the better. Even if not talking about it to her parents affected her relationship with them. Her chest tightened. Except that bridge had probably been burned. Kara could no longer laugh off feeling like an outsider in her family or at how messed up the dynamics had become. Her sister had been the one to provide drama, but she'd also supplied her mom and dad a luxurious lifestyle they'd once dreamed about. Kara was happy they no longer struggled and worried over money. She would never want them to return to living paycheck to paycheck. But knowing they'd taken Caitlin's side over the supposed breakup without even talking to Kara showed her how far she'd been pushed out. When this ruse was over, she feared nothing would be left to salvage of her relationship with her parents. That their need for financial security had caused them to turn their backs on her. For Caitlin. Whose needs and desires didn't trump Kara's. But no one else in their family seemed to understand that. Or care. I hate doing nothing to stop this. Brody paced between the living area and kitchen. The gossip is going to get worse. Probably already has. Not wanting to think about her family any longer, Kara touched her stomach, not exactly bikini ready. No doubt, memes about her baby bump were being posted on social media. Though maybe the threats would go away now that a baby, albeit a phantom one, was involved. A good thing we've got the A-team watching over us. We'll be fine. She sounded more confident than she felt, but she wanted to appear strong and in control, even if her insides twisted and trembled. Brody seemed worried about her and was acting, off. Not nervous, different. Only one is former Delta so I wouldn't let them hear you call them the A-team, Brody joked. But I get your point. If you think you can make it through this without. Throwing up again? Yeah, he grinned. Though your timing couldn't have been better. Ha! <laughs> ha! I'm sure it wasn't funny at the time. Anxiety had made her sick. Was that overwhelming, out of control, think you're going to die feeling how Caitlin felt? No. Food is the last thing you want, but I'm... Hungry. Kara opened the cardboard box to find a red checkered tablecloth. Not that tasting food for a fake wedding would qualify as a normal occurrence, but it was better than doing nothing. You'll have plenty to eat with what they packed us. Maybe instead of focusing on their upcoming fake wedding, she could think of this as practice for when she planned her real one. That might not happen any time soon, but this way, she'd be ready when the right guy came into her life. Brody spread the tablecloth over the carpet. Best part about an indoor picnic is no bugs. Their long-ago picnics had consisted of eating peanut butter and jelly sandwiches while sitting on old logs or the grass with the scent of sunscreen and the sound of laughter in the hot summer air. You had no problem squishing bugs for Caitlin and me. Doesn't mean I liked doing it. Kara's chest tightened. Affection for this man, her friend, but also so much more, overflowed. She removed two menus printed on brown lunch sacks. Each dish listed had a small box next to it. Each bag contained a pen. This must be what we'll be tasting. We can check off what we like. They'll probably use our selections to come up with an official menu. What if we like everything, he asked. We have to narrow down the list. She handed him a bag. You don't want to pay that much for food no one will be eating. I've got enough money to cover it. The way Brody's smile crinkled the corners of his eyes made her want to skip the reception and plan a honeymoon. She stared at the box of food. You won't if you waste it. He came up behind her. Is that the voice you use when you shush people in the library? Well, people in the rare books collection rarely need to be shushed, but yes, that was my librarian voice. Sexy, he teased. 
I love a woman who takes charge. Many men have a librarian fantasy to see what's underneath the smart girl glasses and conservative clothes. Don't go there. But oh, how a part of her wanted to. Still, she couldn't forget. Caitlin was the only reason he was here. No matter what they'd done since he arrived, Brody hadn't seen her in over a year. They were friends. Just friends. Thinking otherwise would open her up to a world of hurt. Kara focused on the menu. This isn't what I expected they'd serve. I thought there would be deli sandwiches and potato chips, not a crostini station. A picnic theme can be interpreted in different ways. But chicken and seafood wraps, meat pies, Cornish game hens, stuffed avocados, corn on the cob, gourmet hot dogs, salad on a stick, and strawberry shortcake in a jar with fruit-flavored mojitos and a lemonade bar? Fancier than what you had in mind, but Ainsley sent me links to wedding planning articles. Having the right menu is a big deal. That means serving more than turkey sandwiches and bags of chips. Brody didn't sound like himself. Or a man. He also seemed to forget this wedding wasn't happening. No guests would be eating the food. You read the articles? Kara asked. No, but I saw the pictures, and I've attended weddings. He peeked inside the box. The food and alcohol are the best parts. Which told her Brody might be ready to plan a fake wedding but not a real one. Her stomach cartwheeled. We'll need to send her an invitation, he said. Who? Ainsley. Kara's blood pressure spiraled. He made it sound as if they would make an actual guest list and mail invites. In case you've forgotten, there's not going to be a wedding. And while we're on the subject, you'd better not be getting any ideas about baby making either. Not that he would, but she said the words for her sake, too. He laughed, the rich sound as smooth and warm as cheese fondue. What about a pretend baby? Hypothetically speaking. Ignoring Brody, she handed him a decorated cardboard box with their names written in script and overlaid by hearts. Cute, but a total waste of the Bayview House's talent. It's a customized lunchbox. Let's sit on the floor. After putting the lunchbox into the bigger box, he carried everything over to the spot he'd set up. Kara sat next to him and then removed a thermos. Lavender-infused lemonade. I thought we'd get to start with the fruit-flavored mojitos. No way. She touched her belly. I don't want anyone to accuse me of endangering my fake pregnancy by drinking alcohol with my pretend baby daddy fiancé. That could be a lyric from a country western song. He laughed. We've reached the this is outrageous saturation point. I think that happened last night. She poured lemonade into the two mason jar glasses that were inside the box. Each jar contained a sprig of lavender. His thigh pressed against hers. Not even the clothing between them could keep the heat from sizzling on contact. Her blood simmered. Uh-oh. Not good. She needed to focus on the task at hand, wedding, not Brody. He placed his large hand over hers. The gesture gave her a sense of belonging and security. After being on her own for way too long, she relished his company and the feelings. Their engagement might be pretend, but this felt real. And oh so right. She gulped, but she didn't pull her hand away. Kara stared into her glass. This is nice. She didn't mean only the lemonade and picnic lunch. Brody raised his glass. To you. You've been my best friend for as long as I can remember, and I'm sorry it took trying to salvage Caitlin's PR nightmare and now one of our own for us to spend time together. Kara's heart soaked up the words. She wanted to enjoy the warm fuzzies for as long as she could. Not real, but she didn't care. This was more than she'd had in, forever. As long as they didn't kiss, she would be fine. Let's make the most of it. The affection in his gaze matched her growing feelings for him. She tapped her jar against his. Cheers. Chapter 12 You need to try a pie pop. Brody wasn't sure which he enjoyed better, the pie pops or seeing Kara's smile return. Nah, her smile one hands down. You love apple pie. You'll love this. She laughed, 
a sound he hadn't expected to hear today but no complaints. Especially if her laughter continued. They must be good. She eyed one with feigned suspicion, making him think she was a better actress than she let on. You've eaten five of them. The twinkle in her eyes made not staring difficult. He handed her one. Please. Kara took a bite. Okay, you're right. This is delicious. These are a must-have. He put a check mark on the bag. Planning a wedding is fun. That's because food is involved. And you're here, too. Despite what was happening on the internet and outside her condo, hanging out with Kara was nice. He would bet if they weren't under so much stress, things would be even more fun. I forgot what being around people not in the business is like. I've been missing out. Well, you know where I am. Or will be, once I'm back in the condo. I'm not waiting a year or more to visit. Although next time, I'll bring an inflatable mattress. You can have my bed. There's room enough for us both. He kept his tone light. Remember how we used to sleep next to each other in the treehouse? She laughed. That floor was so hard. Way more uncomfortable than the couch. We were young enough not to care. We cared about some things. She grinned. I'll never forget the time the flashlight went out. And it rained. Oh, man. He'd forgotten about that. We were soaked and stuck in the dark. It was so miserable. Best. Night. Ever. Second best, she countered. After the Academy Awards. That surprised him. Really? I thought telling scary stories and staying up all night because we were too afraid to close our eyes was better. She stared off into the distance, and he wondered if she was thinking about when they were kids. They hadn't been addicted to cell phones then. Instead, they ran around, played, and talked to each other in person. You may be right, she said finally. Such good times. He could rattle off more that he'd forgotten about over the years. Why'd we stop? We grew up. You and Caitlin moved to L.A. to become actors. I enrolled at San Jose State. Then you joined us in L.A. Until I moved to San Francisco, she reminded him. Time had flown by. A part of him wished he could turn back the clock. Hard to believe it's been almost ten years since we received our high school diplomas. Doesn't seem that long ago, she agreed. That's what happens with close friends. Her nod pleased him. They were close friends, but something was drawing them together in a not-just-friends way. Maybe this energy, this tension, had always been there, but Brody hadn't wanted to feel it. He did now. He couldn't get enough. Brody scooted closer, nervous as a boy asking a girl out for the first time. I had an ulterior motive for giving you that pie pop. She didn't move away but leaned forward slightly. What was that? There was only one apple. It's your favorite, so I thought maybe I could get a taste. Should have told me before I ate all of it. He leaned closer. There's another way for me to get a taste. Her lips parted slightly. You think? I know. Brody leaned in to kiss her. She met him halfway. Her lips pressed against his before he could make his move. He didn't mind. Her taking the initiative was a turn-on. And her kiss. She tasted like apples, sweet and warm with a bit of tartness. Just right. Wrapping his arm around Kara, he pulled her onto his lap. Her fingers sifted through his hair while her lips moved across his and heated his blood. He couldn't get enough of her kiss. Or her. A knock sounded on the door. He reluctantly pulled away. The lock clicked. A growl sounded, one that three floors of residence likely heard. Loki, they said at the same time and then laughed. Brody tucked a strand of hair behind her ear. We'll have to finish this later. When we're alone. He couldn't wait. And based on the anticipation in Kara's eyes, neither could she. 
With Jackson and Rizzo in the apartment, kissing was put on hold. Kara should be relieved, not frustrated. But she wanted to see what happened next with Brody. Unfortunately, he was more interested in talking with the two bodyguards. One tale about movie making or being in the military led to another. This could go on all evening. Kara rose from the couch. I'm going to read. Escaping into a story would keep her mind off Brody. She lay in bed with Loki at her side and a book in her hands. After turning the page, Kara flipped back. She hadn't comprehended a single paragraph she'd read. The reason? Brody. She didn't know where their unexpected connection was coming from. Boredom? Desperation? Being stuck together? Kara wasn't sure she wanted to know the answer. She rubbed Loki. I'd better shut off my brain and sleep, or I'll be a zombie at the interview and later at work. The cat didn't respond, only stretched out on the pillow next to hers. She laughed. You're such a creature of habit, but then, so am I. That's why we get along so well. She and Brody, however, were different, not complete opposites, but close. Still, they got along and when they kissed. Thinking about being in his arms with her lips against his brought a big smile to her face. Yes, the man could kiss. Maybe she'd dream about him and more kisses. She'd like that. Kara set her alarm, crawled between the sheets, and rubbed Loki under his neck. Tomorrow's a big day. I need to nail the interview. And get the job. The university was one of the top in the country with an amazing library system. Their rare books collection was first-rate, and she wouldn't have to move. San Francisco had been her home for the past three years, and even though she had no family nearby, where else would she go? Los Angeles. Her heart rate stuttered. Kara glanced at the diamond on her finger. The urge to remove the ring was strong, but the security team was observant enough they'd notice. Maybe whoever's interviewing me won't notice the ring and doesn't care about Hollywood gossip. Oh, please let that be the case. Crossing her fingers, she rolled onto her side to face Loki. But no matter what happens, I've got you. And she had Brody. For now. Friday morning, Brody sat at the table with a cup of coffee. He'd heard Kara in her bedroom earlier. He hoped she'd slept better than he had. Good morning, she said, walking into the living room. He did a double take. Kara looked sophisticated and sexy in her gray suit and coordinating pumps. He wanted her to wow the hiring team at the library. He grinned. You're getting this job. I hope so because it would be a dream position. The time has come for your dreams to come true. If anyone deserved that to happen, it was her. Her phone rang. Hello, this is Kara O'Neill. Good morning, Ms. Windicott. Yes, I was just getting ready to leave. Oh. Kara's shoulders sagged. With a dejected expression on her face, she plopped onto the couch. Bad news? He hoped not, but he rose from the table and walked toward her. No, I understand. Thank you for calling and saving me the trip there. As she touched the phone screen, she leaned against the cushions. Her face scrunched. My interview was cancelled. He was at her side in an instant. Why? Tears gleamed. She said they filled the position, but I heard of two others who are scheduled for second interviews next week. I have a feeling the job is available, but they no longer want me. I can't say I blame them. Who wants to hire a pregnant woman who stole her twin sister's boyfriend? With a hitch to her breath, she rubbed her wet eyes. Kara's reaction and sadness stabbed his heart. This was her dream job, and her sister had destroyed Kara's chance of interviewing for it. They might have filled the position. Maybe. Her tone suggested it was unlikely. Her eyes dimmed. I have the sinking feeling other libraries will feel the same way about me. Once the engagement is over. I don't think that will matter. The truth coming out will just show people I'm dishonest. 
I didn't really think through what pretending might mean long term for me. But she had now. Brody could tell based on the way the light in her eyes went from dim to off. The slight tremble of her chin belied her blank expression. She was struggling to hold herself together. He wished she'd let her emotions show, cry, shout, scream. Standing, she wiped her palms against her skirt. I'd better change and then call Cassie to see what time she wants me to come in today. Brody hated hearing the disappointment and resignation in Kara's voice. Nothing he did or said would fix it. Kara. I knew there would be consequences, but I never expected Caitlin to go this far. Straightening, Kara squared her shoulders. I've managed since being laid off. I'll survive this. You deserve better than that. So do you. Her gaze softened, and the tenderness in her expression left him breathless. You deserve a lot better from Caitlin, too. Yes, but his only concern was Kara. Seeing her so hurt gutted him. His only hope was everything would be back to normal soon. It had to be. Or he would end this. No matter what the consequences to him and Caitlin. Entering Cassandra's attic on Friday morning was almost cathartic. Kara felt as if she'd gotten back a piece of herself, her life. Rizzo and Kai had agreed to her request to keep their distance and not shadow her every movement. Right now, they were stationed inside the front door, watching everyone who entered. She appreciated that and having some space of her own. This was where she belonged, surrounded by books and her co-workers, who greeted her with hugs. Mo, a tall, thin guy with cropped black hair and a multicolored mohawk down the center, hugged her. He leaned close to her. The boss said we're not supposed to ask questions, but when you're ready to talk about this, he whispered, I'm buying because I want to know everything. Typical Mo. She laughed. Maybe this charade was getting easier to handle. We're on. Renee, the bookstore's barista who was a bubbly redhead, ran down the stairs from the attic portion of the store. She hugged Kara. When you take a break, come up and see me. I will. After Kara placed her coat and purse into her locker, she went behind the counter and logged into the computer. A sense of contentment, something foreign to her over the past few days, flowed through her. The university library might not want her, but she had a job here, one where she excelled and had friends who cared about her. That counted for a lot. Ponytail bobbing, Cassie hurried toward her. Today, her boss had traded a long skirt for a pair of jeans and a sweater topped off with a colorful scarf. How are you holding up? I've been better. Kara reached into the inbox for the customer request forms. Only two were there. Weird. Not many requests. Were the past two days slow? Not really. Cassie's forehead creased. We had a couple of cancellations. That was strange. Until the truth slammed into Kara. Her shoulders drooped. It's because of me. No one mentioned you. The timing was too coincidental. I'd heard this place wasn't mentioned online, but I'm listed on the staff website, aren't I? Cassie nodded. Kara forced herself to stand tall and not hunch. I'm so sorry. It's not your fault. Except it was. She'd agreed to pretend with Brody. Granted, she had no idea her sister would become a sociopathic liar, but Kara had only herself to blame. A landslide of rocks filled her stomach, weighing her down with regret for agreeing to this charade. Let me fill these two requests and then I'll go before the paparazzi show up. I don't want my presence to hurt business. Cassie shook her head. It hasn't. Yet was implied but left unspoken. The rocks in Kara's stomach shifted. She nearly doubled over. It's not a chance I'm willing to take. I don't want to lose you. Cassie's voice cracked. Her eyes gleamed. You're a big reason profits are up this quarter and last. That still didn't change what Kara needed to do. She wouldn't allow the bookstore to suffer because of her. Maybe after things settle down, if you want me back. I do, Cassie didn't hesitate to reply. 
I just hate seeing you hurting. Kara thought she was better at hiding her emotions. She touched her boss's arm. I'll be okay. Honest. It might take time, but Kara wouldn't give up hope that she could salvage her career and reputation once the pretending and gossip stopped. She couldn't. No matter what Caitlin pulled next. If you need anything. Find yourself in a jam. Whatever. Call. The words shot from Cassie's mouth. Troy knows many people. Jeff, too. And there's always Brett Matthews in Portland. He'd help his favorite book concierge in a heartbeat. Not wanting to cry or she might fall apart completely, Kara blinked and then nodded. I'll find you when I'm finished here. She grabbed the first request and set to work. A half hour later, the orders were filled. Kara cleaned up the concierge desk. She hated to leave, but she kept telling herself this was for the best. Maybe not for her, but for Cassandra's attic. She comforted herself by thinking about spending the rest of the day with Brody and Loki. Sure, they would be trapped in the apartment, but they would make her feel better. Excuse me? A pretty young woman came up to the counter. She was dressed nicely in a down vest, sweater, jeans, and boots, and held a cup containing a pink smoothie. Most likely one of the strawberry blends from upstairs. Renee was making a name for herself with her smoothie recipes. Are you the book concierge? Yes, I'm Kara. Helping one last customer would be the perfect end to her shift and make her feel as if she'd contributed today. What can I help you find? Your conscience. In one smooth move, the woman flipped the lid off the cup and tossed the smoothie on Kara. Your vial. I hope you and your baby die and rot in hell for what you've done to your poor sister. Brody will never love you. He might marry you, but Caitlin is the love of his life. Pink liquid dripped down Kara's face. It covered not only her but also the computer and some of the counter. Two blurs flashed in front of her. By the time she could wipe her eyes, Rizzo and Kai had subdued the woman. As they dragged her away from the counter, Cassie held a phone to her ear while Mo raced over with paper towels. The sweet scent of the smoothie sent Kara's stomach roiling. Each breath seemed to draw in less oxygen. Her vision blurred. Grabbing hold of the counter covered her fingers in smoothie, but she needed to hold on to something or she'd fall over. Dizzy. She couldn't stand up straight. She squeezed her eyes shut, but that only made her more aware of the liquid in her hair and on her. We'll get you cleaned up. Mo wiped her off. Cassie's calling the police. I didn't want to cause trouble. Kara's voice sounded hoarse, unnatural, a way she'd never heard it. Your bodyguards have everything under control. Mo glanced over his shoulder. Except they're berating each other for not stopping it. They couldn't have known. The words rushed out. She looked so, normal. So does your sister. Mo's expression hardened. I would have never expected her to act like such a stark raving mad lunatic. I love you. Kara used one of the paper towels to clean her face. I know. He grinned. The feeling's mutual, but don't tell your fiancé. He could beat me up with his pinky. She drew away. Brody wouldn't. Probably not, Mo admitted. But if you were my girl, I would. Cassie hurried over. The police are on their way. Everyone in the bookstore stared at them. Well, her. Their expressions ranged from pity to contempt. Kara forced herself to breathe. I was hoping to get out of here before anything happened. The computer. Is covered by insurance, Cassie interrupted. Compassion filled her blue eyes. Don't worry about anything. Stress isn't good for the baby. Tears exploded. Kara couldn't stop them. She turned away, not wanting anyone to see her like this. A moment later, Rizzo had her in his arms. The police can get her statement later. I'm getting her out of here. She didn't know where he was taking her, but she didn't care. As long as Brody would be there. If anyone could make this better, he could. Chapter 13 
As soon as Brody heard the shower shut off in Kara's bathroom, he went into the kitchen to get the cup of tea steeping on the counter. A good thing this was herbal, or it would be too strong. She'd taken a longer shower than he expected. Though he didn't blame her after being covered in smoothie. He tossed the tea bag into the garbage can under the sink. Thinking about the devastated expression on Kara's face made him shudder. He hadn't spoken to her other than an, I'm sorry, and a, what can I do? He'd wanted to, except she'd bolted into her bedroom and locked the door. A justified reaction. But he wanted to help her. Not stare at a closed door and do nothing. That was where the tea came in. Or so he hoped. Jackson had pushed Kai, Rizzo, and Lex out of the apartment with a grim expression that would have terrified most men. The team leader wasn't happy about what had happened, and his men would pay the price for letting a crazy woman get that close to Kara on their watch. Rightly so. That was why Brody had hired them. They should have been standing closer to Kara, not giving her the space she'd requested. Stupid. Okay, he got that they were trying to help and make a bad situation better for her. A smoothie wasn't a knife or a gun, but Kara should have never been attacked that way. A video taken at the bookstore with the horrible words being spouted was making the rounds on social media. The woman, the self-proclaimed biggest fan and leader of Brates Worldwide, had been taken away by the police, but nothing could undo the damage that had been done to Kara. He checked his phone again. No message from Caitlin, who hadn't condemned what had happened in the bookstore. Nor had she supported it. But the neutrality portrayed was unforgivable. Hitting the call button, he tried Caitlin again. It rang straight to voicemail as it had the other times he'd tried to reach her. Call me. This had to be the tenth message he'd left. He sent a text to Ainsley telling her to keep calling until Caitlin answered. Then he picked up the tea and returned to Kara's bedroom. His knock went unanswered. That didn't surprise him. He tried again. Nothing. If she thought he would give up, she was mistaken. Let me in, Kara. Continued silence greeted him. Please. A minute passed. Maybe two. At this rate, the tea would be lukewarm. The door opened slightly, but he couldn't see her, only the sleeve of the thick, white robe identical to the one hanging in his bathroom. She cleared her throat. I need time alone. The rawness of her voice knifed his heart. He wanted to help her, even if he wasn't sure how. I made you tea. Saying that had sounded better in his head. Now, he felt stupid. He forced himself not to slip into the Maxwell voice she loved so much. Brody wanted to distance himself from the industry that was wreaking havoc in her life. It's chamomile. Your favorite. She peered through the crack. Thanks. Her red, swollen eyes punched him in the gut. Every muscle tensed. His heart hurt. He didn't want to push, but no way could he let her handle this alone. Step back. She did. Entering her room, he curbed every instinct shouting at him to sweep her up into his arms and hold her until the pain disappeared but he couldn't with the cup of tea in his hand. Brody placed it on the nightstand before facing her. His gaze met Kara's. Her breath hitched. The quick intake of air brought a flash of memories. The night he'd called to ask if she thought Caitlin would go to a dance with him. When Kara had told him her long-distance boyfriend had broken up with her. After saying she had taken a new job in San Francisco. Each time, the quick intake of air had been the only outward sign of anything being wrong. Today, however, she couldn't hide from him. She was having a difficult time controlling her emotions. That had to have been what that little hitch was. An outward sign of her shutting herself down. No more. Kara had been there for him more times than he could count, after breakups, before auditions, when he felt down. She deserved the same support she'd always given him. Something he should have been doing years ago. Arms open, he walked toward her. Come here. Kara hesitated, 
but then in a flash, she threw herself against him, trembling. He wrapped his arms around her. Let go. I'm here. I can't. Her voice broke. She stared at the carpet. You can. Opening her mouth as if to speak, she closed it before shaking her head. You don't always have to hold everything back. Be the strong one. He picked her up the way he had at the Bayview house, carried her to the bed, and sat with her on his lap. You're not alone. I'm here, Kara. I'm not going anywhere. He kept his arms tightly around her. Holding her felt natural. She fit against him as if she'd been made for this. For him. Her body remained tight, her muscles bunched, and her limbs stiff. You've been there for me more times than I can count. He pulled her closer against his chest. Let me do the same for you. She sniffled once. Twice. As if a spillway had burst open, she did as he told her. Sobs racked her shoulders. Her body. Nothing Brody said would make a difference. It wasn't going to get better today. Most likely not tomorrow, either. But eventually it would. That, however, wouldn't help her right now. Rubbing circles on her back, he brushed his lips through her damp hair. A sense of purpose, of rightness, drove his actions. He couldn't have stopped if he wanted to. Taking care of Kara was second nature. He'd found his calling. He'd found, a better part of himself. Falling tears dampened his shirt. Each cry, some muffled, others louder, seemed to loosen the tension in her body until she rested limply against him. Brody had no idea how long they'd been sitting there. Nor did he care. Seeing her so upset tore him apart, but he was thankful she'd finally stopped holding in her emotions. That wasn't healthy. But opening up and expressing her feelings made him want to know more about the woman she was today, not the one who'd been his friend growing up. As her breathing calmed, he didn't let go of her. Both for her sake and for his. He wanted to comfort Kara, but he also couldn't deny how much he enjoyed having her on his lap and in his arms. She was so incredible. He'd known that for years, but now he saw her in a new light, a way he hadn't before. Spending this week with her showed him how strong she really was. Her kiss had sparked his curiosity, but her actions had shown him her strength and compassion. Thank you, she mumbled, keeping her face down. I don't really want to be alone. I don't want you to be alone, either. Like the slap of a director's clabbered cutting through the noise on a set, a sharp realization pierced his heart. What he was feeling went beyond friendship. He was falling for Kara. Despite the pretending, the gossip, and the threats, something had changed between them. The kiss had been his first clue. His overwhelming need to protect her his second. Wanting to keep her with him once their engagement ended was his third. But what did that mean? Would she even want something with him? His heart pounded. He wasn't ready to ask the question. Or know the answer. But they would have to wait. She'd been through a traumatic experience today and needed time. He could be patient if he tried. For Kara, he could do anything. And would. To help her. To support her. To show her that maybe the line between make-believe and reality wasn't that far apart. But only when she was ready. He just had no idea when that would be. The next day, Kara couldn't believe she'd cried her heart out in front of Brody. She'd never cried in front of Caitlin or her parents. But letting go for once had helped. Oh, the tears hadn't changed what Kara had been through at the bookstore, at the wedding venue, or with her family, but not having to hold herself back and her emotions and had freed her, opened her up, in a way she'd never imagined. And she had Brody to thank for that. Being in his arms had felt oh so right. She wished she were there now, but he hadn't touched her since yesterday. She'd caught him glancing her way. Staring sometimes, too. But she had no idea what that meant because he also seemed to be distancing himself at the same time. Why? 
the weekend passed slowly. Surprisingly, Caitlin's film exceeded box office expectations, much to the shock of film critics who had panned the movie. At least one thing had worked out as planned, but Kara felt no relief. Especially when her sister wouldn't return any texts or calls. On Monday, Kara sat at the dining room table in their jail cell. Okay, apartment, but being stuck inside made the place feel like a prison. Except their guards delivered tasty takeout and whatever else they requested. Yesterday afternoon, they dropped off the slushies that Brody requested. Stuck inside, Kara had been applying for jobs. She had no idea if any library, private or public, would hire her, but she had to do something. She submitted her fourth employment application for the day before closing her laptop. Stretching her arms overhead, she glanced outside. The sun was shining on this lovely spring day, but she could only enjoy the pleasant weather from inside. Cabin fever was getting the best of her. Maybe if the weather turned gray and cold, not unusual for San Francisco, she could handle it better, but Mother Nature was conspiring against them. Truth was, being stuck in the apartment wasn't the only issue. No amount of filling out online employment applications, reading, watching movies, doing puzzles, or playing board games could take her mind off Brody. He was always nearby. Her only break came when she went into her bedroom or he into his. He hadn't kissed her again as he said he would. She understood why he hadn't after the smoothie incident, but that had been three days ago. Maybe she should kiss him and see what he did. Did she dare? The alternative of not doing anything didn't appeal to her. What did she have to lose? Don't answer that. She stood and stepped away from the table. Brody placed his game controller on the coffee table. Finished? Yes. As she walked toward him, she noticed Loki lying next to him. For more applications are on their way. To four more jobs she didn't want, but she couldn't be picky. Each day brought either a rejection or no response to her applications. Not unusual when searching for a new position, especially when submitting on a weekend, but not being asked for an interview stung. One interview request was all she wanted. Something to give her hope that a librarian position was on the horizon, even if Cassie had assured Kara her position at the bookstore was safe. Halfway to the couch, she froze. What if Brody didn't want another kiss? That would be a huge rejection. Kara crossed her arms over her chest. Maybe she should wait to kiss him. He wiped his hands on his jeans. Still planning to stay in the Bay Area? I thought I would, but now, Kara didn't think she'd feel comfortable living in Caitlin's condo after this was over, but where would she and Loki go? Thinking of her limited options made her head spin. Stop. Kara needed to focus on what was happening now. She hadn't been to the condo or anywhere else except for a quick trip to the Bayview house on Sunday morning to be measured for a wedding gown and a brief discussion of styles. White not strapless. Vintage or something used was perfectly fine. She hoped that criteria wouldn't make Hannah's job too difficult. The dress designer was planning to hit thrift shops and consignment stores to search for something old she could upcycle into something new. Except Kara tried not to think about the wedding gown. Or the flower arrangements that Jessica Riley, the florist, wanted to create. Or the talented harpist hired to play at the ceremony. Brody watching her made Kara self-conscious. She bounced from foot to foot. What? she asked. You might find better job opportunities if you moved somewhere else. Los Angeles? Anticipation surged. Did he want her to move closer? Kara's pulse shot into the stratosphere. Her family issues would need to be addressed. Unless Brody was talking in more general terms like applying to another state and not the city where he lived. She waited for him to say more and clarify what he meant. He didn't. Kara chewed on the inside of her cheek. She was getting used to being disappointed. That realization almost made her laugh. I'll think about it. That would be better than thinking about him. Brody's phone played a catchy dance tune. Tapping the screen, he placed the phone at his ear. Hey, Eins. What's up? His assistant called once or twice a day to check in with him. 
Kara realized she was standing in the same spot. Her courage to kiss him had evaporated. One more rejection, especially from Brody, might push her over the edge. She sat in the chair across from him. When? His tone was stressed and matched his expression. The smile on his face disappeared, replaced by a tight mouth. This wasn't good. Only one person affected Brody this way, Caitlin. Kara bit her lip. I'll be there. Brody's jaw jutted forward in a mannerism she knew well. He'd been the high school's starting quarterback in the fall, star of the annual drama production in the winter, and dominant baseball pitcher in the spring. Once he got that look, watch out. Brody's determination outweighed any odds, superior athletic ability, or acting talent. I'll have to figure out the logistics. But no media. Got it? Kara wondered what he was talking about. No credible threats against her had been verified, but Jackson's team was the definition of cautious. She couldn't imagine them allowing Brody to go anywhere. Unless he planned to sneak out. Which would be bad. And possibly dangerous. If he wanted to do that, she would stop him. No matter if he was taller and weighed more. Not knowing what was going on made her nervous. Tapping her toe, she waited for him to disconnect from the call. What, she asked when he had. There's this kid. A big fan. He's 12 and at the children's hospital. I need to visit him. Not Caitlin. But Kara felt no relief. Okay, when? Tomorrow. He glanced at the front door. His name is Slater. He's sick. This can't wait. I have to go. The compassion in Brody's voice warmed Kara's heart. She held his hand. Of course you do. Brody dragged his other hand through his hair. The entire Vesper crew has been requested. Vesper was the name of the spaceship in his and Caitlin's movie franchise. Did someone ask Caitlin? Ainsley called her first since she's so hard to reach, but Caitlin said no given the circumstances with you and me. Added the excuse that since her movie didn't tank opening weekend she was too busy giving interviews to come to San Francisco for a few hours. No matter what the reason. Kara shook her head. She still hadn't spoken to her sister. That was due to Caitlin not calling or answering her phone. None of that should matter when a sick kid is involved. It does to Caitlin. Brody sighed. But I have bigger issues. I don't have a costume to wear or stuff to give Slater. We don't have much time. We'll figure something out. You can find anything you need in San Francisco. If not today, then tomorrow on the way to the hospital. Trust me. I do trust you. Kara's heart full on melted. Had he said that to her before? She didn't think so. Except Jackson is going to say no, Brody added. Probably, but he'll just have to come up with a way to make this work. The hospital visit was too important to Brody. The serious expression on his face told her that. Fighting the urge to lean against him, she squeezed his hand. I'm not Ainsley, but I know the city. What do you need so you can pull this off? Chapter 14 at the children's hospital on Tuesday, anticipation battled with frustration inside Brody. He followed an administrator down a hallway with brightly colored walls covered with whimsical images. He kept a smile on his face, even though he wanted to fire Jackson for not being more supportive of this visit. I get your concern. Brody kept his voice low and his posture relaxed. I understand what might happen. Will happen. Jackson punctuated each word. Brody kept walking. Nothing would stop him. He'd been ignoring how the rented boots pinched his feet. He could do the same with Jackson. Especially with Kara at his side. Jackson had told her to remain at the apartment, but she'd wanted to come to the hospital. Brody had forced the issue. With four bodyguards surrounding them, the hospital security staff nearby, and San Francisco's finest on alert, the necessary precautions had been taken. Plus, Caitlin had no idea what hospital in the Bay Area they'd be visiting so no one could alert the media. 
Kara's green wig bounced with each step. The pink, shimmery makeup on her face, made famous by her twin sister, sparkled due to the overhead lights. She was gorgeous, and he had a hard time not staring. Okay, appreciating with a touch of leering thrown in, but he couldn't help himself. She looked that good. Though she always did. But the tight costume showed off her luscious curves. Seeing her put her own mark on the character made him realize the appeal of cosplay for the first time. He wouldn't mind acting out scenes from the movies when they finished. If only they could. He'd been trying to keep his distance since she'd cried in his arms on Friday. Pushing his attraction and himself into her life would only complicate an already messy situation. There would be time for that and more, later. But it wasn't easy. Having her with him, however, was. The bond from their childhood, the one he'd left untended and ignored these past three years, had never been as strong and solid as it was now. For that, he would be ever grateful, despite the other stuff they'd been through over the past week. But whatever else got in their way or went wrong, he wasn't worried. They would work together to come up with a solution. The way they had to prepare for today's visit. No drama or hissy fits. Like the ones Caitlin threw in private when she wasn't pretending to be the betrayed and heartbroken ex-girlfriend in front of the press. Staring at Kara, a buzz of awareness flowed through him. That costume really did make the most of her, um, figure. Ready for this? Yes. She patted her bag. I'm so excited to be here. Good. The happiness radiating off her pleased him. We're free from our jail. Yes, but this is about helping a kid feel better. Nothing else. The sincerity in her tone removed the tension from his shoulders. He didn't know what Kara carried in her large fabric tote bag, but she, like Jackson, was prepared for anything. She'd been sending Rizzo, Lex, and Kai on errands to get everything they needed. Brody appreciated her help, but he was most grateful she'd agreed to dress up and come with him as a character and for moral support. Everything will turn out okay. He said that to everyone, though the words were mainly for her. Jackson scoffed. You've been out of sight while Caitlin gives multiple daily interviews about being brokenhearted as you and Kara make wedding plans. After which, Caitlin is telling people to go see her new movie to make her feel better. Now you're in a public place with zero control over who might see you. If threats hadn't been made, we'd be out in public like Caitlin. Brody countered. But they were made and continue to be posted online. Not to mention the smoothie incident that should have never happened under our watch. Jackson's nostrils flared. This publicity stunt of yours will make things worse. Brody balled his hands. This isn't a stunt. We're visiting a sick kid who wants to meet the characters from his favorite movie. No one, not you, Caitlin, or the press, will stop me from doing this. A muscle pulsed in Jackson's jaw. If something goes wrong, I trust you and your team to take care of Kara, Brody added. Jackson nodded once, but the tension in the air remained, as thick as the fog that rolled off the bay and coated the city. Two nurses in scrubs passed them at a brisk pace. A smiling orderly pushed a kid in a wheelchair. A noise sounded from a speaker somewhere. Okay, guys. Smile. No egos need to be involved. This is for Slater. Kara's cheery voice sounded like a librarian about to read to children during story time, but the green wig and pink painted face looked sexy on her. She focused her attention on him. Ready? He adjusted the holster that held a beat up laser gun. He imagined his alter ego, L, aka Elian, a space cowboy the defender of the downtrodden, and the leader of a ragtag fugitive group. Let's do this. This is going to cost you extra. Lex wore an eye patch, black leather pants, and a red jacket. He was playing Femus, a hard-living assassin and rogue. His real tattoos worked perfectly for the part. Just saying, dot. That made Brody laugh. Before you go into Slater's room, you'll need face masks and gloves. 
The hospital administrator, a woman named Susan, passed them out. He tires easily, but even a few minutes visiting with you will be a dream come true for him. Brody wanted more than a few minutes. He put on his face mask, and then he pulled on the gloves. It's showtime. With an exaggerated swagger, he entered the room. A worried-looking woman with messy blonde hair leaned against the far wall by the window. A doctor in a white lab coat stood next to the bed where a boy lay connected to machines that beeped and buzzed. Whipping out his laser gun, Brody scanned the room. I hear there's a smuggler named Slater hiding in here. Big bounty on his head. Anybody see him? Eyes wide and mouth gaping, the thin boy in the bed sat upright. Elian. The awe in the kid's voice tugged on Brody's heart. He took a step toward the bed. Yeah, I'm L. He waved his laser gun. Who wants to know? The boy raised his chin. I'm Slater. Lyra. Femus, Brody called. We found him. As the two came closer to the bed, a smile spread across Slater's pale face. You're here. You're really here. Brody glanced around. No one can know. You're not the only one with a bounty on your head. I won't tell a soul. Promise. Slater stared at Kara with total hero worship. Lyra. Hello, Slater, she said, her tone full of affection. So happy we found you. The boy sighed. Me, too. Remember, she's mine. Brody winked. I know. Slater pointed to Femus. If she wasn't, she'd be his. Kara placed her hands on her hips. Don't I have a say in this? No, Slater, Brody, and Lex said at the same time. That brought a round of laughs and more play acting, followed by a hundred questions from Slater about the final movie coming out at the end of the year, and a special viewing of the brand new trailer that hadn't been released yet. Brody sat on the edge of Slater's bed to watch it. You must be super special because I haven't even seen this. The clip was only a minute and 23 seconds long, but Slater's smile grew bigger. His eyes, too. Wow. He stared at the tablet where the trailer had played. That was the most amazing thing ever. Could I please watch it again? Of course. Brody hit replay. He ended up pressing the button 21 more times, but he didn't mind. Kara and Lex didn't seem to care, either. Soon, they were reciting lines. Kara even sang Lyra's song, a little off-key, but Slater clapped enthusiastically. You're full of surprises, Brody said to her. She shrugged, but the pleased gleam in her gaze told him she was happy. Slater yawned. He leaned against his pillow, but his smile didn't waver. The visit needed to end, but Brody knew coming today was the right decision no matter what happened when they left the hospital. We have a few things for you before we go. Lex and Kara handed out movie memorabilia to Slater. Each item, from buttons to a jacket like the one Elian wore, brought a bigger wow. Brody could almost see the exclamation points each time Slater said the word. There's one last thing we have for you. Kara removed a script from the tote bag. This is from the first movie. It's signed by the entire cast. Brody's heart slammed against his chest. That was Kara's copy, a present from Caitlin, and worth, well, more than anything else they'd given Slater. But the autographs and being able to read the dialogue were what mattered. Slater clutched the screenplay to his chest as if it were the most valuable treasure in the world. Thank you. You're welcome, Kara said. Now you can read along with the movie. Though I'm guessing you have the lines memorized. The boy perked up. Almost all. Brody's affection for Kara deepened. He'd forgotten about a script, but she hadn't. She was always looking out for others, never herself. So special, smart, and caring. When they were back to their normal lives, he was asking her out on a date. Something romantic and special they would always remember. Slater yawned again. 
His eyelids fluttered as if they wanted to close. Time to go. Brody gave him a gentle hug. Thanks for letting us hang out with you. Kara hugged him, too, and then kissed Slater's cheek even though she had on a mask. Take care of yourself. And watch out for bounty hunters. Lex followed his goodbye with a high five and then handed the kid a $20 bill. For candy and soda. You can never have too much of either. The three left the room and lingered in the hallway. No one spoke. Brody wanted to etch the memory of Slater permanently into his brain. The kid had made a mark on his heart. As had Kara. Brody's chest tightened as if he were wrapped in chains and pinned to the fortress wall in the first movie. He decided to wait to pursue Kara. That had meant no touching or kissing, but holding off no longer felt like the right call. He didn't want to keep his distance from her, especially after the visit with Slater. Why should Brody? Everyone thought they were engaged. Couples in love kissed, so he lowered his mask and hers before capturing her lips with his. She inhaled sharply before relaxing inch by inch. Her lips pressed against him, and he felt as if he were being launched into space, autopilot in control, afterburners on. He'd been trying to act as if they were just friends when all he wanted was to be more than friends. He'd also been afraid once he kissed her that he wouldn't want to stop. Here, surrounded by others, he wasn't worried about that. This kiss wasn't to distract Kara or to prove to others their relationship was legit. This was for him to thank her, show his gratitude, and get another taste of her sweet lips. A way to tide them over until they could be together for real. A man cleared his throat. Must have gone well. Jackson. Slowly, Brody ended the kiss and glanced at Jackson, who'd been waiting outside the room. It went great. Brody wasn't just talking about the visit but kissing Kara. Best thing I've done in a long time, Lex said. Kara nodded. Me, too. How did you get that script? Brody asked. Rizzo. She grinned. I asked him to grab the screenplay along with Loki's mice toys last night. Lex gave her the thumbs up sign. Nice touch. She shrugged. Slater will get more use out of it than me. Besides, I figured Caitlin would ask for the script back one of these days. She knows how you care for your books and assumed you would keep it safe. The screenplay is safer now. Kara didn't miss a beat. Slater won't let anything happen to it. Finished with the self-congratulatory chit-chat. Jackson sounded more annoyed than before. Someone posted about the visit online. There's a crowd out front wanting to see L and his crew. We need to get out of here fast. Brody swore under his breath, but this was not unexpected. Gotta be honest, I'm not sorry we did this. Both Kara and Lex nodded. And I'm not sorry I put a plan in place as soon as you told me what was happening. Jackson was examining something on his phone. We'll exit through the parking lot in the basement. It's mainly used for service vehicles and staff. Rizzo is meeting us there with one of the SUVs. Kai is by the door. Get Kara out of here. I'm tired of hiding. No more. Slater was the definition of bravery given his illness. Time to act like the hero the kid thought Brody was. I want to speak to the media. She touched his arm. You sure about this? Positive. He flashed a wickedly charming grin, one of his character Elian's trademarks. Plus, it'll piss off Caitlin. Go for it. Kara kissed his cheek. For luck. Thanks. But Brody didn't want luck. He wanted her. Now to figure out how to make that happen. An hour later, Kara had showered and scrubbed the pink face paint off. The costume had made her feel attractive and desired, but she preferred putting on a pair of leggings and a long t-shirt. Much more comfortable. With a mix of nerves and anticipation, she paced the length of the apartment eager for Brody to return. Her lips wanted another kiss, but that was secondary at the moment. 
First, she wanted to tell him what an amazing difference he'd made to Slater. Brody had always seemed larger than life, but today, she'd seen how big his heart was, too. She had no doubt he'd be a fantastic husband and father. Caring, dedicated, and loving. The kind of man she wanted to date and spend her life with. Any news? she asked. No Arizo hunched over the jigsaw puzzle on the coffee table. Same answer as seven minutes ago. She stopped. That's all the time that's gone by? Grinning, he nodded. Sucks when you want something, huh? She swallowed a sigh. Very much. If something went wrong, we'd have heard by now. Rizzo had said that seven minutes ago, too. A text notification sounded. It was from Jeff. He'd attached a photo. She did a double take. No. 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 Kara reread what was written on the photo of the eviction notice attached to her condo door. It included a slam on her character and a rant about Loki destroying the condo. Lies, every single one. Kara's stomach churned. She plopped onto the couch. I don't believe this. Rizzo stood. What? My sister is evicting me. The back of Kara's neck nodded. Caitlin's giving me until tomorrow night to get my stuff out of the condo, or she'll have everything thrown away. His eyes darkened. That's not legal. You have 30 days minimum per your lease agreement. I never signed a lease. Kara hadn't thought she needed one since her landlord was her sister. She'd paid rent and the utilities each month. She hadn't been late with a payment, not even after being laid off. Yet, that hadn't stopped Caitlin. Kara buried her face in her hands. What was she going to do? Loki. Her sweet, spoiled, chubby Loki would be homeless. Her, too. She didn't even own a car they could live in. Tilting her head up, she blinked back the tears threatening to overflow. She needed to talk to Caitlin. Not cry. Walking into the bedroom, she pressed Caitlin's name on the contact list. One ring, two. I can't believe you pretended to be me at the children's hospital. The words, laced with frustration and anger, poured from Caitlin's mouth. How dare you? I should have been included. You were asked, but you said no. Instead of speaking, Kara took a deep breath. And another. This wasn't the first time she'd dealt with one of Caitlin's temper tantrums. The entire crew's presence was requested, so I dressed up like Lyra after you said you couldn't make it. Caitlin's harumph reminded Kara of their late grandmother May. You shouldn't have done that. Brody gave you way too much credit during his press conference. He made you sound like a saint. We can't have people thinking you're nice. But I am nice. No one needs to know that, Caitlin spat. Do you know how much the script you gave away is worth? You mean, the script you gave me that I decided to give to the sick child who is one of your biggest fans? Kara snapped. She was losing her temper and no longer cared. No, I don't. Fine. Maybe it was a nice thing to do, Caitlin admitted. But you shouldn't have been there. Why are you evicting me from the condo? Why are you doing any of this? I had no choice. You put me in a bad spot today by showing up at the hospital. As if Caitlin hadn't been doing the same to Kara and Brody every day up until now. How's that? I can't let my cheating, pregnant twin sister continue to live in my condo rent-free. This isn't fair, Kara yelled. I've been paying rent. And Loki never destroyed anything in the apartment. I can't believe you dragged an innocent cat into this. I'm sorry, but I won't be made to look like a fool. That's what people will call me, or worse, if I let you stay in the condo. Kara couldn't believe the extent of Caitlin's selfishness. Except now I'm homeless. You can find another place. I have no money for a deposit. I also have a cat. Kara's anger spiraled. This is unfair and wrong. You said I could live rent-free for six months if I pretended to be engaged to Brody. We'll figure something out later, okay? No, this is not okay. 
I need to figure out what I'm going to do now. Kara. Tell mom and dad the truth about Brody and me like you promised. Make sure they know I'm not pregnant so I can stay with them. A gasp sounded. You're coming to Los Angeles? She couldn't tell whether Caitlin was excited or shocked. That lack of certainty hurt, but to be honest, it was nothing new. Thanks to you, I have nowhere else to go. I'll talk to them after this is over. Until then, Brody will take care of you. Unbelievable. Caitlin would never stop unless someone forced her to. You can't keep treating Brody like a knight in shining armor who'll come to the rescue. Why not? He's always been there for me. He always will be. Caitlin's certainty bristled. Have your stuff out of the condo by tomorrow night. A real estate agent will be listing the place. That will make your engagement and pregnancy more believable. As if what you've been saying isn't enough? Sarcasm poured from Kara's voice. My film performed better than expected. That's huge and such a relief, but we need to see this through. Why? You got what you wanted. Kara gritted her teeth. But you're ruining my reputation and my life for your acting career and boyfriend. I'll make this up to you. Caitlin sounded calmer than she had at the beginning of the conversation. You know I've never let you down. Are you kidding me? The condo. Not talking to their parents. Lying to the press. And that was only in the past week. Kara rubbed her throbbing forehead. She'd been nothing more than her sister's underling and doormat for years. Her fault, yes, but what Caitlin kept asking wasn't right either. Yes, you have. Okay, maybe I have on occasion, but I will make this up to you. I have another interview to do. Gotta go. Kara picked up a pillow and hit the bed. Once, twice, three times. Her sister's words didn't match her actions. Worse, if Caitlin kept this up, she would destroy what little Kara had left. Which wasn't much at this point. After she dropped the pillow, she returned to Rizzo who had remained in the living room. Can you help me find a reputable moving company? Chapter 15 With a grin, Brody entered the apartment and glanced over his shoulder at Jackson, Lex, and Kai in the hallway. What can I say? No one can stay angry at Elian for long. Jackson laughed. You played the press like a first-chair violinist. Masterful. A man does what he has to do. Brody yanked off his too tight boots and wiggled his toes. Freedom. Nothing I said was untrue. The impromptu press conference hadn't been flawless, but he hoped others would view Kara more favorably after he'd told them how she dressed up as Lyra, located memorabilia to give to Slater, and given the boy her own copy of the first movie script. Kara sat at the dining table with Rizzo. Her laptop was open. She'd removed the pink face paint. Now her skin was completely natural. So beautiful, but she seemed stressed, opposite of how she'd been at the hospital after their kiss. What's going on? Brody asked. She glanced at Rizzo. You tell him. Brody touched her shoulder. Tell me what. Caitlin is evicting Kara, Rizzo said. Everything needs to be out of the condo by tomorrow night. There's no lease so a 30 days notice isn't required. Kara rubbed her face. I called Caitlin. She watched your press conference. She thought she should have been included in the visit. She chose not to come. Brody sidled closer to Kara. It'll be okay. As soon as the words were out, he wanted to take them back. Caitlin continued escalating the situation. Given her movie hadn't tanked, their charade would be ending soon. The lasting effect on Kara, however, worried him. Her job prospects and now her living arrangement had been affected. He wanted to help her, if she'd let him. I'll call Caitlin. Go ahead, but she doesn't care about anything other than her movie opening better than expected. She won't talk to our parents, either. Brody had to do something. Ideas flashed in his mind. He could find Kara a job in Los Angeles until a librarian position opened up. She could stay at his place. 
she'd have everything she needed. And he'd have her. Need anything from me? Brody asked. She peered up at him. A kiss? The hope in her voice poked at his heart. Happy to oblige. Brody leaned over and kissed her on the lips. He wanted to linger, but he remembered the other four who were there. He straightened. Let's move up our wedding date. Kara glanced at the security team before her gaze rested on him. You think we should? I don't want to wait. That might be the only way to stop Caitlin from doing something else to hurt Kara. They could break up, end the charade on their own, and then date for real. Why not? Kara half laughed, although the way her eyes gleamed suggested she might also cry. The Bayview House's dress designer has something for me to try on tomorrow. Let's hope it fits. He kissed her cheek. I'll call Soraya and see if she has any openings. The next morning, while Rizzo and Kai met the movers at the condo, Kara prepared for Hannah's visit to try on a wedding gown. After she made her bed, she hung the white robe on the hook in the bathroom. Talk about crazy. No place to call home, but Kara would have a wedding dress. The Bayview House could accommodate a wedding on Friday. They made a reservation to get a marriage license this afternoon. They both had to show up with their driver's licenses, and Jackson said he'd get them to City Hall for the appointment without the paparazzi following. She only had to keep up the pretense of getting married for two more days. Tomorrow was the rehearsal. And the day after. She shivered. Don't think about what happens then. Kara's phone beeped with a text notification. She read the harsh words written by a former library co-worker. This hadn't been the first one she received. They'd been arriving since the news hit, but she'd been ignoring the messages. Easier said than done when friends were deserting her to join hashtag Team Kate. Yeah, that hashtag had ramped up after the smoothie incident. The social media attacks had been cruel, but being unfriended by all but a handful of her Facebook friends and former co-workers hurt worse. She didn't dare check her Instagram and Twitter accounts for fear she'd been unfollowed by everyone she knew. A handful of people were sticking by her, Jeff, Renee, and Mo. Cassie and Troy, too. All had been texting her. Troy had even spoken with Brett Matthews. The two men had offered her a place to hide out in Portland, Oregon, if needed. That had been unexpected and appreciated. Loki meowed. I know you want to go home. She rubbed the cat. So do I. But she had no idea where home would be. Or what would be left of her life once she got there. Kara folded a sweater. We'll just have to start over. Maybe Brody was right. San Francisco was so expensive. It might not be the place to do that. She sat on the bed. Where else would we go? Loki nudged his head against Kara as if sensing her unease. He might be pampered, but the cat knew her moods and never left her alone when she was sad. I wish I knew the answer. She scratched behind his ear and was rewarded by purring. At least we still have Brody. Sweet, kind, funny Brody. Hot kisses and fairy tale daydreams with Brody. She'd enjoyed planning a wedding and living with him at this apartment, but the way he'd cared for her after being covered in smoothie and seeing him with Slater had changed everything. She'd fallen completely under Brody's spell once more. A magical, intoxicating spell. Dangerous, yes, but she couldn't help herself. He'd been her lifeline through this past week, and she'd clung tightly. She wasn't ready to let go. A knock sounded. It's Hannah. Kara opened the bedroom door. Thanks for coming over. No problem. Hannah's smiling face glowed. Though I thought your security team was going to put a hood over my head. They are overprotective. As they should be. Hannah held up a dress bag. I'm excited to show you what I came up with. Kara nodded. I can't believe you managed to do anything. The time is speeding by. That's what happens with a short engagement, but the length of time doesn't matter when you know it's true love. True love. A sigh welled inside Kara. She would settle for any kind of love. 
Who was she kidding? She'd take a strong case of like. Spending this time with Brody made her realize how much she wanted to be with him. That was the part of this situation she wished would change. That they wouldn't go their separate ways when the pretend engagement ended. Hannah unzipped a pink dress bag. Nothing better. Kara hoped to discover that for herself someday. With Brody, she'd gotten a taste. She wanted, more. If only he wanted what she did, could see how much they could have if they were together. That was the story of her and Brody from the time she realized freshman year of high school that her feelings for her best friend went deeper than friendship. Brody going out with different girls, or talking about another he wanted to date, had led to many tears and heartbreak. The worst had been the night he'd called her to see if she thought Caitlin might say yes, if he invited her to a dance. That had been as hard for Kara as seeing the two of them kiss on the red carpet. I'm calling about homecoming. For a minute, okay, a nanosecond, Kara had thought he was asking her to be his date. A dream come true thrill had shot through her. Toes wiggling, she'd bounced around her bedroom like a human pogo stick, imagining the two of them dressed up, her in a sparkly dress and him in a suit. Only that fantasy had come crashing down with what he said next. Do you think Caitlin would go with me? He'd wanted to take her sister, not Kara. She hadn't been asked to the dance by anyone. Caitlin had told her only losers attended without dates, so Kara didn't buy a new dress, get a mani pedi with her mom, or have her hair styled into a fancy updo at the hair salon like Caitlin. Kara had stayed home instead. Alone. She'd watched Stephen King's Carrie. Attending the Academy Awards with Brody had been her homecoming dance. Her prom, too. But maybe things wouldn't always be that way. Putting on this wedding gown today could be a rehearsal for when she was a real bride. A sign that it would happen sooner rather than later. Let's get you in the dress, Hannah said. The inflection on her final word probably sent brides into fits of giddiness. Well, normal brides. Not fake ones like Kara. Can't wait. She tried for an excited tone, but her voice sounded flat. Hannah tucked her dark hair behind her ears. One of my favorite parts of this job is seeing a bride in her dress for the first time. I'm sure that's a special moment. I would usually have you wear heels, but since this dress has a shorter hem due to the picnic theme, bare feet will work. Good, because I have no heels to wear. Other than the low heel pumps she'd planned on wearing to her interview, Kara's dressier shoes were packed away like everything else she owned, locked in a storage unit. She would soon be homeless, family-less, and almost friendless. Because of Caitlin. No one would ever know the truth about what Kara did or didn't do. She would be forever known as Gossip Fodder, the woman who got pregnant and stole her twin sister's boyfriend. The worst part was that most people who knew her, either from work, college, or growing up, believed she was capable of doing those things. Her. Kara O'Neill. The librarian turned book concierge. She wasn't an orphan or a waif but she felt alone in the world despite having parents and a sister. At least she had Brody and Loki. Maybe she could adopt another cat. Well, once she found a place to live. Hannah pulled out a white dress. I was scouring through thrift stores and consignment shops when I found this new arrival. I didn't check the size, just knew I could use it to mix old styles with new innovations. The dress happens to be your size. That made my job easier. And the tea length is perfect for a picnic wedding. That's a lot of white fabric. So much the dress resembles a fluffy cloud. There's a lot of tulle and lace, but wait until you try on the gown. Hannah gave an encouraging smile. Trust me, the dress looks much different when you're wearing it. Kara trusted the designer. I'm sure it does. Hannah held up the wedding gown. The confection of lace, beading, and tulle brought tears to Kara's eyes. The lace neckline was high and trimmed with pearls and crystals. The skirt was also decorated with the same pearls but had slightly larger crystals that shimmered underneath the lights. Okay, not a cloud. Breathtaking. Kara's voice cracked. She could tell Hannah put her heart into each design, whether she was starting from scratch or altering an old dress. Though the designer would be compensated for her efforts, this gorgeous creation would go unworn. 
a amazing. Hannah helped Kara into the dress. Sticking her hands through the armholes, she hoped the dress looked okay, but not great. She wanted to remain distant, be more of an observer than a participant in the fitting, because knowing a bride wouldn't walk down the aisle wearing the dress made her sad. Almost on, Hannah said. The sleeveless dress had a lace bodice with beading and a full skirt that gave it the cloud effect. Pretty, but her heart didn't go pitter-patter. Thank goodness. Hannah buttoned the back. This part takes the longest. I've got all day. Well, until their appointment at City Hall that afternoon. The minutes passed. That was the last one. Hannah stepped in front of Kara. The designer beamed. A nice fit. We could take in the waist an inch, but not too much more. We want you comfortable on your wedding day, not struggling to breathe. Whatever you think is best. Let's go into the bathroom where there's a mirror. You need to see yourself. On the way, the skirt swooshed around Kara's lower calves. She stared at the mirror, and gasped. Hannah clapped. Beautiful. Mouth open, Kara stared at her reflection. The dress was, magical. Beautiful didn't begin to describe each amazing detail. Talk about a dream come true gown. She'd long to feel like a princess. In this dress, she did. Are you a fairy godmother in addition to being a wedding dress designer? She asked. Hannah laughed. I should add that to my business card. Do, because you are. Kara turned to the right and left. The skirt flowed and sparkled with the change in position and lighting. The lace bodice fit, not too snugly, but accentuated her chest and waist. It's perfect. She examined herself from every angle. So pretty. She laughed, giddy with excitement and anticipation. Thinking about wearing this on her wedding day, she hummed the bridal march. Wait until Brody sees me. And then she remembered. Not real. She wasn't a real bride. She wasn't going to be one. Not anytime soon. All of this was fake. But staring at her reflection, she knew. Being a real bride, Brody's bride, was what she wanted. To marry her best friend. Somehow, she needed to stop pretending and go after what she wanted, except. Kara had been pretending for years. Always doing and being what her sister and parents needed. Brody, too. Never doing what Kara needed or wanted. This couldn't continue. Not the wedding charade. Not denying her needs and what she wanted. Not taking any chances. She had to change, but how? Could she do it? Chapter 16 At the wedding rehearsal on Thursday, the Bayview House staff outnumbered the guests. Only Brody's family, his agent, Matthias, and his personal assistant, Ainsley, were in attendance. Tomorrow, their supposed wedding day, more of his friends were expected. Kara was happy they had stuck by Brody despite the bad press. She wished she could say the same of her friends. On her side of the aisle, there would only be a handful of people, Jeff and her co-workers from Cassandra's attic. They were the only people left in Kara's circle of acquaintances, her only remaining friends. Her parents hadn't bothered with an RSVP. And Caitlin. A for sale sign hung in the window of the condo Kara had called home these past three years. At what point would Caitlin allow things to go back to normal? Kara guessed never. Which was why last night and earlier today, Kara had put off talking to Brody. Instead, she'd submitted more resumes to libraries, some with openings and others without, across the state and country. Until she knew what would happen with Brody after they broke up, she had to keep searching for a job. That was the responsible thing to do. Safer than telling him how she felt, too. Tomorrow. The charade would end. They had debated who should be the one left at the altar. Kara had wanted to be the no-show so people wouldn't think she was trapping Brody. He was fine with being jilted, but he worried her dumping him could vilify Kara with his fans. She would be better off in the long run being the victim. That would allow her to gain sympathy so she could rebuild her reputation. They'd decided to do that. 
After brunch, she would arrive at the Bayview house to have her hair and makeup done. She would put on her magical dress and then wait for her groom to arrive. Except Brody wouldn't show up. Cold feet. Regrets. A change of heart. So many reasons existed, but the statement released to the media by his spokesperson would be vaguely worded. The public and media would be asked to respect their privacy at this difficult time. An announcement about her miscarriage would occur later. The plan seemed doable, and she had no doubt she could play the role of the jilted bride. Tears came easily these days, so she wouldn't have to pretend to be upset about being left at the altar. She was sure there would be ugly crying, none of it faked, but as a pregnant bride with no groom to marry, she would eventually be forgiven for her role in the scandal, according to Brody's publicist. Since everyone is here, let's run through how this will work tomorrow. Soraya wore a slim skirt and button-down blouse. It won't take long. Kara stared at the last row of white chairs. She would walk down the aisle alone. No biggie. She was 28 and not a real bride. This was only a rehearsal. Tomorrow, the pretending would stop. This would all be over. Over. Her heart splintered. Brody had said nothing about staying in San Francisco or asking where she would go. Did that mean he would leave? Return to LA? Forget about her? Emotions swirled. She hoped not because. Love. Oh, no. She didn't just like him. She loved him. L-O-V. That was why Kara had been so mixed up. Afraid. She wanted this rehearsal to be real and the wedding. Brody ran a finger along her cheek. Why the long face? It's nothing. Then smile. This is our wedding rehearsal. If only. But she wanted him to be happy, so she pasted on what she hoped was a glowing, bride-worthy smile. Better, she asked. Much. His forehead pressed against hers. I'm almost sorry this will be over soon. Marry me. For real. The thought sounded so loudly in her head that Kara wondered if she'd spoken aloud. Her heart thundered like a stampede of wild mustangs, but Brody's expression hadn't changed. He didn't know how she felt. The words longed to burst from her lips, but she couldn't say them here. This wasn't the right time to tell Brody. Okay, there had never been a right time with him. Not when they were in high school, when she was in college, or when she lived in Los Angeles. But she couldn't wait much longer if she wanted a chance for this to work. And she wanted that. More than anything. Let's start back here. Soraya motioned to Kara. Gnawing on her lower lip, Kara shuffled to the start of the aisle. The setting is just like I imagined. Intimate. I love the flowers. Soraya beamed. So happy to hear that, but we're not finished decorating yet. The colorful blossoms in the garden, around the gazebo, and the seating area amazed Kara. A sweet floral scent floated in the air. The yearning for this to be real grew with each breath. Everything looks perfect now. Soraya's eyes twinkled with mischief. You'll see. But Kara wouldn't. Tomorrow, her dream of marrying Brody would end. A string quartet sitting off to the right of the altar played the song she and Brody had chosen together. The minister, a lovely, smiling woman named Shelley, stood at the altar with Brody on her left. Everyone seemed so happy. Kara wanted to be happy, too. Yet, as she headed down the aisle to strains of Bach, her feet kept sticking to the pathway. She slowed her steps, wanting this moment to last. As she reached Brody, his smile didn't quiet her nerves. The rehearsal would be brief, like the simple ceremony they'd planned, and then she would have one more day to be his fiancé. Less than 24 hours. To make the most of their time together and pour out her heart. Her love for him. Ainsley, who bounced on her tiptoes, was the maid of honor. Matthias, who glanced at his cell phone, was the best man. Not the wedding party Kara imagined growing up, but she didn't have much choice with her friends deserting her like she had the plague. She and Brody were lucky to have these two people standing beside them as witnesses, even if both worked for him. 
We'll go through what you need to say during the ceremony, Shelley said. You may feel nervous, and that's perfectly normal, but all you have to do is repeat after me. That's easier than memorizing lines, Brody joked. Shelley nodded. Much. I can't allow this to happen. Caitlin burst into the garden. She wore her hair in an updo, and her dress seemed more appropriate for Grace Kelly in her heyday. Kara's stomach roiled. Her sister showing up didn't just mean trouble, it also meant chaos. This would not be good. Caitlin was followed by her entourage, stylist, hairdresser, makeup artist, and personal assistant. Two men came next, one filming with a video camera, the other taking pictures using a fancy camera with a big lens. Jackson struggled to grab their cameras, and Kai blocked the way. Caitlin held up her arms. Wrist-length white gloves covered her hands. She was dressed as if she'd come straight from the movie set of a 1950s period piece. Stop the wedding. Kara stared in disbelief. There wasn't going to be a wedding. This was all a lie, which would be over tomorrow. Her sister knew that because it had been the plan all along. Only the timing had changed. So, what was Caitlin doing here? Jackson spoke into his headpiece, trying to corral the wedding crashers. This is a private wedding rehearsal, Soraya announced with a don't mess with me tone. You need to leave. Now. Caitlin walked on heels as if she were wearing sneakers. I will not allow my conniving sister to steal the love of my life away. Everyone knows you're lying about being pregnant. Kara's cheeks burned. The same heat ignited her anger. She balled her hands. The tips of her French manicured fingernails, courtesy of the Bayview House, dug into her palms. Enough. No one, including her twin sister, had the right to treat her this way. She'd agreed to help, not to be Caitlin's personal punching bag and scapegoat. This stops now. I'm not letting you use me anymore. I've always loved you and supported you, but your life is not more important than mine. Either you treat me as an equal, as your twin sister, or stay out of my life. Such a diva reaction. Caitlin rolled her eyes. I'll happily stay out of your life because you're finished here. Brody's mine, not yours. A vein pulsed in Brody's jaw. Caitlin. Look at her and then look at me. Body, face, hair. There's no comparison. It's me you want. Leaning forward, she lowered her voice. Alec went back to his wife so he wouldn't lose his kids. I realized he wasn't the love of my life. You are. I want us to be together for real. A couple. Hollywood's golden couple. Together forever. Kara listened in disbelief. She waited for Brody to say no, to shut her sister down immediately. She wouldn't even be upset if he added a swear word or two, except. Silence. He wasn't saying anything. Why not? A million thoughts raced through her mind, none of them good. Go. She looked around to see who had spoken. Her gaze rested upon Brody. He hadn't said a word. He opened his mouth to speak before he pressed his lips together. His gaze darted between them as if comparing the two twins, trying to decide which sister he wanted. Reality hit Kara like a muni bus. Disappointment flooded her. She forced herself not to collapse to the ground. Everything she'd wanted with him, love, a future, a family, was nothing more than a dumb fantasy. The way it had always been. Oh, logically a part of her had known her dreams wouldn't come true, but the rest of her had been holding out hope. So much hope. No longer. It was over. The pretending. Everything. She was on her own. No place to live. No family. No Brody. Her heart shattered, but it somehow kept beating while air flowed into her lungs. Caitlin was back and single. Her career had been salvaged and her reputation still sparkled clean as could be. Brody no longer needed to play the part of Kara's fiancé. He no longer needed her. Her insides twisted, but she couldn't deny the truth. A sexy, famous starlet was better than an unemployed, homeless librarian turned bookseller with a spoiled cat. 
Time to go. She stepped back from the altar. Where are you going? Brody asked. It's over. Their time of being together, laughing and kissing, hadn't changed anything. Nothing would ever change between them. He didn't want her. Would never love her. Kara saw that now. She was finished. With him. With her sister. Caitlin's lies and selfishness might have ruined Kara's life, but she had been the one to allow it to happen by not standing up for herself or going after what she wanted. She wouldn't make that mistake again. Fighting the urge to scream, she stared into her sister's eyes. You need to tell mom and dad the truth. Today. Kara wanted to ruin her sister's life the way Caitlin had ruined hers, but if Kara did that, she'd be no better than her twin. And she wanted to be better. Desperately. She wanted to do what was right. Not for Caitlin or Brody, but for herself. Kara needed to put herself, her needs, first. It wasn't logic telling her that but her heart. And she would. Chapter 17 Kara ran inside the Bayview house. Each step pummeled her aching heart, but she couldn't stop or stay. Hot tears burned. She blinked them away. For now. Grabbing her purse from the bride's dressing room, she continued toward the front door. She'd made the right choice, but what was she going to do now? Where would she go? Need a ride? Lex asked. He and Rizzo stood in the entryway. She glanced over her shoulder. Part of her wished Brody was coming after her, but he wasn't. And wouldn't. But at least she could get out of here without too much trouble. She forced herself to breathe. I'd love one. Lex jiggled his keys. Let's go. She followed the two men outside. You have perfect timing. Lex grinned. That's why they pay us the big bucks. Yeah, right. Rizzo opened the passenger door and climbed in after her. Though we were on our way over. A local friend who is a PI called to say something big was happening at the Bayview house. He wanted to give a heads up since he knew we'd been there with a client. A pie? That sounded like something out of a book or movie. I don't understand why it matters. A wedding between two A-list movie stars is happening that will bring out the crowds and paparazzi. Two movie stars. The PI hadn't meant her and Brody, but... Caitlin and Brody. Goosebumps covered Kara's skin. She rubbed her arms even though she wasn't cold. That had to be it. Caitlin had known about the wedding they'd planned and the breakup that would happen before the ceremony occurred, but she hadn't known Brody had moved up the date. Yet, Caitlin was here. How would she know about the change of plans? Unless she'd hired someone to keep track of Kara and Brody. That was the only thing that made sense since they hadn't told her everything they were doing. Yet, somehow, she'd known. No way had marrying Brody been part of Caitlin's initial plan, but somewhere along the way, she'd decided that was what she wanted. Kara had blindly played along when she. She should have known better. With her sister and with Brody. He wasn't just out of Kara's league, he belonged in another galaxy. Yet, she'd fallen head over heels in love with him. Again. A vice gripped her heart. She'd even planned his and Caitlin's wedding. She didn't know whether to laugh or cry. The diamond on her left hand sparkled in the sunshine. She twisted the band. Brody had told her to sell the ring when they were finished and keep the money. Well, she was finished. Kara stared at the gorgeous ring. Brody hadn't selected the style out of love and a desire to please her. More likely desperation fueled by panic. The ring was nothing more than a placard to tell the world she was engaged to him. A way to make their relationship appear legit. Holding onto the piece of jewelry for sentimental reasons made no sense. Not now. She held up her left hand. I need to get rid of my engagement ring. Do either of you know a good pawn shop? Rizzo's brows drew together. Sure you want to do that? The ring was a shackle keeping her from becoming the person she needed to be. She pulled the band from her finger. Never been more sure about anything in my life. 
he gave a nod. I know just the place. Thanks. Do you want to talk about what happened? Lex asked from the driver's seat. Thanks, but not yet. Talking might bring tears. She couldn't afford to cry right now. I'm sure I'll want to later. Rizzo studied her. His obvious concern touched her aching heart. Is there someone you want us to call? Unfortunately, Loki didn't talk. And then she remembered Troy and Brett's generous offer. She needed a place to go. Not to hide per se, but to regroup. Portland was as good as any city. I need to talk to my boss. After that, Kara would figure out what to do next. Taking one step was better than standing still. She'd been stuck in one place for too long. Time to start moving, not walking, but running, even if she wasn't sure what direction to go. Heart pounding in his ears, Brody stood in front of the Bayview house. He'd been held up by Caitlin and her entourage. Now, there was no sign of Kara. Where could she be? Who? Caitlin asked, following him as if she were his shadow. Kara. Brody scanned the street, both ways, for the third time, squinting in case he'd missed something. He hadn't. He brushed his hand through his hair and then rubbed his neck. Why would she leave without saying goodbye? Who cares? Caitlin's bottom lip thrust out. The pout looked haughty, not adorable like it did on Kara. She had her fifteen minutes, but now it's our time. Let's finish the wedding rehearsal. He flinched. Excuse me. You've planned and paid for a wedding. No reason to let the work and money go to waste, Caitlin said in a matter-of-fact tone. We'll get married instead. My assistant is making us a reservation at City Hall so we can get our marriage license. Caitlin couldn't be serious, except her expression hadn't changed. Nor had the tone of her voice. No sign of anxiety or panic. She had the same expression in her eyes, success at any cost, that she'd had for over a decade. Brody had been like that himself. That was why they'd skipped attending college and moved to Los Angeles instead. Their gamble had paid off eventually, but stardom wasn't everything. There had to be balance, something that had been missing in his life before. Kara had shown him that. He loved acting and working in the film industry. He wanted to continue but not at the breakneck speed of the past three years. He wanted more in his life than just hit movies. He wanted love and a family. Kara. After the rehearsal, he'd wanted to tell her that. Caitlin, however, had ruined his plan. Come on. With gloved hands, Caitlin tugged on his arm. Let's go back to the rehearsal. What she was suggesting went far beyond ambition. No. She kept pulling on him, but he wouldn't move. The only place he wanted to be was with Kara, and Caitlin was in the way. He shrugged off her hand. Stop. You stop being stubborn and come on. He stared at Caitlin as if seeing her for the first time. Okay, she'd shown glimpses of being a stranger the past two weeks, but the mask she'd worn for so long had completely disintegrated. She was no longer the talented, gorgeous girl he'd grown up with. The one who'd been so vulnerable at one point but then bounced back stronger than before. The one who'd given him confidence their dreams weren't out of reach. The woman standing next to him wasn't that same person. She was willing to sell out her sister to get what she wanted. My parents arrive tonight. Our friends, too. There's a dinner at eight. Caitlin spoke like the wedding was a done deal. My stylist found me the most amazing dress. Not couture, but we can take a second set of wedding pictures with a custom gown when we get home from our honeymoon and sell those to the highest bidder. Had this been Caitlin's plan from the beginning or had she regrouped along the way until she decided marrying him was the best solution? The best for her career? He wouldn't put anything past her. His muscles tightened. No. This venue isn't what I had in mind, and I'm sure there won't be an orchid in sight. Caitlin continued speaking as if he hadn't said anything. 
I hope my sister didn't go all English garden wildflowers for the floral arrangements. We're not getting married, Caitlin. Of course we are. She acted nonplussed because Kate Neal always got her way, especially with him. This is what has to happen. Because your fiancé dumped you. Alec was a mistake. I was never in love with him. Not really. The words rushed out. Can you imagine me as a stepmother? No, Brody couldn't. But you and me. She ran her fingers down his arm. We're good together. We haven't been together in over two years. Even when we were dating, it was one drama after another and not that much fun. More bad times than good. Which was why they'd broken up. She touched his face and snuggled close, wiggling her chest and pressing her hips against him. He felt, nothing. We can try harder this time, she whispered in a seductive voice. Brody stepped away. He'd been too blind to see that everything Kara had said about her twin sister was true. He hadn't wanted to believe Caitlin was capable of lying and manipulating those closest to her, but she had. Caitlin didn't care who she used or hurt as long as she got what she wanted. Not seeing the truth had made him feel stupid, rendered him speechless at the worst possible time. That wasn't going to happen now. No, his tone was harsh. Exactly as he intended. She drew back. You can't say no to me. I'm mentally fragile. With my anxiety issues, I might. No. Her lips parted as if she was about to speak. Nothing you say will change my mind. Brody didn't want to listen to her any longer. She was toxic. He wanted her out of his life. For good. I appreciate all you did for our careers, but I've spent the past three years feeling like I owe you. You've taken advantage of my gratitude, making me cater to your every whim and demand. Holding your anxiety over my head like a guillotine. Are you even in therapy and taking medication? Guilt flashed across her face before vanishing. I'm doing better. She hadn't answered his question. There was a big difference between doing better and not needing to see a doctor, meet with a therapist, and take medication. And that was when it hit him. You've been using your anxiety issues to get what you want. From Kara. From him. From her parents. They'd all gone along with it. Especially him. His jaw tensed. This entire time, you've been the one pretending. Claiming to be mentally fragile. Suggesting you might hurt yourself if things got too bad. I. Brody held up his hand. I'm not finished. To save yourself and continue to appear above reproach, you destroyed your sister's life and reputation. Turned your parents against her, took away job opportunities, and left her homeless. Caitlin gave one of her trademarked pouts. You make it sound so, premeditated. I still suffer from anxiety, but perhaps I slightly exaggerated how bad it was after I was put on the right meds, got in therapy, and learned coping techniques. Unbelievable. All this time. Anger burned. Kara and I have done whatever you asked for years. We bailed you out of trouble because we love you and never wanted to see you spiral again. You, however, have done nothing but use us. That ends now. You're on your own. Caitlin's mouth gaped. But. I have to find Kara. Brody took a step toward the front door. Caitlin grabbed hold of his arm. Why do you care where Kara is? He jerked out of Caitlin's grasp as if her hand were poison. Because I love her. The reason was as simple as that. He just hadn't realized it because he hadn't known what love was until Kara. What he and Caitlin shared hadn't ever been romantic love. Friendship, infatuation, strong like, but never love. But he and Kara. He had to find her. Maybe Jackson knew where she was. Caitlin laughed. You don't love my sister. Yes, I do. Her gaze narrowed, and he saw a glimpse of the girl he used to know. Really? Kara means everything to me. 
Brody loved her with his whole heart. A part of him always had growing up, but he'd been too young to understand how he felt or to see how wonderful Kara was. He'd been too blinded by ambition, stardom, and, Caitlin. Your sister is the smartest, kindest, most beautiful woman in the world. I've never known anyone like her. If I let her get away, I don't know how I'll live with myself. He only hoped it wasn't too late. Chapter 18 Kara rode to the business jet center in Oakland with Lex and Rizzo. Loki whined from his cat carrier on the floor. Traffic was lighter than she'd expected on the Bay Bridge. It won't be long, your highness. The words made her cat cry louder, but that gave her something else to focus on other than her broken heart and bare ring finger. She packed her things from the apartment quickly, leaving only Loki's scratching post and litter box. Those, along with cat food, she could purchase in Portland after Laurel Matthews, Brett's wife, picked up Kara at the airport. Thanks to pawning the engagement ring, she had a nice nest egg. She patted her purse, full of cash and a deposit slip from her checking account, where she put the rest of the money. Now, she could start over. Well, once she figured out how and where to do that. Lex parked. He carried her luggage. Rizzo held onto the cat carrier. Are you sure you want to leave town? I have nowhere else to go. Admitting that brought a rush of hurt. But a customer of mine is an investment advisor and author who lives in Portland. His best friend, Henry, has a guest house where Loki and I can stay while I search for a job. One of Brett's clients happens to be on his way home to Portland in his family's company jet, so I'm flying with him. Lex laughed. Sounds like some good friends to have. Kara straightened, because she might be down to only a few people she could call friends, but they were going out of their way to help her and Loki. Yes. Rizzo exhaled loudly. If you need us. There won't be more threats. Caitlin's fans would be too busy poring over wedding photos and videos. Besides, no one will know where I am. Still. Call. Anytime. Rizzo handed her a business card. Someone monitors that number 24 hours a day. They'll put you through to one of us. Thanks. She tucked the card into her purse. I hope I never find myself in this situation, but if I do, I know the team to call. Both men beamed, their steps taking on more of a swagger. That brought a much-needed smile to her face. A quick stop at an information desk, and they were out on the tarmac heading toward a shiny jet with Geyer gear painted on the side. The sounds of planes taking off filled the air. Soon, that would be her. She tried not to think about leaving San Francisco. Putting the memories of the past two weeks, and the last three years, behind her was for the best. Someday she might be able to look back without being torn apart, but she doubted that would be anytime soon. A man in his mid to late twenties came down the jet's short staircase. He seemed to be favoring his right leg. Kara, right? She nodded. I'm Ryland Geyer. His brown hair fell to his shoulders in a casual style, and his eyes were a clear blue. He had the face of a model and the body of an athlete. Not that anyone could compare to Brody. Kara blew out a breath before shaking his hand. Thanks for letting me hitch a ride. The more, the merrier. Ryland laughed. Always happy to help out a friend of Laurel and Brett's. Well, it's much appreciated. He looked at Lex and Rizzo. Are you guys coming with us? Lex shifted his weight between his feet. No, we're just seeing Kara off. Funny, but Lex sounded almost nervous. A way she'd never seen him act before. Not even at the hospital with Slater. Rizzo nodded. He started to speak and then stopped himself. Take good care of her and Loki. Will do. Ryland went to grab her suitcase, but Lex stopped him. I'll load it into the baggage compartment. After he did, Lex faced Ryland. You need to heal so you can be on the slopes next season. Ryland's smile appeared forced. I'm working to make that happen. Slopes? Kara asked. I ski, Ryland said. I'm not much into sports, she admitted. Ryland won two medals in Sochi, Lex blurted. 
sorry. Both runs were amazing, but you almost won the last one. Guess the bodyguard was a big ski fan. That was cute. You would have killed it at Pyeongchang if Rizzo's voice faded. If I hadn't been injured during that World Cup race at St. Moritz and had to miss the Winter Games last year. Ryland didn't appear embarrassed, more resigned. But I'll be racing again next season. The other men nodded. Ryland motioned to the plane. Let's get you and Loki settled in the cabin. The pilot and flight attendant will be here shortly, then we'll be off. Off to the Pacific Northwest. A place she'd never visited, but it would be her new home. At least temporarily. She hugged Lex and then Rizzo. Thanks again for everything. Rizzo handed over Loki. The pleasure was ours, Kara. At the doorway to the jet, she glanced over her shoulder. Neither man had moved. She waved and stepped inside. The interior screamed wealth with its taupe leather captain seats and coordinating carpet and walls, but she supposed that was who purchased private jets. It was a different world from hers, but she was grateful for the ride and the generosity of Brett's friends. Kara set the cat carrier underneath one of the seats. Nice plane. It comes in handy, Rylan joked. You can sit wherever you want. It's a short flight. Thanks. Footsteps sounded outside on the staircase. Wait. Recognizing Brody's voice, she froze. Ryland stood in front of her as if trying to protect her. Brody entered the jet, filling the space with his larger-than-life presence. Her heart slammed against her rib cage. She took a step back. What was he doing here? Loki cried from his cat carrier, meowing as if caught in a trap and desperate to escape. Kara. Brody sounded breathless. His face was flushed. He came closer until Ryland stopped him. Thank goodness I found you. Why? She had to force the question from her dry throat. You're marrying Caitlin. He took a step forward, but Ryland blocked his way. Give us a minute, please. It's up to Kara. Standing his ground, Ryland glanced over his shoulder. Do you want to talk to this guy? She might have met Ryland only a few minutes ago, but even injured and not knowing what was happening, he wanted to protect her. Brett had a good friend. Not trusting her voice, she nodded. I'll wait on the tarmac. Ryland eyed Brody suspiciously. Yell if you need me, Kara. Another nod. Ryland exited the plane. Where are you going? Brody's voice was deep, rich, and washed over her like melted chocolate, but she saw a hint of fear in his gaze. No, she had to be mistaken. He had nothing to be afraid of. She raised her chin. Away. Kara had made her decision. The best one for her peace of mind and the safety of her heart. Getting far, far away from him had worked once. It would again. We need to talk. You have Caitlin for that. You two are the perfect couple and will make wonderful blockbuster movies together. Kara sounded shrill. She needed to lower her voice. What more could you want? I don't want Caitlin or any of that stuff. The jet was nice, but not that large. He cut the distance between them with a couple of steps. I want you. I want to be with you. I want to have babies with you. I want to grow old with you. Kara's breath stilled. That wasn't what she expected to hear. I saw you hesitate at the Bayview house. You were trying to decide between Caitlin and me. Making the decision wasn't automatic. You had to think about it. He didn't answer, but his sheepish expression told her everything she needed to know. Nothing had changed between them. Nothing would ever change. You need to leave. I have things to do Anne. Kara. What? I hesitated because Caitlin showing up was the last thing I expected to happen. I was confused, frustrated, you name it. Why? Because she was ruining our time together. He reached out and held Kara's hand. Your sister did exactly what you said she would do, put herself first, but she won't be pulling that with us again. 
Kara didn't understand why he sounded so serious. It was a fake wedding rehearsal. Today wasn't only our fake wedding rehearsal. Brody pulled out a royal blue ring box. It's the day I wanted to ask you to be part of my life. For real. A soft gasp escaped her lips. Anything else she wanted to say lodged in her throat. She wanted to believe him, surrender to the sudden joy bubbling in her heart, but she was wary. Okay, scared. She didn't know what to think. Did he mean the words, or was he acting, saying what he thought should be said, not what he felt? Shaking, she covered her mouth with her hands. I don't know what to say. For so long, it's been you and Caitlin. That was for show. Pretend. Being with you has always been real. When we were younger and now. You, you're the only one for me. Kara forced herself to breathe. His gaze remained locked on hers. But I couldn't see that until. I was out of Caitlin's shadow, Kara finished for him. Your sister casts a big one. Brody squeezed Kara's hand. When you left the Bayview house, I wanted to go after you, but Caitlin and her cronies stopped me. I literally dragged her with me. She admitted to using her anxiety to get her way all these years. Kara should have been more surprised, upset even, but this was so typical of her sister. Brody swallowed. By the time I got away from her, you were gone. Lex and Rizzo gave me a ride. Not straight back to the apartment. I was waiting. When you didn't show up, I returned to the Bayview house. And then I had to find a jewelry store. Jackson must have liked that. I ditched him after the second store. He was slowing me down. Brody's gaze remained locked on hers. I love you. I was planning to ask if you wanted to date me when the pretending stopped, but that's not enough. I don't want to lose you. I can't lose you. She struggled not to cave like a house of cards. He was saying all the right words. But Caitlin and your career. You, Kara O'Neill, are the only woman for me. I just needed to open my eyes and listen to my heart. I love you. You're what matters. Nothing else. Loki meowed from his crate. Except for that spoiled, fat cat of yours. He matters, too. Brody smiled. We belong together. You're smarter than I am. You figured that out first, but I was too stupid to realize it. Now that I do, I won't let you get away from me again. Doubts disappeared. Wariness hit the road. Her heart soared. The conviction in his voice made her believe. Brody wasn't acting. He meant what he'd said. I don't want to go anywhere unless it's with you. I was too scared to tell you how I felt. Too scared you wouldn't feel the same. But I won't ever make that mistake again. She knew what she wanted, had always wanted, but she'd been too afraid to go for it. Not any longer. I love you, Brody Simmons. I always have, even when I told myself I didn't. Wrapping his arms around her, he kissed her on the lips. He stole her breath the way he'd stolen her heart. His lips moved over hers with a hunger that lit a fire inside her. She loved this man, and he loved her. They could figure out the details later. For now, she wanted to kiss him, soak up his warmth and the way he tasted. Her arms wrapped around his neck. She arched against him, her fingers in his hair. Heat pulsed through her veins, driving a need for more. She lowered one of her hands to his back. The muscles under her palm spoke of his physical strength, but the man was tender and kind. The pressure against her lips decreased. Slowly, he drew the kiss to an end. Consider this an intermission. His smoldering gaze sent his hotness level off the chart. Soraya needs to know if there will be a wedding at the Bayview house tomorrow. Huh? Kara's breathing was ragged. Her brain was fuzzy from the kisses. She must have misunderstood him. Say what? He opened the ring box. A sparkling solitaire gleamed against the blue velvet. Smaller diamonds were inlaid in a filigree, platinum setting. The ring was perfect. Brody got down on one knee. 
Marry me, Kara O'Neill. For real this time. Forever. She covered her mouth with her hands. I. Is that a yes? Unable to speak, she nodded. Thank you. He rose and kissed her again. Hard and fast. I'm the luckiest guy in the world. Her lips tingled. So what do we do now? I'll call Soraya and tell her we'll be getting married, but not yet. Kara was confused. Why wait? So you can have the wedding of your dreams. Marrying you is my dream come true. Her heart sighed. I love our picnic theme, and my dress is to die for. But if you'd rather wait. I'd rather say I do right now, but I can hold off until tomorrow. Kara didn't think she could be any happier that she was at this moment. Thank you. No, thank you. He cupped her face in his hand. But we'd better get off this plane and find a place to stay tonight so we can let Loki out of his crate. Poor guy is miserable. She brushed her lips across his, before staring at the ring on her finger. I wonder how different being really engaged feels from being fake engaged. You have less than 24 hours to find out. That should be long enough. Then she would be walking down the aisle in her beautiful wedding dress. Someday had arrived. She was getting her happily ever after. She'd take it. And Brody. For better, for worse. For always. Forever. Epilogue. While Ainsley strolled down the aisle to music played by a harpist, Kara stood behind a wall covered with flowers, gorgeous, colorful blossoms that kept her hidden from the guests. Most importantly, they concealed her from the groom. She didn't want Brody to see her until she was heading toward him. Clutching her bouquet of white and pink roses, she couldn't believe she was marrying her best friend today after only being proposed to yesterday. Well, proposed to for real this time. Standing next to her in a tuxedo, her father wiped his eyes. I don't think I'll ever be able to apologize enough. I'm just happy you and mom are here today. Kara was. Her parents had called after they'd learned the truth from Caitlin. It still upset Kara they'd taken her sister's side so readily that hurt would take time to heal, but she realized people weren't perfect, including parents. Despite everything, she wanted them at her wedding. She wanted her dad to escort her down the aisle. And Caitlin. After footage from the wedding rehearsal had been released last night, her new publicist had released a statement from Caitlin, one that Kara had read so many times she'd memorized the words. To my dearest fans, especially my beloved Brates. I can't tell you how much your support these past two weeks has meant to me, but I must put an end to an elaborate publicity stunt for my new movie Trouble until that has spiraled out of control. What I said about my sister, Kara O'Neill, and Brody Simmons were lies concocted by my now former publicist and PR firm. My sister never stole Brody from me, nor is she pregnant. Brody never cheated on me either. He and I broke up two and a half years ago, but we were advised to remain a couple in order to help our movie franchise. Being desperate for success, we followed this misguided advice. I'm sorry for deceiving you, but I couldn't allow the lies to continue and hurt others. That's not who I am. I hope you will find it in your hearts to forgive me. Love to all of you, my darlings. Yours, Kate. Caitlin had also sent a text to those closest to her saying she was taking a much-needed vacation, but she hadn't mentioned the location. As Brody had said, Caitlin was an adult, and this was her choice. Kara agreed. She was making her own choice, to forget everything else and make the most of her wedding day. The harpist played another song. Soraya motioned Kara forward. It's time. Her dad extended his arm. You're a beautiful bride. Thanks, dad. As Kara stepped from behind the wall, she gasped. More flowers in her favorite pastel colors had been added to the gazebo, so many she could barely see the wood. Rustic ladders on either side held lovely posts overflowing with flowers. Helium-filled balloons in pastel colors had been covered in tulle and then tied with ribbons and flowers. Petals covered the aisle runner in between smaller pots of flowers lining the edges. Forget what she'd imagined inside the Bayview house on her first visit. This was her dream wedding, and Brody. 
he stood at the front of the aisle in gray pants, a white shirt, and a coordinating vest and bow tie. So handsome. She didn't think her pulse could race faster. She was wrong. Matthias stood next to him. She'd never seen such happiness radiating off Brody's face. His anticipation matched the way she felt. Kara let her dad set the pace, otherwise, she might move too fast. She couldn't wait to be Brody's wife. Each step brought her closer. She recognized some of Brody's friends. His family took the front row, on the right. Jeff, Renee, and Mo sat together on the left side of the aisle. Cassie and Troy sat in front of them. Ryland had postponed his flight to Portland when he heard there would be a wedding and sat next to Troy. Kara's mom and the security team were in the front row. Lex had a package of tissues. Jackson kept surveying the perimeter. Kai adjusted his tie. Rizzo held Loki's carrier so he could attend the wedding, too. Joy overflowed. Happy tears stung. Kara reached the front of the aisle where her father kissed her cheek, placed her hand in Brody's, and then left them to sit with her mother. Brody leaned closer. You're stunning. So are you, Kara whispered. Ready? You have no idea. They faced forward so Shelly could begin the ceremony, but Kara couldn't help but sneak a peek at Brody. From a little bit engaged to a happily ever after. Dreams really could come true. Hers and Brody's had. About the author. USA Today best-selling author Melissa McClone has written over 45 sweet contemporary romance novels. She lives in the Pacific Northwest with her husband, three children, a spoiled Norwegian elkhound, and cats who think they rule the house. They do. If you'd like to find Melissa online, visit her website, melissamcclone.com. Thank you for listening to A Little Bit Engaged. One Night to Forever, Book 3. Written by Melissa McClone. Text copyright 2019 by Melissa McClone. Production copyright 2023 by Melissa McClone.